to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. As the centuries go marching by in review, head and shoulders above the rest of us march the great innovators, the scientists, the inventors. Their names are blazoned large in the annals of the world. Newton, Euclid, Da Vinci, Einstein, navigators, astronauts, explorers, but some who have opened new paths to mysterious realms go past unnoticed. For example, Herbert Boggs, whose strange and unique story I bring you now. Herb, Hmm? what do you mean, read? Well, it's hard to explain, Sadie. But you know, ever since I was shocked by that electricity, it's like, uh, like written up there in my mind. Like I was printed on a notice board. I can read the future, Sadie. Like it was, uh, the first page of tomorrow's newspapers. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Shock of His Life, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. If you were to pick the most unlikely spot for a miracle that could battle modern science, you couldn't do better than Elmhurst in the borough of Queens, New York City, or a more unlikely man for it to happen to than Herbert Boggs. Herb is an average middle-class man in a crowd most likely to go unnoticed. He's been married to Sadie for 35 years. Two children, grown and married, He has his own little bar and grill, and his interests are beer, boxing, football, and the ponies. He also likes the comics. Hey, Sadie, look, look at this here. What? Sparkman. See how he handles them creatures from outer space? Which one is he? The fella in the union suit? Oh, Sadie, that ain't no union suit. That's his uniform, like. Well, why would a grown-up man want to wear a kid outfit like that? Because, because it frees his muscles to do things... Oh, what's the sense explaining to a woman? Herbie, what are them zigzaggy things sticking out of his hands? Oh, that, that, that's his electrostatic ray. He hits you with that and zingo, you're static. It's like electricity. Oh, he must run up some utility bills. Oh, come on. What do you say, he? he ain't hooked up to the electric company. That's like his own electric power. Oh, in the comics, anything can happen. But it ain't for real. Oh, yeah. Well, don't you kid yourself, Sadie. You'd be surprised how many real scientific ideas come straight out of the comics. That, that's, that's how it's a real education to read them. The, you know, these guys who draw them are geniuses, most of them. Yeah, what, well, honey, why don't you get me a beer, huh? Why don't you get it for yourself? Well, can't you see I'm turning the game on? You know I always watch the football games on Sundays. All right, Herbie. You have your day of rest. But, honey, don't turn it up too loud. Yeah, all right. No louder than I have to hear what's going on, okay? Well, I don't have to hear. Oh, you're in the Oh, Don, the what picture, the picture blue. Put, uh, put the beard down someplace, huh? You mean something's happened to that, too? Well, you got eyes, ain't you? We got the, we got the sound, but no picture. Oh, Honey, what are you doing? I'm going to get the back off. I can fix this thing. I, I can't miss the game. You can't fix it. You need a TV man. What, a 33 bucks a crack? Anyway, where are you going to find one on a Sunday, huh? But you shouldn't mess around, Herbie. It's dangerous. Well, what's the difference? You can still hear. I don't want to jump. Just here, I want to see. You better not shove your hand in there. Oh, I can see already there's a tube half lying there. It just needs to be stuck back in. I read in a paper where it said a person should never... Ah, ah. Herb? Honey? You all right? Herb, say something to me. Answer me. Herb? Herb? How 
What did you say happened to your husband, Mrs.? Uh... It, it's Boggs, Doctor. Oh, yes, Boggs. Well, he was fooling around trying to fix the TV. While it was turned on? Yes. And he got a shot. Oh, yes. He just went down like a rag doll. Only when I kneeled beside him on the floor, he was... He was all stiff-like. Mm-hmm. Did he have any pulse? I don't know. I, I didn't stop to find out. I just called the police. But after, when you went back to her? I don't know. I didn't think to try. Was he breathing? I don't think so. That's what scared me so, Doctor. He was laying there just like a corpse. Stiff, like I said. How long? Pardon? How long was he lying there in that condition? Oh, I wouldn't know. For a while. And then, I, after I, I, I got him on his back with the pillow under his feet and all... Then I could hear him a little, sort of, like, you know, snoring. The way he was when you first got here. But you can't estimate how long it was before you heard him making that sound. Oh, I was so scared. I, I mean, every second was like a year. and Well, maybe five minutes, ten. Is it going to be all right, Doctor? We have him breathing clearly now, and we're going to take him right down to the hospital. Oh, um, do you have a car? Oh, no. You uh, want to come along? Oh, yes. Couldn't I sit with Herb and hold his hand? I uh, think you'd better let me and the medic do that, Mrs. Boggs. Oh. You climb in with the driver. All right. Okay, Hank, open up the hooters and get us to the hospital fast. We don't want to arrive with a DOA. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting so long, Mrs. Boggs. Herb... How is he? Well, at the moment, his condition is stabilized. His respiration is satisfactory, he's out of cardiac arrest, and his EKG is normalizing. What does that mean, Doctor? Well, Mrs. Barks, when you called police emergency, we got to you as fast as possible. But there was a period after your husband sustained the electric shock, during which we don't know his medical condition. But you said he was breathing and all again? Yes, his condition now is stable enough. What we don't know, Mrs. Boggs, is what may have happened to him in the period after he sustained the shock until we arrived and could start treatment. Doctor, I don't mean to be stupid. I, I just don't quite follow well, you. let me try to explain. When we have sudden shock, like a, an electrical one, yes. which stops normal functions such as breathing and heartbeat, time is of the essence. Oh. I won't go into all the complications and technical terms, but if... Through shock, a patient loses all cardiopulmonary functions for more than four to six minutes. Well, then we are in deep trouble. You mean my herb would die? Not necessarily. What I do mean is that he could suffer irreversible brain damage and change. Oh, you think that that's what could have happened before you got to our apartment? Well, I honestly don't know. Mr. Boggs is still in a coma and until he comes out of it. And we've had a chance to evaluate the EKG and other tests. I can't give you any definite answer. I'm sorry. But you don't think he's going to die? I um, can't even promise you that. I know it's little comfort, but perhaps if the damage has already been done, it might be better for him and for you. I want him to come, too. I want him back. Well, of course you do, Mrs. Boggs, and I want you to have hope. But I also ask you to wait and see. The man you get back could very easily be as different from night and day as the husband that you remember and love. Good morning, Herbie. Sadie, where am I? Where should you be when you're sick? The hospital. Hospital? What am I doing here? Well, don't you remember? You were messing around with that TV... Like Mike, who comes to fix it. Didn't Mike warn you? What? Well, he said, you you know, never touch in the back without you pull the plug. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember. Hey, who won? Who won what? The game. What game? The game, the game that was going on when the set pooped out. Well, how should I know? You think I should care about football players when my husband was lying like dead? What husband? You! Herbie, you went and electrocuted yourself. How come you're in the hospital? 
I wake, wake, waking up like this, I couldn't figure. I never... I never felt better in my life. Oh, we'll let the doctor decide no, that. No, what do I need a doctor for? I know how I feel. I want to get out of here and go home. Now, just a minute. No, just a minute. Get my pants, Sadie. I don't belong here. Herb, you've been sick. Real sick. Two days you've been laying there like dead. You can't go home unless the doctor signs you out. All right, so get him and have him. I can't do that. He thinks you might have... Well... You know, with the electric shock and all. No, I don't know. Like I say, I feel like a million bucks. Now, I need out. I got things to do. What things? Well, like, I can't... I can't explain that there are things going on in my head. Now, honey, I don't care about rules and regulations. I'm getting out of here. Doctor or no doctor. Baby, you got to have him to get out. And how am I going to convince him? Oh, he's going to let me out without any trouble. How do you know? Well, I can read it. It's that simple. Read it? What do you mean, read it? In my brain. In my brain, Sadie. Just like I can read so many other things now. Now, just trust me, huh? Like you always did. Gee, Herb. I want to. I want to with all my heart. But... Oh, it's... It's all so kind of different. I, I don't know where I'm at. You don't have to worry about where you're at, Sadie. Just get yourself set for where we're going. Now that we've been struck by lightning. Oh, boy. Good to be home. I just don't understand. After all he said, the doctor didn't make any problem about your coming home. Oh, why should he, Sadie? I'm in better shape than he is. Get me a beer, hon. Huh? Oh, sure, Herbie, if you say so. You want a glass? Oh. Uh, 32 years married, you asked me that. When did I ever use a glass? Are you sure the doctor wouldn't... Sadie, what do I care about the doctor? I know what's good for me. And for you. Yeah. Just let me show you. Who are you calling? Of course. The bookie? Yep, that's him. Now look, Herb. We ain't got money to take flyers. I mean, like after the hospital and ambulance and all, you know? No, I don't know. And who says this is a flyer? This is something I gotta get through your head. Uh, hello? Horse? Yeah, 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 her. Yeah. You know, her bogs? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Listen, uh, you're holding some winnings for me. Um, 120 bucks, right? Yeah, that's, a, that's all right. You check your books. It's there. Yeah, well, listen, I want to take a little flutter. Now, uh, you got notable gaffer in the first going off at 10 to 1, right? Ah. And, uh, pleasure sky in the fourth, 70 to 1. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I want to parlay them on the nose to win. Yeah, yeah, the whole bundle. Are you crazy? Herb, you had winnings of over $100, and you're betting them on a daily double with two outsiders? Honey, honey, not to worry. I can't lose. What do you mean you can't lose? I already read the results. Clear and simple, the way the things are from here in. What do you mean, Red. Well, it's hard to explain, Sadie. But ever since I took that that belt of electricity, it's like it's like written up there in my mind, like like a, like it was printed on a notice board. I I can read the future, like like it was the first page of tomorrow's newspaper. So, as Herb, or should I say, like Herb would say, here is a miracle happening right in that western end of Long Island. Has that extra amount of electricity her Boggs's body accidentally absorbed brought about some strange physiological or psychological change? Or has it, as Dr. Barnes fears, caused some profound and irreparable damage that gives him delusions? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. Now here is Herbert Boggs, owner of a small local bar and grill, who is suddenly electrified and claims to be able to see in his mind's eye the front page of tomorrow's newspaper. It is also a fact that the electrical shock was of such severity that it put him into cardiac arrest and eliminated all his vital signs for an indefinite period. 
a period, however, which may have been long enough to cause irreparable damage. Herb, why don't you take a nice rest in your armchair and let me fetch your slippers? Oh, Sadie, will you stop acting like I went round the bend? I'm telling you the truth. That you could see into the future? Well, not the whole future, just like I could see what could be on the front page of a paper. The racing results? Well, if, uh... If someone won big enough to get a headline, and other things do. I, I'm, I'm just telling you the way it is, Sadie. Maybe I better get you some aspirin. Will you, for crying out loud, stop treating me like I had some kind of a sickness or something? I got vision right here. How can you be sure? It's just I am, Sadie, I am. All right, we could prove it out. Wait a minute. What are you doing? I'm calling the number. What number? There's this number you call to check the betting results. Couldn't you just listen in on the radio? Yeah, of course I could listen. This is faster. Yeah, here, like already I'm getting the rundown. About the horse race? The parlor? No, no, no. He's not up to that now. He's on basketball and football right now. Oh. oh, wait, wait, wait. Here he goes on exactors and perfectors and all that. No. Hey, no, wait a minute. What? Here, here he goes on results of big oval track. First race. Notable gaffer wins at ten to one. Hey, hey, you know what that means, honey? We won? We just made ourselves 1,200 bucks. We did? Oh, we can sure use it. Oh, no, no, that ain't using money, honey. We, we, we have it all riding on the fourth race. Herbie, if we lose that, do we lose it all? No, we ain't gonna lose it. Well, how can you be so sure? Shh, shh, hold it, hold it, hold it. Here, the result's coming in right now. Yee-hoo! Pleasure Sky took it by a nose. Uh-huh. <laughs> I told you. I told you I could see it just the way it's going to be. Huh? The second horse won? Yeah, paying 70 to 1. That oh. means you and me, Sadie, just cleared ourselves more than $35,000. Herb, <laughs> we never had that much money all at once in our lives. Yeah, well, you better get yourself used to it, baby, because that's the way it's going to be from now on. Oh, no, Herbie, please. I'm scared. Let it go with that... You came in lucky once. Don't stretch your luck. What's the stretch? That ain't luck. Don't you understand? I know, I know, before it happens. Darling, I... I... Have you been sick in the hospital? I think you ought to take it easy for a while. No, I know. I know what you think, Sadie, and I don't blame you. You think that electric shock curdled my brain or something, but it ain't that way. I wish I could make you see it so clear. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I just came back from the hospital, and you were with me all morning since I woke up, right? Right. So, you know that I haven't heard a radio or seen a TV or looked at a paper, right? Yes. The morning paper. We got it in the house? All right, all right. Now, fine. Now, I won't look, all right? But you look on the first page. Yes. And someone won big on a lottery, right? Uh, yes. Huh? <gasps> Joseph Davis. A retired construction worker was the grand winner in the two million dollar state lottery. All right, Sadie. Does it give the number of the ticket? Oh, let me see. Uh, yes, yes, right here. It was no, number. No, no, wait, wait. I'll tell you. I'll tell you without even looking. Um, two, four, three, eight, six, nine, two. Right? Yes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you see? You see, I know which number is going to win. Oh. Yeah, let, let, let this Joe Davis have his two million next month. If we want it, we'll have it. How? Well, well, when I put my mind to it, I can see the number. Well, how can you get the number you want? Well, may, may, maybe I can't, but there's uh, 83 other places. Knowing the right numbers can put you and me on easy street for the rest of our lives. Where? The numbers, the horses, the right spread in basketball, football. A hundred ways, Sadie. I don't have to guess anymore. I'm going to know. Oh, there's something terribly dangerous about all this herd. It just can't lead to any good. Are you kidding? How good can it get? It's going to be a whole new life. Oh, I guess that's what I'm afraid of. Oh, come on, Sadie. Why should you be afraid? Because you go live it. I got my own second sight. You're headed for real trouble. And worse than that... You ain't going to be my herb anymore. Here, come. Hi, lover. Hi, Angel. Come in, close the door. Well, do we kiss, Gino? Or is this strictly business? <laughs> kiss first, Sherry, baby. Then we talk. Mmm. You're it, Gino, all the way. 
I, uh... I need a little information, and I can't think of anyone better to dig it up for me. <sighs> so tell me. I got a customer, a live one, for a lot of years. He's gone sour on me. Oh, he owes you? Oh, no. He quit gambling? Worse than that. All of a sudden, he starts to win big too often. I want to know why. Look, Gino, isn't this man's work? This guy happens to be a bartender who owns his own little place. So? Isn't gambling man talk? Customers talk to bartenders. It don't work the other way around. Hmm. What'd you do? Misplace the goon squad? No, no, this doesn't call for strong arm stuff. You catch more flies with honey than Okay, you okay, I get the message, Gino. What's the address? And how do I recognize this pigeon? The address is on the paper. You'll find it behind the bar. His name is Herb. Herb Boggs. Yes, miss? Can I help you? Oh, uh, I, uh... If it was something to eat, we don't open the grill till 5.30. Uh, no, I don't want to eat. I, 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 I couldn't. I... I'd I like a, a drink, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, would you rather have it at a table than here at the bar? No, please, I... I, I don't want to be alone. You in trouble of some kind? Yes. Uh, no. Well, there was a man bothering me. Get away, I said. My husband was meeting me in here. Is he? No. No, I just said that to get away. My, my husband... My husband's dead. Oh. I'm a widow. Oh. All alone now. I don't know why it is. Men seem to sense that. Try to take advantage. You know how it is? Ah, uh, well, yes or no, <laughs> Now, listen, you'll be safe in here. What what, what did you want to drink, huh? Oh, just a sherry, I guess. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to laugh. It was just... You see, I'm not much of a drinker. And I didn't know what to ask for. So the first thing I come out with is my name. <laughs> oh, oh, sherry, sherry. Yeah. That's your name, huh? Yes. Uh. But like the poet says... What's in a name? So I guess I, I will have a sherry. And not too strong, please. Oh, no. I'll give you the best. Yeah. Yeah, this will never hurt you. A glass of wine. Oh, like that other poet said. A glass of wine. A loaf. Oh, how did that go? Uh, a book of voice, uh, verses. Underneath the bow, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou beside me singing in the wilderness. Huh? Oh, gee, that's <laughs> beautiful. Ah, yeah, well. How come an educated man like you ended ended up behind a bar? I ain't claiming I'm any college grad or nothing like that, but... Well, you spend enough years behind a bar, you'd be surprised how many things you learn. Oh, you've read it to me like you were an actor. Oh, it made me feel so much better. Honest. I don't feel sad anymore. Ah, wow, that's great. Hey, now look, you haven't even tried your sherry. Oh, I know. It's silly, but... Oh, I hate to drink alone. I don't suppose you would join me as my guest. Oh, no, 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 no. I never drink in my own place. Well, some... Some other place? Hey, hey, hey. Now, look, I'm a married man. It's just because I'm lonely. Oh, I... I don't think I know your name. Oh, well, it's Herb. If you want to have a drink, my, uh... My relief barman just came in. It's uh, my quitting time, and, uh... Oh, come on. Come on, Sherry. I'll take you across the street to Adam's Rib. Oh, that's so sweet of you, Mr... I mean, Herb. No, no, it isn't. Sherry, honey. Uh, you see, it's because I, uh... I read in my mind's eye it's what I'm going to do anyway, so... I might as well check out why right now. <laughs> So I'll get my jacket. Uh, oh, uh, the sherry's a buck and a half a clip. Uh, just leave it on the bar. Uh, you know, you're a funny man. Nah, not funny, just strange. 
Well, I dig men who are far out. No, 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 Sherry. It won't work. What do you mean? Look, if I was younger and I didn't have my Sadie... Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't go for all your flash in me, but uh, it won't work. Because, first of all, there is Sadie, and I never cheated on my wife yet, and never will. And second off, because I know it ain't the cards. You're sure? If you came up to my pad right now, I couldn't make you change your mind? Oh, I don't have to be sure. I know. I know, because I know I'm not going to your place. How? Well, like I said, I can see it in my head. I, I can kind of read it like. Any time up to 24 hours ahead, I know whether a thing is going to be or if it isn't. How could you do that? Well, I didn't ask to be able to. I, uh... You see, I took a jolt of electricity and, uh... I nearly cashed in my chips. Oh? Yeah. And when I came out of it, I guess, uh... It kind of scrambled my brain some and... Well, change over... Some of the cells are like that. But anyway, I could, uh, I could see into the future. Oh, like a day before a race, you could know which horse was going to win? Oh, that's easy. Oh, boy, are you the man with all the luck. Uh, well, not so fast. You see, the trouble with knowing about things in advance is you get to take the bad with the good. Like, uh, like it's just, uh, just coming clear... Who sent you to pump me? I mean, I don't see uh, all that clear yet. Why? Nobody sent me. No, no, Sherry, honey, that's a lie. Uh, but you know, you know Marks, right? All right, now you tell me what, what does Gino want with me? I wouldn't know. Oh. Well, I know this much. If a, a big fish like Gino is after me, it can only mean trouble. So, you see, Sherry, maybe I'm not so lucky after all. As long as man has existed, he has ached to be able to know of his future in advance. The seer, or the professed seer, has been a dominant figure in every culture in the world. But if all the prophets and magicians and astrologers and others actually have such a power, would they really want such a divine gift or learn like Herb that it brings far more harm than good? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Three. One of history's wisest men, Sir Francis Bacon, once wrote, Men may refuse things which are in the present, but leave the future to the divine providence. The wisdom of this thought is something poor Herr Boggs is about to discover, even though his ability to read the future is not something he is directly responsible for. It is a gift that was wished upon him and which... Despite his advantages, he is rapidly beginning to think he would rather have wished off him again. I brought us some nice, fresh coffee, Herb. No, no, no. None, none for me, Sadie. Oh, would you rather have a beer? No, no. Well, uh, should I turn on the TV? No, no. Oh, now I know you must be sick. No, I'm not sick. I've got a problem. Oh, I knew something was bothering you ever since you come home to dinner. Herbie, how can I help? Now, Sadie, this has nothing to do with you. Everything that has to do with you has to do with me. All right, all right. All right, now listen. When I first found out about, uh... about my gift, like, I, uh... I lost my head a little, all right? Well, you didn't seem no different to me. No, I mean about how I saw all the money that I could make. You know, all my life I played the numbers, the ponies, wherever you could lay a bet, right? Every cent I could afford and too much of the time, like you know, when I couldn't. Yeah, I know. Well, you know what I figured last year? I'm a loser. Over 40 years averaging out, I blew 50 bucks a week. That's... One hundred grand I blew, Sadie. With interest over all in years, it could have been two. 
That's all you or me would ever need. Now, do you think that's smart? No, that wasn't smart. But now you could get it all back and more. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured, Sadie. I wasn't going to be greedy. Just get back my stake and maybe like interest money, you see? Only... Only I was stupid. What's so stupid about that? Well, I tried to move too fast. I got... I got Horse Turkle screaming what was I trying to do to him, and I should have listened. To what? Well, he asked me to take it easy, or either let him in on what kind of handicapping system I was using. Well, I fobbed him off, so... He must have went screaming to the big shots, you see, wherever he lays off his bets. So now I... I got Gino Marks on my tail. Who is Gino Marks? Oh, he's a real, real hard guy, Sadie. This this is his district, you see, and he doesn't like anybody that messes with his profits. Herbie, don't get mixed up with gangsters and hoodlums. We don't need the money. Forget it. Well, the whole trouble is I was going to forget it. I just about had our money back, Sadie. Well, whatever we've got, you don't need any more. Well, I'm not sure I even deserve the hundred grand I have. It ain't so much of a gift, you know. You come right down to it. Like last week when we bumped into Mo and Jane Rosen, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was nice to see them look so well. Who could have guessed? <gasps> yeah, me. I knew. I knew she'd be dead the next day, Sadie. Oh. Yeah. And and that nice young kid that, that lives upstairs, well, she ain't going to have that baby. She, she'll be lucky if she stays alive. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, and, and that's how come I know that Gino Marks is after me. You see, I can see all these things before they happen. And just to win some dough, who needs the the other stuff that you got to suffer? That's why I want to forget it all or try to before... Uh, be, be, but, but before what? Maybe before that. What? Before. I got to answer that. Why? Let it ring. Take it off the hook. No, no, no. no it's no good, Sadie. I got to answer sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's speaking. Well, what? What, what? what does he want to see me for? Well, okay, at least I can ask. Yeah, when? Oh, tonight. Well, I, I don't know, it's kind of late. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. Who was it? Who else? That was a message from Gino Marks. What? He wants to see me tonight. Tonight? He's already sent a card for me. Don't go, Herbie. Sadie, I gotta. Why? Well, because you never get anything for nothing. Now I gotta find out what I... I gotta pay for the good luck. Why should you have to pay anything? You worked hard all your life. You deserve some. Wasn't coming out of the shock I got enough. I should have left it at that, but I was tempted... And when a guy gives in, Sadie, I guess he's just got to face it. There's always the devil to pay. Mr. Box. Yeah, that's right. Close the door, Boggs. Take a seat. I want to talk to you. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah. Now, come right to the point. It's the way I work. <laughs> you know, you've been nicking my organization pretty good the past week. You mean I made a few bets and took some money off you, huh? That's what I mean. Too much. Yeah, well, uh, you won't have to worry. I, I got all I need now. Oh, you're going to quit cold turkey. Yeah, huh? yeah. I don't buy it. No horse player on a hot streak ever quit. Well, this one is ready to. I don't know if I want you to. You mean... You mean you want me to go on winning? Can you? Well, I... I can't say. Uh, what do you want, Mr. Marks? Hey, now that's getting right to the point, isn't it? You know... I just possibly might go into business with you. Business? With me? Why not? I go for success. But before we get too excited over what may just have been a, a run of luck, why don't we have a trial period? A trial period? For what? To see if it's really true. You can call it spots. If you can, 
We pick our spots and bet heavy. I mean heavy, Boggs. Eighty percent to me is major partner. The rest to you and I'll bankroll. And, uh, suppose, uh, suppose I refuse. <laughs> now, you really don't want me to get into strong arm stuff, do you? Oh, no, no, no. You wouldn't dare lay a hand on me. Not as long as I could be the goose who lays the golden eggs. Oh, I wouldn't have to. Because, uh, that wife you love so much, Sadie, is that her name? <laughs> yes, Sadie. Now you wouldn't want anything to happen to her. Hmm? We got a deal? We got a deal. Herb? Herb? Uh, what? What, what, what's my... Hey, no, 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 look, wait, don't, don't, don't you hurt her. I can actually explain everything. Oh. Oh, Sadie, Sadie, I'm sorry. What was you having, sweetheart? A nightmare? No, how could, how could I have a nightmare? It's not even dark yet. Well, almost. You haven't had your supper. No, no, I can't eat. Herb, you gotta have something. It's just leftovers, since you won't even let me leave the house the last three days. <sighs> Herbie, what is it? What? I can't explain, Sadie. It's, it's, uh... I, I don't mind all the beer and the drinking and the sleeping all day and walking around all night. But what's the use, Herb? You can't hide forever. What are you hiding from? Your partner? Yeah. Oh, I never wanted you to go in business with a man like Gino Marks anyways. Well, why don't you just quit? Oh, Sadie, don't you think I wish I could? If it's the money you want, give it back. I tried that. He doesn't want it. Well, what does he want? Well, you know. For me to tell what I see inside my skull is going to win the next day, so he can bet. So give it to him. What do you care? Well, you don't understand, honey. For weeks I have, and then just like that I had to stop. Why? Well, because. Because I don't know anymore. All of a sudden it just stopped just like that. So... That's why you wouldn't answer none of his calls the last three days. Honey, you can't put it off much longer. He's got men watching down there in the street. I've seen them. Yeah, I know, I know. They've been there around the clock ever since we first made our deal. He don't even trust nobody, Sadie. That's why... Oh. Who's that? I, 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 I'm going to see... No, 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 Sadie. Let me... You you go back in the bedroom, all right? No, I'm staying right by your side. Well, oh, just stay at a line of the door. Uh, who, who, who is it? You could see me through the viewer. You know, open up. Well, I got nothing to say to you. You can't put it off forever. Look, I'm alone. I just want to talk to you man to man. Better let him in, Herb. Tell him how it is, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, okay, just a minute, Mr. Marks. Evening, Mrs. Boggs. Yes. I have. What do you What do you want? Well, you know me. I don't waste time. Right to the point. Nearly a week now. We don't win, huh? Oh, I dropped the bundle. What is this? A double cross? Now look, I know. I know. I know you lost. All right, you 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 can have everything I got. All right. Everything you got is peanuts in my league. Why don't we win anymore, Boggs? Because I lost the power. I don't believe you. It doesn't matter what you believe. You can't change anything. Oh, I don't know. Excuse me, Mrs. Boggs. Now, you let go of my wife. Don't come any closer. You wouldn't dare shoot her. This isn't a conventional gun, Herb. It's an electric stun ray in the experimental stage with the government. But we've made a few improvements, see? Instead of stunning, this can kill... Now, I'm taking Sadie here with me, and you're going to give me some winners for tomorrow, or you're not going to see her again. No, I won't let you. Hey, well, you fool. You'll have to no, kill me first. Me. I'll, I'll see one of us in hell first. You... Sadie. 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 Sadie.
say? Right here, Herbie. Where is he? Where's Gino? Who? Gino, Gino, I won't let him kill you. I won't let him do that. There's no Gino here. Whoever he is, darling. Just Sadie. Where are we? In the hospital. The hospital? You mean he didn't kill me? He He didn't hurt you? Nobody hurt me. And nothing's happened to you, thank heaven. Even if you did near kill yourself on the TV. And you dreamed all that? Oh, I always knew I had a smart husband. No, 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 not so smart. Or I wouldn't be here. You're you're sure now, Sadie, huh? Herbie, we brought you here to this hospital straight from the house. And you've been in a coma for the last 24 hours. (sighs) Till you just woke up a half hour ago to tell me all you dreamed. Gee, it all seems so real. It's hard to believe. I'm never going to make another bed, Sadie. Suppose I would. I wouldn't sleep easy for the rest of my life. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. Her Boggs learned a valuable lesson. No matter what the odds, a gambler can't be beaten unless he has the devil on his side. And having won with his help, what have you won? His payoff is that if you commit yourself to him, no matter how long and lucky the wheel spins, he is waiting for you in the end. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Joan Shea, and Ian Martin. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. Come in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. All of us at one time or another have believed, as Lord Byron did, in the power of thought, the magic of the mind. Hamlet looked with his mind's eye. The great Caesar believed a good mind can possess a kingdom. Today we'll meet a man who is living proof of mind over matter. The mystery being, if a brain can make possible the impossible, what could you or I do just by thinking about it? Gregory, I'm not so sure I like being locked up in the same cell with you. Oh, what's that noise? Look who just came through that drain pipe. A rat. A rat. A, a rat? Oh, here comes another one. I, I can't stand rats. They're not going to hurt you. But we're, we're locked up in here. Uh, guard! L- let me out of this cell. Guard! Guard! There are rats in here! Our mystery drama, The Great Brain, based on a story by Jacques Fruitrell, was written especially for the mystery theater by James Agate Jr. and stars... Gordon Heath. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The most mysterious activity man is capable of is thinking. This is done by the mind. The mind is an activity of the brain. How it works is beyond us. We just don't know. Conan Doyle tells us, don't think about it. Stack up your brain attic with furniture where you can get at it when you need it. Isn't that elementary, my dear Watson? When we tick, what makes us tick? 
Did you ring his doorbell, Herbert? Well, of course I did. Uh, Jason, give the man a chance to answer his front door. Well, maybe he's not home. You sure he said drop by at nine this evening? Well, of course I'm sure. Okay, I'll ring again. Herbert, uh, were you there at the jazz match? No, no, I wish I had been. Uh, it was uncanny. Imagine a man who's never played chess winning over a grandmaster by sheer logic. Well, Gregory has more than logic to work with. What do you mean? He has a great brain. Gentlemen, I am pleased to see you. Oh, good evening, Gregory. Hey, good to see you too, Greg. Come in, come in. Oh, you've been ringing long. Didn't hear the bell. Let's go into the library. Hawkins has a good fire going. We'll sit and I'll put my problem to you. Oh, you must be joking, Gregory. You of all people with a problem? Sit down, sit down. Jason, Herbert, anywhere that looks comfortable. You know, we three scientists get together too rarely. Mm. Yes, I do have a problem. And it's only to my nearest and dearest friends, you two, that I would admit to it. Well, as you said at the chess match, it's your move. This is yesterday's Sunday Tribune. I'll read it. The mental marvel, Dr. Gregory March, has done it again. Defeated the Grandmaster chess champion in four out of five matches. Dr. March claims he never played the game before in his life. That concentration can make the incredible credible. Is it not more believable that Dr. March has kept secret all his abilities? Which many suspect may be the case. Well, there are always detractors, Gregory, you know that. I keep trying to prove the superiority of the human brain, and at every turn I'd run into disbelief. So, gentlemen, that's the problem, and I enlist your aid. Oh, Gregory, we know you can perform certain feats of, uh, what do I call it, uh, mental magic. Magic? But not anything is possible with brain power. I disagree. Not only anything, but everything is possible. You two set up the challenge, and I'll meet it. Greg, Jason and I have an idea for a test. Now, there are some things which will not yield to any amount of thought. What, for instance? Prison walls. No man can think himself out of a cell. Uh, if he could, there'd be no prisoners. Uh, Greg... Greg, let's suppose you were locked in a cell, a special prison cell, reserved, let's say, for uh, the condemned murderer. Yes. Now, suppose you were locked in such a cell. Could you escape? Certainly. By brain power alone? A good test. Have me locked up precisely as you would any man under sentence of death, and I'll get out. I will escape in a week. Say, the um, death cell at the state penitentiary... You know, I think I could arrange that. I, I know the warden. You name it. What do you wear? Whatever's customary. No, not a prison uniform, but shoes, socks, trousers, shirt. You'll permit yourself to be searched, of course. Naturally. My dear friends, it's not what's on my body that will help me out, but what's in my head. Au revoir, Hawkins. Take good care of the house. See you in a week. Uh, is it true, sir, that your friends are taking you this morning to the state penitentiary? <laughs> Don't be concerned. Purely a scientific experiment. Ready when you are, Gregory. It's now 27 minutes past 7 o'clock. I shall be gone a week. Yes, sir. Will you be needing a suitcase and clothes? No, Hawkins. Just what I have on my back. One week and 12 hours from now, these two gentlemen will take supper with me here. Warden Hammer, uh, let me introduce Dr. Gregory March. As I said to you last night on the telephone, Dr. March is to be your prisoner here at State Penitentiary. Uh, some kind of experiment, you said. Except in this case, the outcome is not unknown. But yes, all in the interest of science. So where do I begin, Warden? All right, Dr. March, you will first submit to being searched. Turn out your pockets, please. Now, will you remove your shoes and socks? I hope the inspection was satisfactory. You found nothing concealed which might aid me in escaping. Doctor, even if you had a blowtorch on you, I don't think you could get out of state, Ben. Gregory, uh, are you sure you want to do this? Would you and Herbert be convinced if I didn't? Well... <laughs> 
No, I, I can't say we would. Uh, Warden, is it quite impossible for Dr. March to communicate with anyone outside the prison? Absolutely impossible. He won't be permitted anything to write with at all. Yes, and your guards, uh, would they deliver any messages from him? Not a word, directly or indirectly. They'd report to me immediately anything he said or turn over to me anything the prisoner might give them. I do have, however, three small requests. Well, I thought we all agreed to no special favors. I'm not asking any. I'd like to have some tooth powder. Not toothpaste, tooth powder. Secondly, I'd like to have one $5 bill and two $10 bills. <laughs> Warden, is there any man in this prison who our friend might bribe with the... Uh... $25? He's not going to meet another prisoner. He'll be in solitary. And as for anyone else, <laughs> no, not for 2500 Well, I can see no reason why Gregory shouldn't have the money. I think I have some tens. One, two. Uh, I've, uh, I've got a five. Now, you sure that's all you want, Greg? That'll be enough, thanks. You uh, had three requests, don't yes. you? Yes. The third is, before I go into my cell... I'd like to have my shoes polished. Now, this is cell 99. Uh, guard, open up, please. This is the cell where we keep condemned murderers. It's on the ground floor. It's visible to every passing guard. There's one small window, barred, of course, a bed, lavatory, and commode. Oh, this is awful. Greg... Why don't you change your mind? Herbert, you're taking up valuable time by talking. Well, if I may ask you, Dr. March, valuable time for you to do what with? To think, Warden. Well, I ask it again, Warden, although I'm sure of the answer. There's no way any prisoner can leave this cell. No, sir, not without my permission. No one in 99 has any way of communicating with the outside. Jason, do I get the impression you don't trust me? Oh, not at all. I'm just making certain that you prove your case... Quite honestly. Oh, I was going to say scientifically. <laughs> Why don't we set up a control the first night? Jason, join me here for the first day and night. Then you can observe. That's not a bad idea. I uh, think you should, Jason. Uh, you'd, uh, you'd have to be searched also, you understand. Oh, why not? I'll do it. Here, uh, Herbert, my keys, wallet. Well, in fact, take the whole jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll be dressed in shirt sleeve like Gregory. Uh, if you don't mind, sir, I'll just check your clothing. <laughs> Go ahead. No hidden weapons, I assure you. I uh, notice cell 99 is on the main floor. Uh, the administration office is here, too? Well, just three doors down the cell block is my office. So I'm certainly going to hear anyone trying to get out. Now, Dr. March, a guard will bring you breakfast in the morning, then a meal at noon, and at six, you'll get dinner. The guard will stand by while you eat, and then remove a wooden spoon and bowl and cup. Then at nine at night, there's a cell-by-cell -cell inspection to him. Glad to hear it. The more security, the greater the challenge. <laughs> You're quite determined, aren't you, Dr. March? Yes, I am. Oh, in case I forgot to mention it, no one has ever escaped from state pen. No man has ever made it over that 18-foot electrified wall. Good of you to tell me, Warden. I'll make a note that is not the way to leave. Oh, sir, Jason? Hmm? Now, if you'll kindly lock us up, Warden. Why, well, certainly. Guard. Well, so long, Greg. Good luck. I'll uh, stop by for you the first thing in the morning, Jason. Oh, Warden, what time is it now exactly? 11.17. Uh, make a note of it on your calendar. I will join you, gentlemen, in the warden's office at 11.17 in the morning, one week from now. And uh, if you're not there, Greg? There's no if about it. Both of you gentlemen finish your dinner? Yes, God, you can remove the trays. Ugh. That's the kind of food you're going to get for seven days. I don't envy you. I can afford to lose a little weight. You know, Gregory... I'd like to see you pull this off. I know you would. Would it be out of line to ask you how you go about it? When I tackle a new problem, I become all brain and mind. I begin by being a sponge, soaking up all the information I can. You can help. Go stand on the bed. Take a look out of the window and tell me what you see. Uh, 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 the prison yard lit by arc lights all around. 
Hmm, that wall looks higher than 18 feet. It's too smooth to climb up. And it's electrified on top. Hmm. How many guards? I see. Oh, there are four of them patrolling. From the window, how far down is it to the yard? Just a couple of feet, four, five. Good observation. Jump down. <coughs> then I check my memory. Do you remember how we got to cell 99? Well, let's see. Uh, the main gate, guard's booth there. Then through two heavy steel gates. Then into the main prison to the warden's office on this floor. Then, uh, oh, two more steel doors in the corridor. And the double locks on your cell. Hmm. Step three, the inside. Search every corner. It's completely bare. Not a chair, not a table. The bed seems to be welded together so that it can't be torn apart and used. <laughs> you really picked the impossible. That's the whole point. Now, when you were looking out the window, did you notice anything in particular about the arc lights in the yard? Well, no, I don't think so. One of the wires leads up past my window to the roof. Was that important? Well, it might be. No detail is unimportant. But you... Gregory, what's that noise? Let me have a look. There's something over in this corner. Well, what do you know? A rat. A, a rat? And another one. Now, where do they come from? <laughs> Gregory, I, I, I can't stand rats. I, I, I can't. Oh, here's a third. I, I've got to get out of here. They're but... not going to hurt you, Jason. <laughs> get down to that bed. But we're locked up in here. Guard! Let, let me out of this cell. Guard! Guard! I am reminded of a poem by Robert Browning called The Pied Piper, in which he says, anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pitter-pat. Seriously, though, the little rodents have been much maligned from Shakespeare to Shaw. If I may be permitted to give you a hint of things to come, rats, for the size of their skulls, have far more brain power than man. Mystery Theater will be back shortly with Act Two. We have called our mystery the Great Brain. That brain resides in the cranium of scientist Dr. Gregory March. To prove its power, he has vowed that by logic alone, he can, forgive me, steal a march on his warden and his guards and escape from prison in seven days. It is the following morning. Uh, breakfast, Dr. March? Good morning, guard. You know my name. Well, sir, the uh, whole prison's talking about you. Having yourself locked up. Hey, you say you've done nothing. Hey, here, I'll uh, put your tray in your bed. Now, you'd better eat up. I'm supposed to stay till you're finished. Ah, what do we have here? Coffee? What's this? Oatmeal? Hey, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> there go the rats. They smell food, and that would help come miles. I've noticed there's an old dry drain pipe in the wall. They run in and out of it like it's a revolving door. Yeah, well, that, that old pipe's big enough uh, for a rat, but hardly a human being. <laughs> I've never been partial to oatmeal, but uh, you can get used to anything. <laughs> hey, rats don't bother you, doctor? They're more scared of me than I am of them. <clears throat> How far is the river? Oh, about 300 feet. Hey, we have a baseball diamond out there on the other side of the wall, hey, just for the staff. <laughs> you finish your coffee? Almost. I noticed last night I was getting very thirsty. You think you could bring me a little water in a bowl and leave it here? Uh, I'll ask the warden. I'll appreciate that. I suppose you're the guard assigned to my cell, so I ought to know your name. It's Argus. Argus? Really? Why? Is that name something special? I should say it is. Ask me to tell you about it sometime. Warden, uh, may, I, uh, may I see you a moment? Yes, come in, August. Uh, is everything all right in 99? One of the armed guards on outside patrol handed me this just now. 
He said the prisoner threw it out of 99. Let me see. Five dollar bill tied around a piece of cloth. Will you look at this? You see what it says? Finder of this, please deliver to the warden. This is a piece of torn shirt. His shirt. Wait a minute, look. Inside there's more writing. Looks like a code. Uh, may I see it, sir? Nakai Paxi got to my fee. Oh, it's not English. What do you make of it, August? Well, I'd try reading it backwards, sir. Back? If I want to escape, I can. What is he crazy? Why write me a note like this? What do you think, August? Well, I'm thinking, where did he get the pen and the ink to write with? Dr. March, what are you doing on your hands and knees over there? Oh, Oh, hello, Warden. Just playing with the little beggars. There isn't much else to do to amuse yourself. I, um, I brought you this prison shirt... You won't find it so easy to write on dark blue denim striped with black. You know, I don't know what you hope to accomplish by that silly note. I know why you're here. But I warn you, it's my duty to stop you from escaping. And what did you write that note with? Isn't finding that out also your duty? Angus... How many days have I been in cell 99? Uh, Three whole days, Dr. March. And my name isn't Angus, it's Argus. How could I have forgotten? The new drainage system that was put in leads right to the river, does it? Uh, Yes, sir. I suppose the pipes are pretty small. Oh, no, not if you're five inches high. (laughs) You're very watchful and quick. When I started this, Argus, I was firmly convinced escape was possible. How would you react to a considerable financial reward? For what? For helping me escape. You've got the keys. No. Five hundred dollars? No. (laughs) thousand? Dr. March, if you gave me ten thousand dollars, I I couldn't let you out. Now, between here and the main gate, there are seven different doors. Now, I only have keys for this building. Besides, I I, I, I just couldn't do it. Spoken like an August. What is it about my name, sir, that makes you say that? In good time, my vigilant watchman. I shall tell you. Tried to bribe you, did he? First some dumb message in code, and now attempted bribery. You know, Argus, I'm beginning to worry about that cell. Come on, come on along with me. I'm going to try to persuade him to forget this. Sears... Open the cell block. Shh, shh, warden. What is it? Wait, I, I hear something from cell 99. Okay. Let's move up real quiet and see what he's up to. That sounds like he's got a file and he's working one of the steel bars. Dr. March, what are you doing? Uh, not a thing, warden. All right, guard the cell door, please. What are you hiding behind your back, doctor? Behind my back? Nothing. See? My hands are empty. Guard, search him. Hey, let me hear something, warden. Here. Well, well, well. That looks like a metal instep from a shoe. Hiding it under your belt, doctor, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to have to do better than that. Uh, Here's another one, Warden. Oh, thank you. Well, that accounts for both shoes. You know, Doctor, never in a million years can you cut those window bars with something like this. Why don't you call your friends and tell them you're ready to give up? Tell them the scientific experiment is over. I haven't started yet. Argus, come back to my office with me for a moment, will you? I have an idea. Warden, do you think he has any chance of getting out? Oh, of course not. Just the same, he's darn clever. I was reading in the trip about him. That fellow Jimmy Purvis had a whole column about him being here. I don't know how he found out. He calls him Big Brain or Great Brain. 
You know something? It still bugs me that I don't know how he wrote that note. Well, who's that? Uh, the prisoner we just got up in 79, two tiers up. Come on, up the stairs, Argus, quick. One, one more flight, Warden. Oh, I'm getting too old for this. Help me, help me. What's the matter with you? Stop that noise. All right, God, open up. What am I to do? Get off your knees, prisoner. August, you know what's the matter with this man? Take me out of this cell, please. Take me out. I heard something. It's making me sick. Who is this fellow? What's he accused of? Uh, Henry Victor, sir. He's accused of throwing acid in a woman's face. She uh, died of it. I can't prove it. I can't prove it. Please put me in some other right, cell. I don't care, Victor. I'm the warden. If you've heard anything strange, I want to know what it was. I can't. I can't. Well, where did it come from? I don't know. Everywhere. Nowhere. Please don't make me answer. You must answer. It was a voice. But it wasn't human. Yes, go on. Go on. It was so muffled and so far away and ghostly. Was it from outside or inside the prison? I told you, it didn't come from anywhere. It was here, right right here, everywhere. I I in the walls. Please, warden, I'll go crazy. You've got to do something. Good afternoon, August. I see they've got you on the yard shift. How do you like it out of doors? Hey, Dr. March, you're supposed to be inside your cell. I am inside, August. No, not calling out of your window to me here in the yard. Now, why don't you obey the rules, Doctor? You've only got three more days. I wanted to ask you, August, who services these prison arc lights? Uh, oh, I don't know. It's somebody from the outside. You have no electricians in the prison? No, no, sir, we don't. I think you'd save tons of money if you had your own man. Well, it's none of my business. Uh, doctor, will you please get away from your window? Before I go, I have something for you, August. Step up a little closer, huh? Can you reach out from the yard to my window? What is it? Just this $5 bill. Take it. Well, what for? For being so affable and understanding. Keep it. You deserve it. And so I was patrolling out in the yard, and he's in his cell looking out the window, and he hands me this $5 bill. He said it was for me. I, I should keep it. Let me see. Five dollars. Wait a minute. March only had two tens and a five. One five came with that note. So where did he get this one? Well, uh, could somebody have changed one of the tens for him? Who? You're the only one he sees. Ah, no, I've got to search 99 again. Something's hidden somewhere. When a prisoner can write messages when he wants, get money when he wants, we're in deep trouble. This could cost me my job. Uh, who is it? It's me, the warden. Uh, it's still dark. What time is it? Oh, please don't shine that flashlight in my face. It's three o'clock, Doctor. Oh, you're an early riser. You wouldn't care to come back when it's daylight, I suppose. I'm going to search every inch of this cell. Get up, please. First of all, I want to move your bed away from the wall. No. No, I don't need your help. You stand over there in that corner. Now, let's see what we have back here. Is that... Yeah, it must be the old drain pipe. What have you got in there? Oh, darn it. My fingers don't quite... Re yeah, I, I got a hold of something. As you... Oh, Dead rat. Oh, yes, one of my local friends. Oh, my back. I shouldn't bend over that way. Doctor, help me move the bed up to the cell window. No funny business, man. Yeah. Happy to oblige. I might leave it there. Get a little more air. I'll just get myself up on it. Why are you standing on my bed? Just want to examine these bars. Yeah, and solid. Solid. Every one. Huh. All perfectly rigid. Now, don't move. I'm coming down. I was just going to give you a hand. Don't bother. Stand right there and we'll have a look at your clothing. 
All right, turn your trouser pockets inside out. Both of them? Come on, Doctor. Stop stalling. The left pocket. Okay. Now the right. Uh-oh. Money. Give it here, will you? One dollar bills. Five of them. If you'd like to borrow them, Warden, feel free. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. When I locked you up here, you had two tens and a five. You sent one five with a note. You gave Argus another five. How did you get these? Now, don't tell me you just thought them up. I was going to say just that, but um, I won't. All right, I can't force you to talk. But I can watch your every move for the next 48 hours. Escaping from state penitentiary isn't going to be that easy. But, Warden, I never thought it would be. What we are hearing are the maneuvers of a superior intellect. Each move we have heard Dr. Gregory March make has a reason. Mystery Theater shall return shortly with Act Three. I don't think either you or I doubt that Dr. Gregory March isn't going to be able to escape that fortress of steel and stone. And I suspect for all his bluff, the warden fears the same. It's how he'll do it that fascinates. What transforming power is this superior brain able to exert? It is the fifth day. The hour is late. And the warden turns restlessly in his bed. <laughs> what in heaven's name is that? Where's the light? Where's that phone? And I, Dirty, hit the alarm and get Argus to call me back. But I get some clothes on. Oh, oh, my back. That crazy man again. Okay, now, Judy, turn the alarm off. Victor's screaming. I, I, I can't get him to quiet down. Open up his cell, I guess. <laughs> now, 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 Victor, what's going on? Will you get up off the floor? What's all the yelling about? I can't stand it. I did it. I did it. I killed him. Yes, I did. I killed him. Take that voice away. Get it away from me. Take what voice away? I said enough. I admit I killed him. I threw the acid in her face. I didn't mean for her to die. Oh, come on, Victor. Stop it. Stop it. It was me. I did it. I confess. Get me out of this cell. Hear it. What? I don't hear anything. No, it stopped. It's that voice again. Kind of muffled like a voice from the dead. What does it tell you? Acid. 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 It keeps saying that over and over again. It accuses me, see? Acid. Because I threw the acid and the woman died. She couldn't identify me, see? But I have to confess, I got through the voices making me. Is that all your voice said, just acid? That's, that's what it was saying yesterday and the day before. Nothing else? There was something else it said. I remember now. Size 8. Yes, that's what it was. Size eight hat? Yes, size eight hat. Very clear. Said it a couple of times. Good morning, August. This is the warden. You can congratulate me. It's the seventh day and I'm still playing with the full deck. The two friends of Dr. March are here. Yeah, I know it's very early. Would you bring us all some coffee? <laughs> Thanks. Well, Warden, I'll confess to you. I thought he'd do it. And I'm very surprised he hasn't. Oh, aren't you, Herbert? Well, not really, Jason. Even brain power's got its limitations. Well, I can tell you now, he didn't really try very hard. Spent most of his time being friendly with his guard, playing with the rats in his cell, writing notes... Now, that is something I never caught on to, where he got the pen and ink. And you know that 25 you gave him? Mm -hmm. It turned into a 10, two fives, five singles. Crazy, huh? Hmm. 
Well, he never came into contact with any other prisoners? Never. I saw him, and his guard saw him. Well, here he is now. Uh, this is Mr. Argus, who's personally been in charge of cell 99. I'd just put the coffee on the desk, Argus. Gentlemen, help yourself. Uh, Warden, I have a special delivery letter for you. Oh, thank you. Tell me, how is our distinguished Houdini this morning? Well, half an hour ago at six, he was sleeping like a baby. Oh, he uh, gave me this last night. What is it? A silver dollar. He handed it to you? Yes, sir. To remember him by. <laughs> you see what I mean, gentlemen? Crazy stunts like that. But trying to escape? No, sirree. Oh, excuse me. Warden here. What arc lights? Well, if you discovered it last night, why didn't you take care of it then? Well, sure, call the electric service company. Tell them to send three or four men down here in the double to fix it. Problems? Oh, an arc light on one side of the yard has been out all night. Uh, well, are you going to open the letter, Warden? It was a special delivery. Huh? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'll be a son of a gun. Well, what is it? You look at the envelope. A special delivery letter, return address, cell 99. It says, dear friends, don't forget you're invited for dinner tonight at 727. Warden Hammer, that means you, too. And you, my vigilant Argus. Faithfully yours, Gregory Mark. Argus, you hightail yourself over to cell 99 right now and see if that man's still in there. Main gate, this is the warden. Those electricians arrived yet? Three workmen and a supervisor. Okay, but just make sure only four men leave. That gentleman is security. I, uh, I can't get over this letter. The, the, the nerve... Excuse me. Yeah? Two reporters? Sure, why not? Yeah, bring him over to my office. Did either of you gentlemen tell the press to be here this morning? No. no neither did I. Warden, he's in his cell, all right. He's still asleep. I could see him uh, through the cell door. I've been looking at this letter. It's Gregory's handwriting, but the postmark is blurred. Looks like last night's date. Hm. How did he do it? That's what's got me. If he is in his cell, how did he do it? Argus, go see who that is. Oh, it's the reporters. Hello, Warden. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, gentlemen, this is Jimmy Purvis from the Trib. Uh, come on in and bring your friend, Jim. All right, folks. I uh, heard there's a story here. Uh, now, let me uh, introduce my associate. Uh, turn around, pal. Dr. Gregory March. Greg? Doc. How did you do it? <laughs> Forgive me. I'm a little earlier than 11.17, but I don't think Warden Hammer will mind. March, will you mind telling me Not how... Not Warden. Why don't we all go back to cell 99 and I'll show you. Jimmy, I think the Trib will enjoy this story. Jimmy, this has been my home for a week. Certain disadvantages, but certain advantages. To demonstrate the extraordinary advantages of this extraordinary cell, I step on the pad, sweep my hand across the bars on this small window, and uh, presto! Oh. The window bars all fall down like magic. Oh. How could that be? I tested those. Before, Warden. Not after. Who's that in the bed? Mr. Nobody. Argus, shine your light upon that strange bedfellow. I pull back the cover a wee bit, and what do you see, gentlemen? A wig. You ought to know, Jimmy. The color is excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Would you mind pulling the covers all the way back, Dr. March? What's that body made of? Oh, happy to oblige. Well, for oh, good God. Warden, would you be so good as to identify what you see on the bed? I can't believe it. It's a coil of rope. Thirty feet, I'll have you know. And there are a couple of files, a roll of uh, fine wire, a pair of pliers... Sure beats me. If you'll excuse me, I'd better get myself back to the house. It takes me quite a while to decide what wines should be served at our little celebration. Just a minute. 
Aren't you going to tell us how you did it? Perhaps. Later. Over the brandy. Well, my very dear friends, was that dinner worth waiting for? I trust everyone else had enough to eat. Shall we tell them, Jimmy? Well, you tell them, Doctor. They were your ideas. Very simple. You sit down and you weigh the odds. On one side, you have seven steel doors, and on the other, a rat hole. My escape was facilitated by a rat running out of a rat hole. Yes, but what did you write the notes with? And where did you get the money and all those things stuffed in your bed to make it look like you were sleeping? I mean, the rope, wire, pliers, you had a hardware store full. Uh, let me tell it my way, Warden. You sit there. You say, where do those rats go? Into the river? Or does the old drain come out on land? So you examine the little beggars. Their feet are dry. They are land rats. I see that, but... It's still hundreds of yards between cell 99 and where the drain ends. Warden, did you know there's a quarter of a mile of cotton thread in one good cotton sock? Let me show you. I snip one end with my fingernail and then pull gently, gently. See? One continuous thread. So I wrote a note on a piece of shirt. That was before you confiscated my white shirt, remember? Mm -hmm. Tied my instructions to a $10 bill and tied the whole thing to a rat's foot and sent him on his way through the old drain, keeping the other end loosely in my hand. Oh, <laughs> I knew the little beast, as soon as he got out of the pipe, would sit down and gnaw the thread off, which is what he did. It must have been the next day a boy showed up at the Trib and asked for me. He handed me the note, which said, Will the finder take this to Jimmy Purvis at the Tribune? He'll give you another $10. And the kid had found the note playing ball. Uh, what made you interested, Mr. Purvis? Well, the uh, note said, I dare you. And it was signed, Chess Player. I made the boy show me where he'd found the note, and sure enough, there was the thread. It ran the length of the old drain. That afternoon, I felt a tug, and I knew I had an ally. The thread passed notes back and forth, and wire became rope, and a plan was set up for today. You came pretty close, Warden, but your fingers weren't long enough. All you found was the dead rat I'd put there. I still want to know, what did you write the notes with? The metal tip of my shoelace made a pen. The shoe polish, moistened with water, was the ink. Doctor, I've got to hand it to you. Hey, uh, Dr. March. Did you have anything to do with a prisoner who was two tiers right above in cell 99? He was hearing voices. I'm afraid I'm to blame for better or worse. All the old drain pipes must be connected. To cut the bars, I needed nitric acid. I'd run out of shoe polish, so I tried whispering nitric acid into the drain pipe so Jimmy could hear me at the other end. Oh, so Victor did hear that word. Acid. After repeating it several nights, Jimmy got the message, sent some test tubes full of nitric to me, and with the wire, I was able to cut the bars. The tooth powder kept the acid from spreading. But once I got out of my cell, how to get to the warden's office disguised? We worked out this plan for me to have a workman's uniform, and I whispered to Jimmy, get me a size 8 hat. He did hear a size 8 hat. Poor Victor. So... It was you who cut the wire outside your window leading to the arc light. August, congratulations. That's just what I did. When the warden called the electric service company, I was waiting there. You were there, Mr. Perman? Mm -hmm. I persuaded the supervisor I'd like to go along, that maybe there was a story. And I brought extra overalls and a hat for Dr. Marsh. I'd escaped through the window in the darkness a couple of hours earlier, replaced the bars, and hid behind one of the buildings. I'd watched the patrols. I knew exactly what their route was. So I arrived with the electricians, helped Dr. March get dressed, and the two of us walked into your office, Warden. End of an escape. <laughs> I'll be darned. There's always a way. Just rely on your brain. Jimmy, don't be too hard on the Warden here. And August, my faithful guard. I've enjoyed every moment, sir. Whoever christened you must have known the profession you'd follow. Well, how so, sir? Why, your name. It means a very watchful person. August was a mythical being with a hundred eyes, some of which were always wide open. <laughs> Not open wide enough, I'd say. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. 
The pertinent point that suddenly jumps in front of my mind is remembering a short verse by Emily Dickinson. The brain is wider than the sky. For put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease, and you beside. Our cast included Gordon Heath, Russell Horton, Earl Hammond, and Ian Martin. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. One of the most beloved of all books is Mother Goose. I dare say everyone in the world knows Ring Around a Rosie, Mistress Mary Quite Contrary, Ba Ba Black Sheep. Many of those nursery rhymes were based on actual fact. Ring Around a Rosie depicted death from the plague in the 14th century. Mistress Mary was commonly thought to be Mary Queen of Scots, and Ba Ba Black Sheep was a protest of the common people against confiscation of property by the royalty. But I wonder what promoted Hickory Dickory Duck. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, and down he runs. Hickory Dickory Duck. Charlie, look. The door to the clock. It's opening. All by itself. At this point, I'd believe anything. That cold air again, too. Look. Something sort of floated out of the clock. I thought too. What was it? I don't know. I'm not sure I want to know. more popular American pastimes is attending garage and tag sales. There seems to be something about buying someone else's junk that fascinates most of us. But of course, not all garage sales offer junk. Some of them have some very usable merchandise. And occasionally, you might pick up a real antique. The garage sale we're about to visit now with Charlotte and Charlie Tucker contains the belongings of a recently departed minister, a bachelor who left his earthly possessions to his nephew, a Richard Lum. Let's join them on the lawn of the Lum's home in southern Pennsylvania. There's some real nice things here, Charlotte. I'm amazed at the prices. Everything's underpriced. <laughs> they probably want to get rid of it fast. See anything you like? Oh, it's all beautiful. I'd like to find a pretty lamp if there are any. Mother hates that one I have in the guest room. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she gets in day after tomorrow. And remember your promise, Charlie. No golf or cards for the two weeks Mother's here. You know she adores you. I think she makes her visits more to see you than me. Hey, I hope she brings her tarot cards. And that's another thing. No teasing her about her interest in the occult. The last time she read the cards for you, everything she said came true. You landed that job at the Cromwell Agency and made art director six months later. Yeah, but that might have been because... Can I help you with anything? I'm Mr. Lum. Oh, uh, well, I, I would be interested in a lamp. Lamps are up on the porch. My uncle had some lovely ones. Your uncle was the minister? Yeah, I was his only living relative, and he left all this to me. I, I really can't keep it. We have no room for it all. Uh, then this isn't his home? No, no. I live here. My wife and I carted the things from the parsonage in Milford. I'll leave you to browse. I hope you like one of the lamps. Hmm. Hey, you want to head for the porch? Well, let's just stroll and look around. We'll get to the lamps. Hey, check that grandfather clock. That's an oldie. What a beauty. <laughs> it doesn't know what time it is. It just struck one and it's ten minutes to eleven. Looks so old. I bet it cost a fortune. Hey, you just wanted a lamp, remember? Oh, but I didn't mean we'd buy it. But it is awfully good looking. 
It's in great condition, too. Charlie, wouldn't it look perfect in the south corner of the dining room? It almost matches that antique hutch Mother gave us when she moved to Florida. Yeah, yeah, it would. But ask the price first before you start redecorating. Well, it'll probably be more than we can afford. It's got to be at least 100 years old. Older than that. I saw you admiring the clock. How much? I priced it at 200 uh, Not much call for grandfather clocks today in the newer homes. Rooms are smaller, more modern, and this one doesn't chime. But it just did. You say this clock struck? Yes, yes, just as we passed it. Oh, that is extraordinary. $200, you said. We'll take it. Sold. Now, do you still want to see the lamps? Oh, uh, but yes, I still need one for the guest room. I'll help you to the car with the clock. Thanks. And I'll go and check out the lamp. They're on the porch, remember? I'll be back in a moment to help you move the clock. And a very beautiful one, too. Funny what he said about it never chiming, though. Isn't it? Careful now. Watch the chair. See it. Oh, the clock weighs a ton. Uh, I never found one this heavy. Okay, your end down first. Here we go. Oh, oh. oh there we are. Oh. Now, come around here and just steady her as we stand her up. Oh, it looks so much bigger inside here than it did on the lawn. Well, it's a matter of perspective. Uh, there we are. Hmm. Oh. It is imposing, isn't it? <laughs> it looks better there than I thought it would. Well, let's polish it up first. Then see if you can get it going. Okay. Here, you rub it down with the linseed oil and I'll do the glass on the door. Hey, this wood is fantastic. I can't tell what it is, but... Maple, maybe? Or, or even oak? I think we found a steel today. Hey, you know, Charlotte, the grain in this wood has a sort of design to it. Hmm? Look, like foreign characters or something. Yes. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh. This looks like a row of A's. Yeah, and see here? Look, here's a ram's head. But they're not carved. The wood's as smooth as glass. Yeah, well, it couldn't be paint. No. Could it be that the wood just... just grew that way? That's possible, I guess. But these figures are so... clear. It doesn't seem like an accident of nature. <gasps> look, there are more on the other side. You don't really notice them until you look for them. Uh, this oil really brings out the color and the grain of the wood. I want to clean the inside of the door. Have you got the key? Oh, yeah. Uh, here in my pocket... Here. See, maybe these are some sort of uh, religious symbols, hmm? It belonged to a minister. But they don't look like... Charlie? Yeah? Put your hand inside here. Inside the clock? Go ahead. Feel it? Yeah. Yeah, the air is sort of cool and, and damp. <laughs> I didn't feel that when we took the pendulum out to bring it home. But then the clock was out in the hot sun. Why would the air inside the clock be cooler than room temperature? It beats me. Oh, oh, Mike's awake. Uh, I'll have to heat up the bottle, darling. Yeah, you go ahead. I'll finish. Uh, I want to fool around with the works and see if I can get it going and figure out what goes with the chime. Hmm. <laughs> Speak of the devil. <laughs> there it goes again. Second time this morning. You spent half of yesterday working on it. It's obvious there's something wrong with it that you can't fix. Oh, better hurry and finish your lunch. Mother's plane gets in in two hours. You sure you won't change your mind about coming along? No, and Mother won't mind. Mike's been so fussy and restless these past two days. I think he's coming down with something. Probably another tooth. And Tinker hasn't been around all morning. It's not like her to stay away so long. I'm going to go and look for her. Hey, cats do as they please, and you know it. But yesterday she wouldn't come in at all. She'd start up the porch steps, and then she'd arch her back and spit. She refused to come into the house. Oh, well, she'll be all right. Cats know how to take care of themselves. And I'd better get going. Traffic to the airport might be heavy. And wait till you see how your grandson's grown. He grows some every day, it seems. He'll be walking soon. He's ten months old tomorrow. <laughs> You'll be seeing him in about 30 seconds. We're home. Oh, there's Charlotte. Oh, she looks a little thinner, don't you think? Yeah, well, she's taken up jogging. 
Hi. Hello, darling. Oh, Mother. Oh, how good to see you again. Mm. Oh, you look wonderful. And feel it, too. Oh, I'm so sorry about not coming to the airport. Oh, that's all right, dear. What's the difference? Now put your bags in your room, Mother. Thanks, Charlie. How was the flight? Oh, rough and bumpy. I skipped the food and stuck with my old fashioned. We're cooking out tonight. You'll get one of Charlie's steak specials. Oh, that'll be nice. Charlie tells me you've taken up job. What's the matter? Mother, what is it? I feel... Charlie! Mother, are you sick? Here, sit down. No, 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 I'm not sick. I never felt it in this house before. What do you want? Felt what? A... A force. Very, very faint. What's the matter? What kind of force? When I stepped inside the house, it... Brushed me. Ever so lightly. Oh, I could even be mistaken. Hey, what is this? Do you feel it now? No, 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 not at all now. Come on upstairs and lie down. You said you hadn't eaten. Maybe that's it. No, I don't need to lie down, dear. I... Oh, I shouldn't have alarmed you. It, it was nothing. Oh, I want to see my grandson. Are you sure you're all right, Mother? Of course. Now, where is that Mike? Well, he's still sleeping. But it's almost time for his dinner. All right. I'll go upstairs, unpack and freshen up. Well, you can look in on him. He might even be awake. I'll just tiptoe in and see. I'll be down in a little while. Hey, what was she so upset about? I, I still don't understand. Neither do I. She said she felt a, a, a force, but then she tried to brush it off as, as though it wasn't anything at all. Yeah, I heard. It kind of bothers me, though. Mother is sensitive to those things, but what kind of force could be in our house? You think that's what... You think that's what's spooking Tinker? You said she's gone again. I don't know. I, I certainly don't feel anything. No, neither do I. And you know how I feel about psychic phenomena. Huh? <laughs> Look, if Mom doesn't bring it up again, let's forget it. I hope I can. Are you going to work a while? I'm going to bed. Just a minute or two. I want to look at this new hosiery layout and then sleep on it. Mother and Mike are both dead to the world. Those flights always tire her. Hmm. Charlie, did Mother say anything more to you about her feelings? I mean, about the force, as she calls it, and the clock. No, not really. Uh, just that she thought the marks on the clock were ancient symbols or something. Yes. Remember how she dismissed it while we were having dinner? I couldn't pin her down to a direct answer. <laughs> So she doesn't want to make you nervous. Well, it only makes me more nervous. It's something I didn't mention. When I told her we thought the cool air inside the clock came from the type of wood, she said that could be one explanation. Oh, she has another? She wouldn't say. Charlotte, hey, you didn't mess around with my drawing board, did you? What? I never go near it when you're working on a layout. Well, the sketch I did yesterday is all smudged. Look. Well, darling, I have no idea how it that didn't could... blow to the floor, maybe. Uh, you picked it up? No, or... absolutely not. I've told you. Well, how could something no one touched smudge up like that? I mean, these inks don't blur. Charlie, I give you my word. I, I know, Charlotte. I'm not accusing. I'm, I'm just mystified. I'll have to do the whole thing over again in the morning. Well, come into bed then. Yeah, yeah, I'll be right in. Gee, that's strange. It just couldn't happen like that. Charlie. Charlie, wake up. Charlie. What? What? What's the matter? It's the clock. Listen. It hasn't stopped. Usually it's only one or two strokes. Supernatural. You're going down there? Of course. Well, I'm coming with you. I heard you two in the hall. What's the matter with the clock? Well, that's what I'm going to find out. I'll stop that chiming if I have to break the whole damn mechanism. I'd be very careful, Charlie. I take my advice and don't touch it. I'm going to do something to stop the chimes. It's, it's gone haywire. Do as Mother says, Charlie, please. Don't touch it. 
But it looks like I don't have to. It stopped. Hey, wait. Do you feel that? Yes. A little gust of cool air? Yeah. Damp. I'm going into the dining room. Uh Uh-oh. That's where it's coming from. The front of the clock's open. Look. (gasps) The whole room's cold. Something opened that door to the clock. Something? Well, it couldn't have been someone, could it? Charlotte, put on some coffee. It's time we face facts. And high time, I'd say, wouldn't you? Whether Charlotte and Charlie want to admit it or not, there's something strange going on in their home. Charlotte's mother realizes it and realized it the moment she set foot in the house. So while the coffee's brewing in the Tucker household at 2.15 a.m., we'll take a short break ourselves. always seem more sinister in the middle of the night, don't they? At two o'clock in the morning, our little fears are magnified many times. And at 2.15 this morning, in the brightly lighted kitchen of Charlotte and Charlie Tucker, the sinister happening of the past few moments hangs heavily over the three figures huddled over their coffee. There is something strange in this house, Charlotte. Something psychic. Oh, really? Now, wait. Well... I know you both take my interest in parapsychology lightly. Oh, you have every right. I'm not going to make light of it, Mother. Not after this. You never did tell me your explanation for the cool air in the clock. Well, I don't know what causes that. Mm. But something psychic is developing in this house. Developing? I felt it the moment I came in yesterday afternoon. I tried not to make too much of it. I avoided your questions. But I'm too concerned now. I really am. But why? Why why would our house all of a sudden be (laughs) possessed, if that's what you mean? And what's the clock got to do with it? Well, I think whatever it is in this house started when you brought that clock home. For what reason? Well, again, I have to say, Charlie, I I don't know. Have you noticed anything else strange in the house? Other than the peculiar behavior of that clock? Well, the baby's been awfully restless lately. I, I mean, more than usual. And Tinker, she wouldn't come in the house yesterday. She's run off and... Uh-huh. Charlie, your layout. Oh, now you've got me wondering. What was that about a layout? Oh, it's a hosiery ad I've been working on. It's been smudged and nobody in the house could have done it. Except perhaps a spirit. Oh, Mother. <gasps> well, now that seems even more unlikely. How could a spirit smudge a physical drawing? Poltergeists can actually hurl furniture around. Oh, we've got poltergeists? Charlie, Charlotte, I'm very serious. I think you should call in a psychic investigator, a ghost breaker. You are serious. Very much. Now, there's a particularly good one I know of. Oh, I don't know him personally, but he has an international reputation. Now, he might be interested in this. I thought these guys just prowl around old English mansions. Oh, far from it, Charlie. They're willing to make a preliminary examination almost anywhere. And they can usually tell right away if there's a hoax involved or if it's just coincidental events. I personally think there is nothing coincidental here. Well, how would we get in touch with this uh, investigator? His name is Paul Carlton. Yes, the American Society for Psychical Research could get in touch with him. Oh, they'd be sure to be interested, too. Charlie, do you think we should go that far? It scares me. Charlotte... The sooner this thing is brought out in the open, the better. Well, I'm with you, Mother Lee. I'm all for this poor Carlton having a look. If he's willing to come. Would you like me to get in touch with him? Yes. All right. I'll call the society for you first thing in the morning. Hello? Mrs. Lee? Yes? Paul Carlton. The society gave me your message. Oh, yes, Mr. Carlton. Thank you for calling. Not at all. I'm very interested in all you told them. When may I examine the house and the clock? Oh, just a minute, please. 
Charlotte, he wants to see the house. When can I tell him? Well, the sooner the better. Tomorrow, if he wants. Uh, Mr. Carlton? Yes? Any time is fine with us. Well, I have a speaking engagement in Philadelphia tomorrow night. I could be there a day after tomorrow. Say, ten in the morning? Yes, any time. And Mrs. Lee, today and tomorrow, be very alert to anything else that occurs in the house. The more details, the better. I understand. I'll see you Thursday morning. Here he is. There's a cab pulling up out front. Oh, I'm so nervous. You and me both. (laughs) He's just going to look around, isn't he? I mean, he's he's not going to conjure up a lot of evil spirits. Of course not, Charlie, but I'm anxious to see if he confirms my feelings. Well, uh, look, we might as well go out and welcome him. Uh, We know he's here. Mr. Colton. Uh, Hello. Uh, Mr. Tucker? Yes, uh, welcome. We appreciate your coming. Oh, thank you. But I'm the one who's appreciative. Come in. Uh, This is my wife, Charlotte. How do you do? My pleasure, madam. And my mother-in-law, Mrs. Lee. Ah, yes, we spoke. Oh, it's an honor to meet you, Mr. Carlton. I've read both your books. Oh, thank you. You're interested in parapsychology, then? Well, I I dabble. Now then, let's get to work. Uh, May I see this celebrated clock? Right there in the dining room. Follow me. Ah, yes. Beauty, isn't it? Certainly an antique. Charlotte, he didn't feel anything strange, like I did. He might have, and not mentioned it. Uh, Mrs. Lee, uh, you were right about these characters in the wood. Oh, they are symbols, then. Oh, I was pretty sure. Uh, would you open the door, please? I want to examine inside. Sure. We've kept it locked ever since that experience the night before last. Well, I want to get into that in more detail later. Mm-hmm. There you are. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely cooler. I'll just shine my pocket flash in here. Doesn't seem to be any reason for it. Good heavens. What is it? Your voice, it's uh, echoing like a canyon. What do you mean? Well, when your head was inside the clock, your voice echoed. Show me. You speak in there. All right. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. That is extraordinary. I didn't hear my own voice like that. As though you and Charlie were talking into a long tunnel. Hmm. The inside is solid all around. Sound should be muffled. There is something psychic about it, isn't there, Mr. Carlton? Well, at this point, let's say there is need for more explanation. I'm going to take another look. Solid wood inside, all right. Ah, there's a name etched in here. Probably the maker. Might give us a good clue. Can you read it? Yes, it's faint. S-A-R-G-A-T-A-N-A-S. Saga something? Well, it's either a wry joke or... What is it? Saga tennis, Mrs. Lee. In witchcraft. Oh, yes. One of the devil's lieutenants. Brigadier, to be exact. Yes. Saga Tannis, whose specialty is opening locks. Devil. Brigadier. Really? You do have a curiosity here, Mrs. Tucker. There's much justification for further investigation. I thought so. Uh, With your permission, I want to return with a medium I work with frequently. She's gifted and brilliant. Enormous sensitivity. You mean, uh, you mean a seance? Oh, well, not exactly, but if the strange qualities of the clock are the result of spiritual forces, Margaret Egan will know it. Charlotte? Well, we've gone this far. We might as well. Now, keep the door to the clock locked, as you have done. Uh, by the way, has the cat returned? No. Uh, that's a very definite sign. Animal behavior is almost always an indication of the unseen. I'd like to go over the entire house now, and then I'll be in touch with you after I talk with the medium. Uh, Hello? Uh, Margaret, it's Paul Carlton. Oh, hello, Paul. Uh, How are you? Fine. Fine. I have a job for you, a fascinating case. It's a home in Pennsylvania. 
Everything centers around an old clock with the name Sargatanus etched on the inside. Sargatanus? I thought that would impress you. The devil's locksmith. When can you work with me? Oh, any time. Oh, perhaps the sooner the better. Good. We'll drive down tomorrow. I'll fit you in on the details on the way. Anything special you'll need, Mrs. Egan? Uh, no, Mrs. Tucker, no, no, no. Just a, a comfortable chair. Uh, I might explain that hopefully, through Margaret's trance, we'll be able to learn the nature of the spirit that inhabits the clock. Are you serious? Oh, very much so. Oh, there is a spiritual force at work in this house, Mrs. Tucker. I felt it the moment I entered. We believe it's the only explanation for the phenomena you've experienced. Well, but you're not going to uh, make anything appear, are you? Oh, no, no, Mrs. Tucker. This is not a seance. Uh, no hand-holding or dim lights. In my trance, if I can contact my guide, we may be able to learn how to deal with whatever force is in here. Why don't we get started, Margaret? Well, I am ready. Just let me relax a moment. Leona. Leona. We need your help, Leona. I am here. This is Leona. What can you tell us? Of Sargatanus. Why do you wish to know? We believe he's at work. Sargatanus is imprisoned. He has been imprisoned for 103 years. We have reason to think he's at work. Impossible. We have in our possession a clock with his name etched into the wood. Subret, therefore, Dundee... What? Uh, speak again, Leona. Board to prom. Oh, she's losing contact. Leona, Leona, can you hear me? Sargatanus imprisoned. Charlie, look. The door to the clock. Yeah, it's opening. All by itself. That cold air again, too. Look. Something floated out of the clock. <gasps> I saw it, too. What was it? I don't know. I don't want to know. She said she wouldn't make anything appear. Margaret. Margaret. Huh? Huh? What? Huh? Huh? Oh, did I make contact? Briefly. We lost her. Mr. Carlton. Look at the clock. Yes. I saw it opening during the trance. Then you saw something float out while you were talking to Mrs. Egan. Something floated out of it? Yes. <gasps> An ectoplasmic manifestation. There was a manifestation of some sort. But all we got from Leona was gibberish. Except at the beginning, when she said Sargatanus was imprisoned. Oh, I've got more work to do. I don't have the strength for another trance now. But I want to consult my books and my charts. I've got to do more research on Sargatanus. And that does seem to be the key to this. Yes, I think so. But what was it that came out of the clock? Is it still here? Very likely. Look, I, I think we're going too far with all of this. Oh, it would not be wise to stop now. Are you going to get rid of these spirits for us? Well, we cannot promise that. What we are trying to do now is identify them. We don't care how they're identified. We want them out of our house. I know how you feel, Mrs. Tucker, but try not to be frightened or discouraged. So far, there seems to be no evil spirit involved. Playful, perhaps. And often they'll simply leave a dwelling of their own accord. But we do want to continue our investigation. All right. We'll go along with anything. Only please, the sooner you can clear this up, the better. Oh, yes, we'll, we will be in touch in a few days after my research. Is there anything I can do to help? I'm so fascinated by all this. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Lee, but at the moment, I don't think so. Just be alert to anything that may happen. You'll hear from us very shortly. Carlton here. 
Paul, it's Margaret. I think we have stumbled on the case of the century. Explain. Sargatanus is the key, all right. Now, can you get in touch with the people the Tuckers got that clock from? Well, I don't know. I, I suppose so. Why? Well, if my calculations are correct... Yes? ...and the information I have so far points to it, that clock the Tuckers bought used to be known as the Gate to Hell. <laughs> certainly glad she said used to be. Although, with all those strange goings on at the Tucker household, I wonder if someone or something is trying to open the gate again. But why? Why now, all of a sudden? And why pick on the innocent Tuckers? I don't have the answers, but perhaps someone or something will when we return with Act Three. Dante's Inferno, the poet tells us the inscription above the entrance to hell is Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Well, that inscription is not on the antique clock purchased by Charlie and Charlotte Tucker. Only the strange name Sargatanus, supposed to be a disciple of the devil. But our medium friend, Margaret Egan, thinks the clock was an entrance to hell, which seems surprising. For if I were to imagine an entrance to hell, I'd picture it in some deep jungle, arctic waste, desolate mountain range, or perhaps even a New York City brownstone house. Hardly a clock. Oh, it's becoming more incessant, isn't it? It's really driving me crazy. I want Charlie to get rid of it. Just take it anywhere. Destroy it. I'd let Paul Carlton and Margaret Egan have another go at it first. They're coming tomorrow, aren't they? Yes, and I hope this... What's the matter? There he is again. Who? That man crossing the street. I saw him yesterday. At least I think it's a man. Well, so? Look at him. Hunchback. So oddly dressed as though he were trying to hide his entire body. Now, why should you think anything of it? I had the feeling he was watching our house. Oh, now, Charlotte, I know we're unnerved by what's been happening, dear, but... I know. I'm imagining all sorts of things. Oh, I hope these people can solve something for us tomorrow. I can't go on like this. I know I suggested having them in. But maybe it's just intensified things. It's simple, really. If the clock is spooked, we get rid of the clock and the spooks along with it. I'm not sure it's as simple as that. Oh, you're sounding like them. I'm going to the village, dear. You want anything in particular? What about Wolf Bane and Frankincense? I wish I could laugh at that. <gasps> Here he comes. Who? What? Yes, he's coming up the walk. That oddly dressed man. I saw him yesterday. He has been watching the house. Well, I'll see what he wants. Well, don't let him in. I, I, I have a strange feeling, that's all. Yes? I must see the clock. What? Who are you? What do you want? I must see the clock. How do you know about our clock? I must see it. Please. If you take that scarf off your face, maybe I can understand you better. Get rid of him, Charlie, please. I know about your clock, which chimes. I have heard the chime. I must see it. Are you an antique dealer? No. Well, what do you mean you've heard the chime? Charlie, don't. May I just see it? Then I'll leave. I'll leave. What do you know about it? Perhaps. A great deal. Well, maybe you could answer some questions for us. About the clock. Perhaps. Well, just a look, then. It's in the dining room. Come in. Charlotte. Look, he just may be able to shed some light on this. How do you know about the clock? That's what I want to know. I have heard it chime. Ah, yes, there it is. At the last. Charlie, what is he doing? Hey, now, look, wait a minute. Look, you can't open that door. It's locked. At the last, after all these years. He opened it. Hey, what What the... Good heavens, he's stepping in. Oh, hey, get out of there. Him, what the devil do you think oh, you're doing? I'm going to summon the others. Ah! He's, he's a 
He just disappeared. Wait, it didn't happen. I can't believe it. It didn't happen. It's empty. The guy is gone. But, uh, hey, look at here. I, I'm not staying at this house another minute. Charlotte, wait a minute. Charlie, we better call Paul Carlton at once. They can get a plane. We don't dare wait until tomorrow. Did you get a look at his face at all? No. No, he kept it wrapped up in a muffler type of a thing. Mm -hmm. And he vanished inside the clock. Yeah, like that. We'd better begin. Yes. I'll, I'll try harder. Paul, be sure to press Leona for details. I'll try for a deeper trance. You still haven't told us who you think that creature was. I'm sick with fear now. We understand, Mrs. Tucker. Uh, believe me, this is the most unusual case Margaret and I have ever worked on. You have every right to be nervous. I think we'll have some of the answers in just a few minutes. But who or what was that creature that disappeared inside the clock? That wasn't possible. But we all saw it happen. Well, now, now let's see what develops in Margaret's trance. You know what the creature was, and you won't tell us. We didn't see it, Mrs. Tucker. How can we know what it was? Please, let us get on with the work at hand. Yeah, I think we should, Charlotte. All right, all right. I'm sorry. Go into your trance and tell us how to put an end to this evil thing. Leona? Leona, are you there? Leona? I am here. There is much concern here. Much excitement. Leona, Saga Tannis. Saga Tannis has returned. His imprisonment is over. There is so much excitement here. Help us, Leona. Tell us. Saga Tannis is telling them his way to the world was through the clock. His gate to hell. Go the tree, lemon. Uh, Leona, Leona, please. One hundred and three years ago. The clock was bought by a minister. Sagatanus was ecclesiastically imprisoned. The clock with his name inside it. Yes, the clock is one of the gates to hell. She was right. Margaret was right. It chimes to reveal its whereabouts. For 103 years, the gate was closed. Ecclesiastically closed. Now the gate is free. The clock strikes to let Sargatanus know where it is. To let the demon know the way is again open. Now, Leona, I am in the presence of the clock. It is here, in the next room. It is the way. Sargatanus has come to summon the others. The others? For what? What others? The way is now open. From hell to earth, the clock strikes to lead the demons to the exit. When? How soon? The way is open now. Soon. Dobbit, transit. Uh, Le Leona, when? When? Dobbit, gone. Oh, oh, we're you. losing contact again. What in the world does she mean? Well, you heard. The clock is a gate to hell. Every chime is summoning an evil spirit. All right, look, I've had enough of this mumbo-jumbo. I know there's something wacky going on, but all this seance business isn't helping at all. Now, it's making things worse. Charlie, please. What, what, what happened? Oh, did we make contact? Yes, Leona confirms what you thought, Margaret. The clock is a gate to hell. <gasps> she said that? Yes. Oh, it's true, then. Oh, I was sure of it. Oh, but what, what, what is going to happen? Oh, Mrs. Tucker... We must get that clock out of this house and into a church as quickly as possible. Paul. Yes? Did Leona say anything about an emergence? No, she just said the way is now open. It will be soon. Oh, dear Lord, we've got to move fast. Are you really serious? Mr. Tucker, if we do not get that clock out of here and onto hollow ground soon, believe me, all hell will literally break loose. Listen to it. It's calling. Oh, get it out. I'll be glad to get rid of it. Charlie. Charlie, we better do what they say. All right. I'll be glad to see the end of the damn thing, too. That's what it is. It is damned. Oh, do hurry. Give me a hand, Paul. It's, it's not heavy. I'll call the church. Reverend Child is probably there now. No, well, he's not going to believe this. Uh, uh, tip it toward me. I'll go bring the station wagon around. It isn't moving. I can't... Uh... Well, well, lay it on its side. Right. We'll, we'll carry it. I can't budge it. What? We brought it in without any trouble at all, but I, 
And now I, I, I can't move it. Boy, here, let me get on your side. Hmm? All right, now, push. I won't budge. You've got to get it out. Well, we can't move it an inch. Well, well throw your weight against it with me. Now. It's no use. Oh, Sagatanis is having his way. Is there anything you can do, Mrs. Egan? I am a medium, not an exorcist. Unless that clock is on hollow ground. The child says to bring it. He didn't understand what I was talking about, but he said... We can't budge it. What do you mean? The clock is rooted to the floor. Oh, dear heaven, what are we going to do? I'm going to smash it to bits. Oh, that's impossible now, I think. Look. The clock. (gasps) Flames inside. Oh, Oh, the fires of hell. We have on the way. The whole house may go up. The baby. Mike is upstairs. I'll get him. Get out. Everybody out. My baby. I've got to get my baby. Get out, Charlotte. I'll get Mike. Come with me, Charlotte. Hurry. All hell is breaking loose, and we can't stop it. If only I've gotten the connection soon. Saga Tannis. Oh, I should have seen it right away. The flames are spreading. Come on, Margaret. We must get out with the others. Everything's gone. Everything. And this is only the beginning, I'm afraid. My baby, we're safe now. Shh. We're safe, Mrs. Tucker. But I wonder for how long. What do you mean? This is not the end of it. No. Oh, oh my. The Anderson's house is going up, too. There is no escape. It's too late. The world is doomed now. Hell hath triumphed. <laughs> Dickory, dickory, doom. A clock stood in a room. The clock struck well to summon hell. Hickory, dickory, doom. I couldn't resist a little parody on the popular nursery rhyme. Something to bring us back to the real world. To realize that such things just don't happen. Do they? Uh Uh-oh. I'll be back shortly. I see by the old clock in the corner that our time is up for now. The next time you happen on a grandfather clock, I hope you'll take a peek inside. If you feel cold, clammy air in there, I'd suggest you tell whoever owns it to get rid of it quickly, preferably to a nunnery. That is, if there's still time. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Patricia Elliott, Sam Gray, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Uh, See, Carlo, there is no doubt. This is a Lucifer man. Lucifer? You mean the devil, Satan? It was not always so that Lucifer meant evil. In ancient Latin, Lucifer meant bringer of light. The morning star. But this animal groveling under the floor here, you're not saying he's a saintly man. He is a slave of Satan. <laughs> See the way he looks at me. It knows I am its master. This creature is centuries old. Get up, demon soul. Stand up on your two real legs. I shall will you now to answer me. Yes. Speak now of a later time in your existence. What are you? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. Those of you who have attended performances in the Mystery Theater know that there are certain tales 
that particularly entrance and intrigue me. They deal with the unusual, the unfamiliar, the unexplainable. So I have turned today to that master of mystery, Wilkie Collins, who has a habit of coming up with a story that's always making me say, why, that's not possible. Or is it? Xavier, Xavier Yardley Zenith, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Uncle. It's me, Xavier. Are you a ghost? Why didn't Father Daly bless my coffin? I wanted him to, Uncle. But he refused. Absolutely refused. Why, Xavier? Because he said you didn't die a natural death. You must make him bless the grave, Xavier. I... I cannot rest until he does. Our mystery drama, Shadows from the Grave, adapted from a story by Wilkie Collins, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Christopher Tabori and Fred Gwynn. I'll be back in a moment with Act One. One invariably associates mysterious with lonely old houses, strange small inbred towns, peculiar characters. And I have to admit, this story follows that pattern. The man who told it to me is one XY Zenith. You can imagine the comments this poor guy has gone through life with. Nevertheless, he didn't seem to mind when I said, XYZ, would you tell us about your extraordinary adventure yourself? Having been christened Xavier Yardley Zenith and suffered with those initials all through school in California... I decided that when I got to the job age and became very good in photography to open up a studio of my own. Call it Zenith of Hollywood. Not an unusual word in Hollywood where everything is the top, the best, the ultimate, the zenith. Two things occurred in April of this year which totally changed my life. One, I planned to marry. And two... I got a note from my Uncle George, who lived in Fresno, to come see him on what he called a matter of some importance. Hello up there. Uncle George, it's me, Xavier. What are you doing up in that tree? Xavier, welcome, my boy. I've just about sealed up this hole in the tree. Uh, uh, here, give me a hand. Uh, Uh, Steady. Uh, uh, Pretty spry for a man of my age, don't you think? Uh, You've never been up this way before, have you, Xavier? Not since I was a child, Uncle George. What happened to this big old oak? Struck by lightning? No, it's the woodpeckers and squirrels that make all these holes. I've just had it with the noisy beggars. They jump from this tree to the top of the porch, and then they run along my bedroom window, making the most infernal racket you can imagine. So I've just been sealing up a few of their nesting places. Let them find apartments elsewhere, I say. What about that big hole on the other side of the tree? Um, Maybe tomorrow I'll mix up some more cement. Uh, uh, Say, boy, you always go around with two cameras hanging around your neck? Photography is my business, so I'm always prepared just in case. Huh? Is there a living in it? You, uh, you uh, sell your pictures? I used to do better. Took shots of movie stars on location. Did a lot of newspaper and magazine work. But work is thinned out. I have a proposition to make you. Since I gather the picture-taking business isn't too profitable these days, I think you may be interested. Are you married? I'm just about to be. This coming Saturday, matter of fact. Good. Then what I have in mind might make an excellent wedding present. (laughs) Uh... I'm not a rich man, Xavier, but comfortably off. Fifty-nine acres, orchards, gardens, this house. 
and a private family vault on the premises. You're joking. You own a mausoleum? Uh, death is not a joke, Xavier. I am going to die in a week. You? No, you're not. You look fit as a fiddle. An ill-tuned fiddle. Uh, no, death is only a few days off for me. Uh, I've known it would come to this for some time, so it's no surprise. I'd like to show you where I'm going to be buried. Here we are. That's Carrara Marble and Vermont Granite. Uh, those two locks on the bronze door are an invention of mine. Mind if I take a picture of it? Not at all. There's, um, there's no one in your private mausoleum now, is there? No. Uh, there was. Uh, uh, no. Uh, no one. Uh, now, Xavier, I want you to pay particular attention. Two keyholes and two separate brass keys. There is a very good reason for the two locks. When I am laid to rest inside this vault, Xavier, I don't expect I shall be trying to get out. But I do not wish anyone else to get in. But why would a person want to? It's not necessary for me to explain all that to you now, my boy. Uh, I turn the handle. And so... Not spacious, but uh, not crowded. My final home. Uncle, if you don't mind, could we go back to the house now? I'm not at my best in mausoleums. All right. I've shown you everything. We'll sit ourselves on the porch and I'll tell you what's on my mind. Have you ever sat in a porch swing, Xavier? I love these old swings. Uh, Xavier, I have no choice. You are my only living kin. There is no one else. I'm leaving all my worldly possessions. Uh, this house, the contents, the grounds. Everything to you. On one condition. You must live here and every day. Every single day, mind you. You must go to that mausoleum and make certain there's been no one tampering with the locks. Uh-huh. And, and that's the only condition, Uncle? The only one. I certainly appreciate your generosity. Can I think it over and let you know? I'd like to talk it over with Catherine. Absolutely not. You're going to agree right now. But, Uncle... But what? <laughs> you can have your zenith of Hollywood office right here. This place is plenty big enough. You can turn the solarium into a studio if you like. I don't care. I won't be here. It's all decided then? Hmm? Hmm? Good. I'll have Henley take you to the top of the hill. A good view and you can see most of the property. Uh, have a tug at that bell pull, will you, Xavier? Uh, my dear boy, you don't know what a relief this is. My fate lies in your hands. Uh, wait just a moment, Uncle. I haven't agreed to this inheritance yet. But if I do, and I find someone's been at the locks of that mausoleum, what should I do? In my desk in the library, bottom right-hand drawer is a letter of instructions. The envelope has one word on it. Joshua. Did you say Joshua? But, unless someone's been trying to break in, that letter must never be read. You rang, sir? Yes, Henley. This is my nephew. Xavier Yardley Zenith. He's going to be living here. I want you to acquaint him with the property. Very well, sir. Goodbye, Xavier. I shall not be seeing you again. Have a good walk. Well, my dear Joshua, your old friend George Zenith has found a way to outwit you. <laughs> Do you hear me, Joshua? That's exactly what he said, Catherine. He stood looking out of the window at the tree he'd been cementing, talking to someone called Joshua, who of course wasn't in the tree. It was most uncanny. And then I left the room with Henley, the butler. How well do you know your Uncle George? Only slightly, I'd say. 
So then you have no idea what he meant by, Joshua, I'm going to outwit you now. Not the vaguest. But the important thing is, Catherine, do we want to spend the rest of our lives in a Victorian white elephant with a cook and a butler? Our lives? Well, that's the deal if I accept. I have to guard that mausoleum every single day. Darling, let's forget about this crazy Uncle George of yours. We're getting married Saturday. That's enough to think about for now. If your uncle wants to leave us his big old house in Fresno, fine. I love old houses, especially when it's a free gift. You didn't promise anything, did you? No, I didn't. Saturday, Catherine and I tied the knot. Nothing fancy, just a few friends at the registrar's office on Hollywood Boulevard. About a dozen of us drove out to Laguna Beach for a wedding breakfast, and we just got around to toasting one another in California champagne when my service tracked me down and left a message that Uncle George had died. And would I come back to Fresno? I'm Father Daly, Mr. Zenith. Your uncle came occasionally to our church. Father Daly, this is my wife, Catherine. Uh, how do you do? I'm sorry this sad occasion has brought us together. Not a very auspicious first married week, is it? It's hard to believe. He seemed so healthy. And when he talked about being dead in a week... Did he? Yes. Well, I thought it was his macabre sense of humor. How do you suppose he knew? Well, if he intended to take his own life, then quite naturally he would know. Well, surely no one thinks... Uh, my son, no one knows... When is the funeral service? Well, there isn't going to be one in the strict sense of the word. No funeral? But why not, Father? Well, I'm afraid Mr. Zenith's uncle may not have died a natural death. The medical examiner said an overdose of sleeping pills. Oh, but couldn't that have been an accident? I mean, he told me he had a lot of trouble sleeping. Oh, of course it could have. Which is what the coroner decided, death by accident. But so long as there's the slightest suspicion which you have rather confirmed just now for me, I cannot bless the grave. I could bite my tongue for telling you what he said, that he'd be dead in a few days. Had you kept your uncle's intention secret, that indeed would have been a mortal sin. Yes, Henley. You wish to see me? I do, sir. Cook and I want to leave. You wish to leave this house? But why? Oh, while your uncle was alive, there were some very peculiar things going on, but out of loyalty, we just couldn't go. Peculiar things that frightened you? Oh, yes, indeed, sir. Strange voices and goings-on and awful shrieks. Like someone being attacked. Terrifying, if you ask me. I quite agree with you. Have you heard such noises since my uncle passed away? No, Mr. Zenith. Well, then I suggest to you... The noises died with him. Now, I'll double your salary. Cook's also. And I don't want to hear any more about your leaving. Well, you, you put it that way, sir. We'll be happy to stay on. Every day, I'd go out and check the locks on the family vault. Catherine and I started making over the solarium into a studio. And I ordered equipment for a darkroom. But then, one night... I had a strange dream. Xavier! Xavier Yardley Zenith! Is that you, Uncle George? Why didn't Father Daly bless my coffin? I wanted him to, Uncle, but he wouldn't. He said there was some question as to how you died. You must insist he bless the coffin. I cannot rest until he does. Uncle George... Am I really talking to you? Or am I imagining things in my sleep? Promise me you will make Father Daly bless my remains. Otherwise, I... I am lost. I am lost. To sleep, says Hamlet, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. 
our friend Xavier Yardley Zenith has surely been given pause. His uncle dies mysteriously, then appears in a dream, giving orders, exacting promises. Where will it lead? Where will it end? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. It has been an enigma for thousands of years. Are ghosts an illusion, a projection of what one wishes to see, or do they represent some ephemeral link between the world of the dead and the world of the living? The problem that faces Xavier is to persuade a member of the ministry to bless the remains of a man who may have committed murder, for that is indeed how the church regards suicide. Catherine, I tell you, Uncle George's ghost said it as clearly as I say this to you. Father Daly must give me his blessing. I cannot rest until he does. Honey, can I say something? I appreciate this inheritance, the house, the grounds, money to run it and have a butler and a cook. I never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I'd have that. But on the minus side, there's all this infatuation with death. That mausoleum which has to be guarded as though it were Tutankhamun's tomb. And now you having nightmares about your uncle. Xavier, it's not healthy. What am I to do? I gave my word. Well, what about your career? You're a little young to retire to a gingerbread house in Fresno and, and play nursemaid to ghoulies and ghosties. Oh, we're going to make a great studio out of the solarium. And then that enormous closet, turning it into a dark room, it'll be great. You don't understand me, do you? You've got to get out into the world and take pictures, Mr. Zenith of Hollywood. But having always to be one night away from this place so you can check the locks on a dead man's tomb is going to hold you back. I told you all this before we married, so don't throw it in my face now. What's the matter with you, Xavier? Have you no will of your own? Why, a month ago, if I told you that a ghost came to me in my sleep, you would have laughed right out loud. I'm not laughing now. You really believe you saw him, don't you? Of course I do. I was there. He was there. I heard him. And you've decided to stick it out here for the rest of your life, is that it? If I have to, I will. I think I'd better leave you alone until you cool off. I'm not letting any dead uncle get in the way of my life. And I mean it. Catherine did mean it. Next thing I knew, she'd lit out and went back to L.A. I knew where to find her, all right. At her mother's. But I was darned if I'd go running after her. My dear Mr. Zenith, my hands are tied. The church simply cannot acknowledge any untoward death. Father Daly, for three nights running, Uncle George has appeared to me at night saying, Help me lie in rest. I cannot until Father Daly blesses my coffin. Xavier, may I call you Xavier? I wish you would. My boy... You and I are both modern men at the edge of the 21st century. For you to tell me that you're being visited by your uncle's ghost, while I won't discount it as a possibility, it's much more likely to be your own conscience worrying you to such an extent that you can convince yourself that you've seen him. You tell me it happens when you're asleep. I say to you, yes, it could... But that still doesn't make it any more than a dream. Last night, he said I should read some of the books in his library and I would understand. Go read your uncle's books. And if this brings you peace of mind, then you'll know whether his appearances are fact or fancy. That's just what I aim to do, Father. You rang for me, sir? Yes, I did, Henley. Come into the library and shut the door behind you. Did you know my uncle was greatly interested in black magic? Well, I did tell you I was aware something strange was going on. He and Mr. Tree, they did some kind of... I, 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 I don't know what you'd call it. Mr. Tree? A friend of your uncle's. They spent a lot of time together and then... A year ago, Mr. Tree went away. Can you be more specific than something strange? Well, sir, there'd be a lot of candles. Hundreds, in fact. 
They'd have them all burning. And there'd be incense and chanting. Right here in the library, Mr. Zenith. I've been reading these books. And what amazed me was how many of them deal with the power of black magic. I remember him asking me to bring home a cup of holy water from the church. And I, I said to him, I said, Well, sir, you're supposed to go to church in person and, and bless yourself with holy water, not bring the holy water here. And your uncle said, Getting the holy water is the easy task. I have to get the, the blood of a child to mix with the water. Henley, did you ever find out what it was for? No, I didn't. I didn't ask. And I didn't steal the holy water from the church either. Henley, you strike me as a sensible man. Will you do me a favor tonight? I generally take a walk in the garden after dark. Perhaps you'd walk with me. Well, c certainly, sir. I see you brought your camera, Mr. Zenith. Can you take pictures with only moonlight? Oh, yes. Film is so fast nowadays. I could get a picture of you at 20 feet by the light of one match. Why? Now, this part here where we're walking, is this also part of my uncle's property? Well, I should say your property, sir. This is all part of it. And, and that brook, too. Let, let, let's walk to the other side across this footbridge. The path seems to continue downstream. Over there. Over there. What's that little stone building? Oh, that's the mausoleum, sir. Oh, so it is. By moonlight, uh, I'm afraid I'm a little discombobulated. Oh, wait. That's a good shot from this side of the brook. The mausoleum reflected in the water. Yeah, I think I got it. Henley. Henley. What's that? <sighs> What's what, sir? The figure of a man. I, I, I just saw him in my viewfinder. Then he disappeared. Where, sir? There, there, again. Can't you see it? Yes. Yes, there was someone. Uh, he's moving away from the mausoleum. You, you see him? He's wearing a long cape almost to the ground. Can you see? A long cape? Oh, no, no, no. Excuse me, Mr. Zenith, but I must go now. No, 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 just a minute. What is it? Sir, will you please let go of my arm? Yeah, I, I will when you tell me. Now, do you know that man? He's come back. Oh, I never thought we'd see him again. Henley ran off. I followed the man in the cape, keeping my distance across the brook. He seemed to glide over the earth. I ran across the footbridge towards him, and then he disappeared. I turned back to the house, and suddenly there he was, standing against a big oak tree. And then he seemed to melt right into it. I do apologize, Mr. Zenith, for my behavior last night, leaving you like that. Yes, I was rather puzzled. You're a photographer, sir, and so I... I have something to show you. This snapshot. Do you see that, man? Yes. It's very like the thing I saw last night. A hunched over man with a long cape. What? It looks like he's talking to someone. Someone out of camera range, possibly. Well, that's the peculiar part of it. He was talking to someone. Uh, I took a picture of the two of them. But the other man's not in the picture. Are you saying this person we can't see was there but didn't register on the film? I, I don't think I understand. Perhaps it's better that you don't, Mr. Zenith. What about the man whose picture you got? Do you know him? It's Mr. Joshua Tree, sir, when he used to live here. And now he's come back. That's why I must beg you for your understanding and indulgence. Mrs. Henley and I simply cannot stay for a moment longer. But even if it is Mr. Tree who's come back, wh wh why must you leave, Henley? I, I, I can't say any more. I really can't. But if you want my advice, Mr. Xavier, if you value your life, you'll leave here also. When I developed the shots I took of the caped figure, they were identical to Henley's snapshot. 
That night, from the darkened library, I watched the oak tree. At midnight, the figure in the cape appeared. I crept out of the house, following it to the door of the mausoleum. This is what Uncle George must have meant. I reached forward to stop the man. Something hit me on the head from behind. I blacked out. Xavier? Xavier, are you all right? Oh. Catherine. What are you doing here? Am I dreaming? Don't ask so many questions. That's quite a bump on your head. Here, let me help you up. No, no, I, can, I can make it all right. Oh. Ooh. Whoever hit me wasn't kidding. You just stop talking and lean on me and we'll walk slowly back to the house. Catherine, this gets more mysterious every minute. But the biggest mystery is how you just happened to show up. I'm your wife, remember? I decided I was being stupid, so I came back. Oh, no, darling, you don't have to hold me up. I can make it all right. Uh-uh, you're not going to trip and fall again while I'm around. Catherine, I didn't fall. Somebody hit me. Xavier, what are you talking about? I saw you at the mausoleum when I came out of the house. I saw you step back and fall over. There wasn't a soul in sight. You didn't see anyone near me? It's after two in the morning. When we get back to the house, to bed you go and not a peep out of you. You don't believe that I was hit from behind? I believe my eyes. And they didn't see a thing. Father Daly, who is Joshua Tree? Where did you hear that name? Henley told me, but not much else. Joshua Tree. He was a man who, to the bottom of his heart, if he had one, was basically evil. How did my uncle come to know him? Well, he just turned up about two years ago. Your uncle took a fancy to him and saw a good deal of him. Which I am afraid was the most unfortunate thing he ever did in his life. Why do you say that, Father? Joshua Tree was the very spirit of the devil himself. I show you a photograph I took near my uncle's vault the day before yesterday. Is that Joshua Tree? Hmm. Well, I... <clears throat> I can't really make out the face. But the cape and the angle of the head, very similar, I'd say... But, of course, how could it be? He disappeared a year ago. Father, here's another picture. Is that the man? Yes. That's him. You didn't take this picture, did you? No. It was given to me by Henley. He took it. Now, if that's Joshua Tree, you notice he appears to be talking to someone, but there's no one there. Oh, yes, there is. But the camera can't record an apparition. You mean Joshua Tree was talking to someone, but we can't see him? Because, my dear young lady, that invisible thing is a familiar. What's that? A familiar is an evil spirit visible to very few. The devil can see him, as can a sorcerer's apprentice. So you were saying Joshua Tree was such an apprentice? Xavier, are you in here? Uh, there's nothing here. Now, try this drawer. What are you doing? There's uh, nothing, no, nothing. What do you mean, nothing? I mean there's nothing in any of my uncle's desk drawers. He told me there was. Xavier, why don't you answer me? Because I don't have any answers. Uh, let me see if I can get under this desk. Knock the wood. Maybe there's a secret drawer. Ah, oh, yes, it's hollow here. Listen. One of these drawers is short. Behind it, there the, the, the must be. Yeah, yeah. I'll pull this drawer out. And I'll put it on the floor. Then uh, I reach back inside. Yes. I, I feel something. An envelope. Well, here she be. How did you know it was back there? Before he died, the last time I saw him alive... Uncle George told me that if somebody was tampering with his mausoleum, I'd find my instructions in a letter with the word Joshua written on it. To whom it may concern... So... Oh, no. Oh, no. Murdered. 
He killed him. Lord in heaven, what are we to do now? The ghost in the play Hamlet says, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burned and purged away. Is it so with Uncle George? Is he also doomed to eternal unrest until his sins are purged and burnt away? Mystery Theater will return shortly. It's all very well to poo-poo the occult, ghostly apparitions, phantoms that haunt, the deceased who cannot find peace until they find love or forgiven their earthly sins, etc., etc. But the fact remains that time and again, psychic researchers have agreed there are manifestations that defy and disobey nature's laws. And whether we like it or not, the unexplained does exist. I shall never forget that evening. For even as I stood there, the letter of confession in my hand, Catherine waiting for me to read on, we were both suddenly so overcome by the cold I had to light a fire. And this was late July, mind you. We needed a fire. We lit candles. Something compelled us to light dozens and dozens of candles. Oh, I feel warmer now. It's seeing the flames, I think. Go on, Xavier, read your uncle's letter. To whom it may concern, especially you, my dear nephew Xavier, I fear they have come to get me. They've appeared at the door of my mausoleum, or else you would not be reading this letter. This letter. Stop. Uncle George. Catherine, do you see him? Yes. Is he... Is that your... Don't be alarmed, my dear young lady. I am sorry we did not meet before, but only your husband can help me. Is this true? Am I really hearing this? Xavier, you must find Joshua's body and destroy it. Burn it. You see, I had to kill him. I put his body in the crypt and then it disappeared. Oh, how horrible. Catherine, Joshua Tree's death was not half so horrible as his life. I was a fool, a lonely old fool. I submitted to his black magic. I subordinated my will to his and became a crawling, a oh, craven creature. My mind, I... My mind, I lost control of my mind... It was all the doing of the hellish creature he conjured up from the world of the damned. His familiar. Uncle, if Joshua Tree's body is hidden somewhere, how can I find it? We will try anything to help you, Uncle. Persuade Father Daly to bless my grave. Help me, Xavier. Help me. I'm glad you finally saw him too, Catherine. Oh, those heavy summer storms. We better check the library windows. Mm. I'll do the ones on the side, Catherine. You make sure the ones facing the front are tightly shut. Look! The fire in the fireplace. It's going out. How strange. Well, it must be the downdraft blowing down the chimney. Now the fire's gone out. All the candles are going out. Must be some strange air circulating in this room. Let me get the electric lights. The switch is by the door. Well, that's funny. Nothing's happened. Can't you... Turn the lights on? No way. Well, that happens often in the country. Get a big storm and the electricity just shuts off. I'll look out the front library windows and see if there are lights in the other houses down the road. Xavier, come here. There's someone out there. Look, pressed against the big oak, a man with a cape. And next to him, a tall kind of man. They're both huddling against the trunk of the tree, trying to keep out of the rain. Catherine. The tall one. It's tuning around from the tree. It's looking right this way. Can it see us? Oh, what a hideous face. Like death. The eyes, 
Do you see those eyes? Now it's beckoning to the man in the cape. I see him. Is that Joshua Tree? In spirit. For I'm sure now where his body is. Where? In that tree. That's why Uncle George was so haunted. Oh, it's all clear to me now. That time, I followed Joshua Tree to the mausoleum. They were trying to get at the corpse of Uncle George. It was the familiar who knocked me down. Am I imagining it? But the both of them have come much closer to our picture window. Hello? Father Daly, is that you? Yes. This is Xavier. You've got to come over to my uncle's house. You've simply got to. My boy, you sound quite upset. Father, I implore you. Come now. Catherine and I are here alone. Only you can save us. Give me that phone. Father Daly, this is Catherine Zenith. Uh, there are two creatures outside the library window right now. They're not real people, Father. I have a very strong feeling they are not human. Two? Did, did you say two? At this moment, they are pressing their faces against the glass of the library window. The hands are clawing at the glass as if they wanted to break through it. Is one of them wearing a cape? Yes, yes, it is. Father, come quickly. Help us. Help us. They're, they're raising their hands now and pounding at the glass. Ah! They're coming! We ran out the back door into the raging, storming night, lashed by rain, not knowing which way to escape. The only path through the garden led right to the mausoleum, and before we could stop ourselves, we were practically on top of it. It's there. It's standing at the door of the vault. Grab my hand, Catherine. Hold on. We'll run for the brook. Where are we going? Into the water. Come on. It's not deep, Catherine. We can walk it. Stay in the middle of the brook with me. You see, these evil spirits cannot follow humans into water. If we just keep moving, it'll give up. I, I'm, I'm sure of it. Oh, I hope you're right. It's got to give up before I do. I was right. The thing gave up, finally. And by the time we'd climbed to shore, it had gone. There we stood, the rain beating down on us from above, and our legs and clothes soaked from the brook. Somehow, we found the main road to town and ran towards it. Oh, there's a car coming. I see headlights. Let's stand at the wayside of the road. After staying alive this long, I don't want to be hit by a car. Xavier, Catherine, what are you doing out here? Oh, Father Daly. Oh, don't answer me. Just get in. We've got to get back to the house. All right, all right, all right. Close that door and let's go. Now, tell me, you two, what are you doing standing in the road wet from head to toe? We ran from the house to get away from them. They actually broke through a plate glass window. That's most peculiar. Peculiar? It was horrifying. Why do you say that, Father? Because the spirit of Joshua Tree and, and his familiar are not after either of you. Well, they certainly gave a good imitation. Uh, you don't seem to understand. These creatures, the dead... And the spirit they've called up, their satanic twin, in fact. They're not after living persons. They're on the constant lookout for the newly dead. Wait till you see the broken library window, and then tell me if there aren't exceptions. <sighs> Where are they now? It's time I wrestled with the devil. What will you do? I shall quiet the demons with my crucifix. There's only one way to drive out Satan. And the church has been doing it for centuries. Father, look. The vault door's open. Someone's coming out. Not someone, but some things. They're carrying out your uncle's coffin. Stop! I charge you, arch fiends of Hades. Thou hast entertained familiarity with Satan, the grand enemy of God. I charge you! Put down that body and be gone! Father Daly advanced upon the two creatures holding his crucifix in front of him. The familiar and the spirit of the murdered Joshua Tree halted, released the coffin and ran. Father Daly and I carried Uncle George back inside the vault and closed the doors. It came to me in a flash. The big oak tree. It was there we would find the source of the evil. You were right, Savior. I can see their shadows. I'll hold them back with my crucifix. Somewhere inside this oak are the remains of the man my uncle killed. When we find them, I suspect they'll be wrapped in that long cape he wore. 
There's a sizable hole on the far side. When I first came here last April, my uncle was up there cementing up some holes. Since he knew Joshua Tree's body had been taken from the mausoleum by the familiar, your uncle might have suspected it was in this tree. I don't look forward to finding a pile of decomposed bones. What do we do with them, Father? Burn them. I'm glad Catherine's in the house. I don't know how she would react to a funeral pyre. We have no choice. Look, Father. The familiar. It's still there. Its minutes on earth are numbered. Once we have destroyed the body of Joshua Tree, what held it here no longer exists, and the familiar must return to the black beyond. And Uncle George must have known that his body could be invaded after death. And he would have had to walk the earth forever with this familiar. When I find the remains, I shall light the fire to them and hold high the cross. But what about Uncle George? I shall go back into the mausoleum and bless the coffin. Requiescat in pace. <laughs> I'll be back shortly with a final thought. The flames consumed the phantoms from the grave and the good father returned to the tomb and blessed the coffin. Will there be deliverance for the uncle, release from wandering the earth? Oh, yes. But in the dimension of the beyond, will the spirit of the murdered sorcerer allow his murderer to exist in peace? Or will Uncle George discover his eternal torture is just beginning? Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Fred Gwynn, Kurt Benson, and Betsy Beard. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, Producer Director, inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dream that each of us takes the limits of our field of vision for the limits of the world. And why not? For what is the world? Obviously, it must be the realm of the five senses. Plus, yes, plus now and then, here and there, perhaps a few extra ones. I said, Miss Towers, but I want you. Sir, I'm shocked. You should be overjoyed. Here you are, a mousy little school teacher. If I'm a mousy little school teacher, why do you want to marry me? Who said anything about marriage? You'll live with me, travel with me, enjoy the world. And what happens to me afterward? Ah, uh, Miss Towers, you're one of those people who've been brought up to worry about tomorrow. What if tomorrow never comes? <laughs> mystery drama, The Fall of Gentryville, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Michael Tolan. I'll be back shortly with Act One. They say a virtuous woman is an insult to the devil. To Satan, of course, purity and moral rectitude are like red flags to a bull. Decency and chastity to old Nick are abominations to be destroyed. And so, through the centuries, Mephistopheles has spent his time roaming the earth to perform his mission, which is to seduce the innocent, degrade the righteous, and corrupt the saintly. They also say, unfortunately, that he isn't as busy these days as formerly, since so many people seem to be doing fewer and fewer things that would offend him. Well, before we can form a conclusion, it is necessary for our story to have a beginning. But in order to begin this particular story, we must start with the ending. 
Just stay with us. We'll sort it all out before we are finished. Hey, Pete. Hey. Now, don't pretend you don't hear me. Get in here and shut the door. Well, he can't hear himself think. Yeah? What would you be thinking about anyhow, Gomez? Just close that door, huh? Now, where were you going? Oh, no place in particular. You weren't by any chance going to sneak down to Dusex for a couple of quick ones, were you? You know me, Gomez. I'm on the wagon. And I'm willing to bet that wagon's already off the track. I'm entitled to a lunch hour. You can eat on the plane. What plane? You're headed for a town called, uh... I got it written down here someplace. Ah, yeah, yeah. Gentryville. That is, uh, if you can find it. Why won't I be able to find it? Because it's missing. How can a town be missing? As of right now, people can no longer find Gentryville. Where's it supposed to be? In the mountains, 30 miles north of Janesburg and Interstate 989. So why can't people find this place? This, uh, Gentryville? You haven't been paying attention. Gentryville isn't there anymore. What is there? I guess whatever was there before Gentryville existed. Trees, rocks, bushes, hills, nature. You're telling me this town just disappeared? Finally, it's beginning to sink in. Listen, Pete, all the wire services, the networks, feature writers from all over the country are headed there. And what are they going to write about? How do I know what they're going to write about? I don't care what they write about, but I do know what you're going to write. You do? Whatever it is, it's going to be different, unusual, provocative, off the beaten track, sure to win the Pulitzer Prize. Hey, now, Gomez. It had better. It's the only way I can justify keeping you on staff. Now, wait a minute. This is your golden opportunity, Pete, baby. To do what? To prove you're not a has-been. You'll show them you're not all washed up and all dried out. You just go there and find that town. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the media, I, uh, I'm here to tell you everything we know. Which isn't much. Uh, yeah, which isn't much. Uh, anyhow, this is uh, the site of the village of Gentryville. It was a hamlet of some 600 people, and it stood right here. Right where? Here. Just where all of us are standing now. Come on, Sheriff. What are you trying to run here? There's absolutely no sign of any kind of building. Well, I appreciate your, uh, what shall I call it, your, your attitude. It is hard to believe. But right here where I'm standing was Jepson's General Store. And 50 feet to the left was Crowder's Barber Shop. And just past that was the Gentryville Bank, which also contained the post office. The church was right down that way. And there was a row of houses along the road. What road? Well, there was a road leading further up the mountain. Uh, just as it made the turn, you could see Mason's service station. Uh, then there was the grammar school. Uh, Sheriff, that clump of trees is standing exactly where you said the general store was. Uh, that's right, ma'am. But those are full-grown maples. Uh, elm trees, ma'am. Well, whatever they are, they have to be, what, 30, 40, 50 years old? Oh, some of them appear to be a couple of hundred but you're saying that only yesterday there was a town where these trees are standing. Uh, folks, we're trying to cooperate with the media as best we can. All we can say is the village of Gentryville has disappeared as if the earth has just swallowed her up. And the people? And the people, too. Every last living soul. But how could I... Uh, folks, <laughs> there's no point asking me any questions. All I can tell you is what happened. And now, from here on... You know as much as I do. Is it all right if we look around? I sure wish you would. Uh, maybe you all might come up with something. Hello, Pete. Hello, Kate. Who are you working for? Gomez took me on. Gomez? <laughs> I bet he isn't paying you a fraction of what you're worth. He's the only one who's willing to pay me anything at all. You all right, Pete? I'm all right today. That's the best I can hope for. What do you make of this thing? It could be a hoax. What kind of a hoax? This whole region is having a bad summer. Hotels are half empty. Mm, so it could be a publicity dodge. But it isn't. This is, was a place called Gentryville. It's on the state roster. It stood right here. How could the town and everybody in it just vanish? And without a trace, as if it had never existed. I've got a camera crew up here. They're shooting, but I don't know how to handle the pictures. Use the mystery angle. Mystery? What strange trick of fate? What mysterious force of nature? Hmm. That's good for the 11 o'clock news tonight. Where do I go from there? 
This is the kind of story you have to wait for. Oh, Sheriff. Hey, yes, sir. Uh, you were telling us there was a row of houses. Yeah, that's right. There was. There, street down this way. Oh, there was 15, 20 houses, I'm trying to recall. And that's where uh, everyone lived? Oh, uh, no. Uh, there were some farms going further out away from town. And they're gone too? Yes, sir. Every last one of them. Uh, we had the National Guard and the U.S. government. Nobody knows what to say. I'd advise you folks of the media to start heading back for Janesburg in a little bit. Why? For your own good. It gets dark up here fast. And these roads can be mighty treacherous, even in the daylight. Hi, Pete. Well, I thought you were on the wagon. Ginger ale. How long are you staying here? Oh, my producer says give it another day. What are you reading? I have here a copy of the Gentryville Telephone Directory. It is, as you can see, a rather slim volume. Mm, more like a pamphlet. You can almost memorize all the names. Bacons, Crowders, Jepsons, Masons, Quentins, Stallworths. Less than 50, all told. The Earth simply swallowed them up. How? How is unimportant. The Earth just did it. The question we should ask is, why? Why? Yes, Why? What did they do? You mean the Earth swallowed them up because of something they may have done? Why not? Is there another explanation? Sure. What is it? As a matter of fact, I'm writing it up now. You uh, want to tell me about it? Well, the Army engineers are in town, plus some people from the Department of the Interior. Also engineer types. These learned folk will come up with a variation on the Earth falls hypothesis. You think so? What else can they do? Various and sundry shifts in the subsurface. Beneath the crust of the earth is molten lava, gas, and whatnot. This stuff is always forcing itself up here, there, everywhere, causing sudden chasms and things. That's what happened to Tetraville. Do you know that's how it'll all come out? You sound as if you don't believe it. Oh, I believe it. I mean, what else can you believe? What else? Well, what else is there? There was some sort of uh, subterranean regurgitation in the area of Gentryville. And the whole place fell into a hole, which was covered up immediately by the surrounding terrain. There. You've got it. Leaving absolutely no trace at all. And you believe it. You don't? It's just... I'd like to know what these people did. And what does that mean? We read, we've been told, that cities have been wiped out because of... Uh, of evil. Oh, well, this becomes another kind of discussion. Why? Okay. How do we handle it? The town of Gentryville and every single living inhabitant disappeared from the face of the earth because... Yeah, because? Because of... Take a deep breath for this. Sin. Sin? It's happened before. And that's to become the lead paragraph in your story? It could be. Oh, Pete. Please. What is it? This is your chance to come back. At least you, you've got a job. And I'm trying to do it. Hey, maybe we could even work things so we could... Maybe we could, you know, start again. <laughs> okay, part of the problem was you thought you had to edit all my stories. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, I was wrong. Maybe I was jealous. I know you're the better writer. But you always had the better jobs. Oh, that has nothing to do with talent. What are we arguing about? Well, now, you shouldn't do something silly. If I say that Gentryville might have vanished from the face of the earth because it was guilty of sin, that's being silly? Well, I... Kate, I refer you to the great book that must be the cornerstone of all our lives. The Bible. Well... Well, what? These things are not supposed to happen anymore? Just be careful how you handle it. Gomez has a very short fuse. I can't write scared. I can't pick and choose my thoughts to make sure I select the ones that'll protect my job. You actually believe the town of Gentryville was, was punished? I'm looking for facts. Such as? Oh, here's a man who can help us. Uh, hello, Sheriff. Hey, evening, folks. Everybody treating you right in town? First rate. Yeah, that's good. And Jamesburg's never had nearly so much play from the media. We want to make a nice impression. Oh, I'm sure you have. We got the best swimming, fishing, sailing in the entire state. Sheriff, could uh, could you answer a question? It'd be my privilege. 
The people who lived in Gentryville. Yeah. What about them? What kind of men and women were they? Oh, nicest folks you'd ever want to meet. This is off the record, Sheriff. You don't have to be afraid to tell me the truth. Well, the truth is they were. <laughs> well, how can I put this? And I'm, I'm not saying it because, uh, well, you should speak well of the dead, but they were just too good to be true. In what way? Well, they were just so, so honest and upright, trustworthy. It, there's never been even a breathing of any kind of scandal whatsoever. Then you would classify it as a, as a moral sort of town. I would say without fear, doubt, or hesitation, Gentryville was the most moral, law-abiding, righteous, sin-free town in all these United States. All right, Pete. Now, what do you say? to experiment with a theory that Gentryville may have been punished for its transgressions, but it now develops that these were few and far between, just about non-existent. So what are we left with? We still must come up with an explanation for the disappearance of Gentryville. Well, we can try again in Act Two. <laughs> and the night shall be filled with music and the cares that infest the day shall fold their tents like the Arabs and silently steal away. The reason we quote Mr. Longfellow here is because those Arabs who still lead the Bedouin life leave no trace in the desert sand when they decide to move their temporary villages. They disappear completely. But how could that happen to a town in these United States? A permanent place made of wood and stone, built to last forever. Hello, Pete. Oh, phone in your story? Thanks to you, I had one. Thanks to me. Hmm, I used your mystery hooker. What strange trick of fate, what mysterious force of nature, and so on. <laughs> Do you mind? It's okay. What have you written? Nothing, Kate. At all? I got my trusty little tape recorder, and I haven't put a single word on it. Oh, I see you're still looking at that Gentryville telephone book. Yeah. Why? There's a name here. Towers, Miss Jenny Towers. So? It's the only miss in the book. And? She fascinates me, this Miss Jenny Towers. Why? Who was she? What was she? A young girl, an old maid? Well, you could ask the sheriff. I did. She was both. Well, how could she be both? She was a young girl who also happened to be an old maid. Up around here, if a girl isn't married by the time she's 19, she's written off as a spinster. Hmm. Doesn't look like ginger ale. It isn't. Oh. Now, don't worry. I'm not starting anything. This is just to fortify myself against the night air. Not that cold outside. It's supposed to be close to freezing up in the mountains. The mountains? I tell you, where are you going? Me and my trusty tape recorder are driving up to Gentryville. Or up to where it used to be. Now? Why not wait till day? I've been there during the day. Well, what will you be able to see in the dark? What were you able to see in the light? Pete, you up there. Up there is where my story is. That being the case, what am I doing down here? Pete, no, Pete, don't go. I'll see you around, Kate. And so, of the little hamlet of Gentryville, there remains not a stick, not a brick, not a single sign of life. And where have they gone? The Bacons, the Crowders, the Jepsons, the Masons. And where is she gone? Miss Jenny Towers, who lived all alone in a house on Gentryville Lane. Where is she? And who was she? Would you know what happened, Miss Jenny Towers? Yes. Would you know why it happened, Miss Jenny Towers? Yes. Will you tell me? Will you promise to believe me? Of course, I... Hey, wait. Who... Who are you? Jenny. Jenny Towers. Jenny Towers? You came up here to see me, didn't you? Jenny Towers? Yes. You... You're real. Of course. But what are you doing here? I live here. That here doesn't exist any longer. I know. Well, what are you doing here in the forest all alone at night? 
I was waiting for you. For me? You don't even know me. I wanted to make sure someone would know the story. What story? What happened to us here in Gentryville? I saw all of you. Reporters, writers, correspondents. Here today. Of them all. I think only you would know how to tell it. Uh, look, you don't want to stand out there. Come into the car and sit down. No. You better come with me. Where? To where my house used to be. Jenny. Uh, Miss Towers. Jenny is all right. Is it wise to go wandering around here at night? We're not wandering around. I know where I am. Yes, but I... Don't you want to come with me? All right. I I find it hard to believe that all this is actually happening. Why? Oh, be careful. The ground is rough. Now, you see, just on this ride, this is where my house used to be. And this is where he came. See? Yes. The one who began and ended it all. Who, who are you talking about? Mr. Mallow. Oh, Mr. Mallow. He was young. No more than 30. And handsome. Rich. Oh, you could see he was rich. Mr. Mallow. What was his first name? I don't know. It didn't matter. It's just Mr. Mallow now. I was sitting on my porch. It was a Sunday afternoon. And I could see him coming up the road. The road that used to be here. He was just for walking in the country. Comfortable boots, corduroy jacket. But you could tell they were expensive clothes. I was listening to a concert on the radio. Hello. Hello. Mind if I listen? Won't you come up and sit down? You're very kind. Do you like Mozart? Oh, Mozart. I know him very well. <laughs> That's an odd way of putting it. Really? What you mean is, you know his work very well. But it sounded as if you said you knew Mozart very well. And that would be impossible. It would. Of course. He died almost 200 years ago. Yes. Oh, I see where you might think that's impossible. And you don't? We live in a world where anything can happen. Oh. Are you staying at one of the hotels down in the valley, Mr... Uh, Mallow. <sighs> Mr. Mallow? My name is Jenny Towers. I know. You know? Oh. I know everything about you. You do? Oh, yes. You were born and raised in Gentryville. Your parents died and left you this house. You were engaged to be married, but he was killed in Vietnam. Now, where did you find all... And so you just stayed on here, teaching school. Why would you even want to find out these things about me? Why? Because I want you. I... beg your pardon? I believe you heard me. I heard... I'm not sure I understand. My dear Jenny, what is there not to understand? But what are you talking about? You know very well what I'm talking about. I want you. Sir, I don't wish to continue this conversation. Why not? Because I... Because <laughs> you should be overjoyed that someone like me has opened such a conversation. Here you are, a mousy little old maid country school teacher. If I am a mousy little old maid country school teacher, why do you want me? Because you appeal to me. That's why I'll make you rich. But I don't want to marry you. Who said anything about marriage? You'll travel the high spots of the world, London, Paris, Rome. You'll live in luxury. The greatest designers, couturier, shall create your fabulous wardrobe. Now say no. No. No? Why? What happened to me afterward? Oh, I see. It is not moral scruple, but practical consideration. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Although, I admit that's part of it, too. 
Oh, I, I simply couldn't do what you ask. It goes against everything I believe in. You know what that sounds like. Yes. Stiff. Stuffy. Self-righteous, perhaps. And so completely out of tune with the times. I don't wish to seem in hospitable, but I would like to say goodbye to you, Mr. Mallow. Oh, never say goodbye, Miss Towers. But always, au revoir. That man's name was Mr. Mallow? Yes. And you're saying that he came from out of nowhere to... to proposition you? Why? Why? Well, I... I'm not really bad-looking, am I? No, but... but why you? He said I appealed to him. And he offered you everything. And you turned him down. Why? Because what he was proposing is... was immoral. Is that the only reason? Pure morality? Yes. I'd like to think pure morality was the only reason, but I... I know now when you analyze morality, it can be made up of many things. Fear, vanity. But he did leave you. Yes. And was that the end of it? It was just the beginning. The next day, I stopped in at the bank. And Mr. Bacon, it was his bank. You know, he, he was just coming out of his office. And with him was Mr. Mallow. Morning, Jenny. Good morning, Mr. Bacon. Jenny, I'd like you to meet our newest depositor, Mr. Mallow. Uh, Miss Towers and I have already met. That a fact. I'm so glad to see you again, Miss Towers. Uh, may I invite you to have lunch with me? No, thank you. Well, another time, perhaps. Good day, Miss Towers. Mr. Bacon? Yes, yes. Good day, sir. Jenny, why didn't you want to have lunch with him? Why? He's sweet on you. You can see it. And the fellow's a millionaire. He is? Jenny, he just opened an account here. I mean, I'm not allowed to disclose the exact amount of what it is. But it is handsome. Mr. Bacon, why did he open an account with you? He didn't say. He implied. He said this town looks like a potential gold mine. What kind of gold mine? Yes, sir, Jenny. He said the potential here was unlimited. Absolutely unlimited. And he wanted to get in on the ground floor. The ground floor of what? The greatest development this part of the country has ever seen. Development? What does that mean? Exactly. Well, growth. After all, what have they got in the valley that we don't have up here and better? We can become one of the biggest resorts in the world. Is that what we really want? Why shouldn't we want it? What happens to our sleepy little village? We wake up, that's what happens. But I thought everyone around here was happy with the way things are. How can you be happy just stagnating? Mr. Bacon, Take your own property now. Forget the house, but you got four acres. And we were talking, Mr. Mallow and I. Do you have any idea how much that land will be worth? Mr. Bacon, please, don't listen to this, Mr. Mallow. Don't pay any attention to it. Why not, Jenny? I'm scared. Terribly scared. Of what? Of, of what's going to happen to all of us. Now, Jenny, what could happen? We've seen what could happen. Indeed, what did happen? The town simply disappeared with everyone in it. But is all this related to the mysterious Mr. Mallow? To answer that question, we require a third act, which I shall bring to you presently. The history of the world is, in a very real sense, the story of disappearances. Nations, kingdoms, empires rise, have their day, and then simply vanish. But these things, as a rule, don't happen overnight or even suddenly. It takes time, years, decades, even centuries. We, however, have accelerated the process. We are talking about a town named Gentryville that was there one evening and gone the following morning. What you're telling me is that this Mr. Mallow decided to stay in town. Yes. Soon everybody knew him. Everybody liked him. Everybody but you. I was a minority of one. But every day, 
Mr. Mallow would stop at my house. Oh, it's you. Of course. May I come in? For what purpose? For what purpose? Oh, my goodness. Well, I know how that sounds. Yeah, then why did you say it? Because it needed saying. There is no future for you and me. Yeah, so who if you said don't... anything about a future? I'm only talking about a present. An exciting, exhilarating, fantastic present. But I am not interested. Hmm. Well... Tomorrow's another day. Goodbye, Mr. Mallow. You'll never say goodbye. Just I'll feed her thing. Morning, Jenny. I should like to cash a check, Mr. Bacon. Of course. Glad you dropped in. School starts next week, you know. I thought I'd go over to Jamesburg and see about my fall wardrobe. Yeah, too. From this time, you won't have to do that anymore. We'll have the smartest shops right here in Gentryville to service the guests at the new hotel. Oh, Mr. Bates. You don't believe it. Well, I... This thing is taking shape right before our very eyes. We've been having meetings with Mr. Mallow almost every day. Meetings? I'm to handle all the financing. You won't believe it if I tell you how much money Mr. Mallow put into the bank for that purpose. Joe Crowder and Marv Jepson are going to build this fantastic shopping arcade. Conrad Mason's going to construct the hotel. I tell you, everyone stands to make a fortune selling his land. But why? Why is this Mr. Mallow doing it? Because it's a sound investment. That's why. But why here? Why this place? Jenny, you reach a certain point where you say, take the money and run. I never heard you talk like that, Mr. Bacon. When opportunity knocks, don't leave her standing cold and lonely on the doorstep because sure as you're born, she's going to go knock somewhere else. I still don't know why. I am going to make you an offer for your property, Jenny. A tremendous offer. I still don't understand that, Mr. Marlowe. Jenny. Jenny, I've known you since, since you were a baby. What is it, Mr. Bacon? You're a wonderful girl. In every way. Yes? But, you know, it, it's it been some years now since Teddy was killed in the war. What are you trying to say? And it isn't as if the two of you were married. As I recall, you weren't really even engaged. You just had a sort of an understanding. What does all this have to do You've with... You've got what... to start showing an interest in fellas again. Or else you really wind up an old maid. Now, what's wrong with Mr. Mallow? Can't you just talk to him, keep him happy? I have already talked to him. Oh? And we have reached an understanding. You have? Yes. He wants to have an affair with me. And we both understand that I won't agree to it. Jenny, I, I, I can't believe that. That's what I would have to do to keep him happy. Would you want me to do it? Jenny... What a thing to say. I had this terrible feeling. I knew something was going to happen. The whole town was going crazy. Crazy? How? There was... Well, it, it was a change in character. It had always been kind of a happy, lazy place. Nobody worked too hard, and if the trout were biting, certainly during deer season, nobody worked at all. And now? Now? Oh, now it was, I don't know, frantic. Frantic and frightening. In what way? Mr. Bacon called me and asked me to come over to the bank. Sit down, Jenny. Oh, what am I going to do about this phone? It won't stop ringing. Hello. Yes, Mary. You go right ahead. Money's available. No question, no problem. Start hiring labor. It's a madhouse. Madhouse. But that's progress. What did you want to see me about, Mr. Bacon? What do I want to see you about? Oh, i got a million things here. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Mallow worked things out so that we could all have a better deal. I am not interested in anything, Mr. We're Mallow. We're not going to sell him the land. We'll just sell him the rights to use it. I said I am not interested. Can you imagine we get all that money and we still... Mr. Oh, Bacon, uh, was there anything else you wanted to talk to me about? Anything else? What else could be possibly so important? In that case, I'll be going. Jenny, please, 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 listen, listen. There's something we do have to talk about. Yes? We, uh... We had a meeting last night. Who did? Most of us. I guess you could say all of us. 
Except you. A meeting? What was it about? Mr. Mallow was there. Things are going fine, first rate. Except Mr. Mallow seems very sad. He does. He felt that everybody in this town was being very nice to him. Except you. Except me. Oh, yes, that's true. You admit it. But you have to understand. I am the only one in this town who's supposed to be nice to him in a special way. Jenny, Jenny, he's really very nice. What are you saying, Mr. Wilson? Now, Jenny, don't get excited. <laughs> don't jump to conclusions. It's just... It's just what? It's just that there's so much involved here. Well, good morning, everyone. Mr. Mallow, won't you have a seat? Uh, thank you. Good morning, Jenny. How are things going this morning? How are they going? Well, we, um... We have encountered a stumbling block. What do you mean? Anything serious? Uh, quite serious. Indeed, serious enough to cast a fatal shadow over the entire enterprise. But I thought things were just coming along. Oh, they were. But we seem to have struck a sour note. I'm sure you gentlemen will excuse me. Oh, don't go, Jenny Towers. The discussion I'm about to have with Mr. Bacon concerns you. But I am not concerned with anything where you're involved, Mr. Mallow. Goodbye, gentlemen. Uh, never say goodbye. Just say, ciao. Good evening. What do you want? Oh, now, is that a way to greet your lover? I think it's time we put a stop to this. How can we stop what hasn't even begun? Mr. Mallow, I am going to call the sheriff. The nearest sheriff is in Janesburg, and that's 30 miles away. He could never get here in time to help you. Help me? Yes, to help you. Don't touch me! Don't be silly, Jim. Let go of me! Back here. Where do you think you're going? Help me! Help me! Somebody help me! But he's going to help you. They're all on my side. I have friends. They'll help me. Mr. Bacon. Mr. Bacon. Help me. Help me. Mr. Bacon. He's not going to help. Somebody. Somebody help you. Mr. Sowers. Mr. Sowers. He's on my side. Mr. Sowers. Every door is closed against you. These are my friends. They love me. Oh, they love me more. Who are you? I said, give her to me. And they said, take her. No, they, they never said that. Oh, they now. Listen. Call for help. Call for help again. Help me. Now, listen to the answer. Listen to the silence. The silence. That's their answer. I know who you are. I know. You're the devil. The devil? Listen. Listen, everybody. He's the devil. <laughs> Don't tell yourself to the devil. What an idea. <laughs> if you give me to him, you're also giving yourself. <laughs> Isn't that the most comical thing? Uh -huh. Isn't it a joke? No. Help me! Save me! Save yourself! Please! Let Sounds like the sheriff. Uh, here, up there. Uh, sheriff. Help me. No, it's, it's all right, Jenny. It's all right. Please. Oh, please. Uh, I see your phone. Oh, please. No, 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 Miss Howell. Oh, please. 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 O
You just want me to see me. Tom? Jack? You bring me down there to the ambulance. No, no. Help me. I'll, I'll help you. Stay with me. All right, all right. Wherever you go, I'll, I'll stay with you. Uh, we better get her back to the hospital. Oh. The doctor gave her a shot. She's she's sleeping now. Ah, poor girl. But what happened? Yeah, a couple of nights ago, she came staggering into my office. Down here in town. She looked to sight. Clothes were ripped and torn. Bruised all over. And, and she kept muttering some kind of story uh, about the devil. The devil? Yeah. And how uh, everyone in Gentryville has sold their souls to him. Now... That has to be nonsense. Does it? Well, of course. Gentryville? Why, everybody knows those were the, the most honest, upright folks you'd ever hope to find. Still, the town just disappeared from the face of the earth. As if the devil had decided to claim his own. Uh, son, I'm just a plain hometown sheriff. But what happened was two separate and distinct incidents. One, she lived alone. She must have been attacked by some prowler, you see? Yes. That can be a terrible experience for a woman. She may have lost her mind over it. And therefore, she fabricated this whole yarn. That's what the doctor said. Anyhow, earlier this evening, we got a report she'd run away from the hospital. We figured she'd go back to where her home used to be. And we were right. And how do you account for the disappearance of the town? Well, now, that's a separate incident entirely. The geologists are coming up with an explanation. You know something, Sheriff? I believe her. Uh, hello, Gomez. Did, did you get the story? Ah, it's beautiful. Beautiful. You gonna run it? If I do, they'll run you and me right into the nut house. Uh, look, listen, Gomez. You listen, Pete. You had your fun, you wrote your fantasy, and you can send it to a movie producer. Now, send me the story of what really happened. But Gomez, G Gomez! That's what did happen. You know what they say, you can't believe everything you read in the papers. And that's not necessarily because something may be an outright lie. It's just that everyone has a different sort of perception. And while one explanation may seem entirely logical, another could be just as true. I shall return shortly. <laughs> What did happen to the town of Gentryville? A natural disaster, which is reasonable, or a sellout to the devil, which seems far-fetched. But that's only at first glance. If entire nations can disappear, why not small villages? And all the great nations in history that held sway briefly and disappeared from the scene, wasn't it because they became corrupt and decadent? And in a very real sense, isn't that the same as selling one's soul to the devil? Our cast included Michael Tolan, E.B. Juster, Jackson Beck, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. The poet tells us, at the door of life, at the gate of birth, there are worse things waiting for man than death. And well may we ask the poet, what are those worse things? 
After all, what could be more tragic than to die? And the answer, perhaps, it is more tragic not to die when your time has come and your life is over. And what are you trying to sell the suckers now? Rosie, this one can't miss. You know what I got here? What? Eternal life. So? What do you mean, so? I feed you the blockbuster and all you can give me is so? Oh, I'm not sure how many people would want to live forever. What are you saying? Wouldn't you? Well, I'd have to think about it. Our mystery drama, All the Time in the World, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ralph Bell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In everything we are told, there is a season. There's a time to be born and a time to die. And most of us follow that timetable. We arrive and we depart pretty much on schedule. Now and again, accidents or ailments or upheavals beyond our control may curtail our visit. But most of us have a pretty good shot at the allotted three score in ten. And many of us do even better. However, sooner or later, the hour must strike for everyone. Well, doesn't it? They are moving at a brisk pace through the lovely countryside. And it's a beautiful morning. All right, Harry. Where are we headed for? Rosie, baby, we are headed for one million bucks. <sighs> sure. Uh, but this time, this time it's money in the bank. When can I write a check against it? Hey, Rosie, this can't miss. Hold it. That sign, it says Morristown. Right. That's exactly what it says. Morristown. Is that where we're going? We'll be there in exactly 15 minutes. What for? Because that's where the money is. And that's where the state penitentiary is. <laughs> Who would know that better than me? We're going to the state pen. Yes, baby. Why? Because he's being sprung today. Who is? A million dollars. We're going to pick him up. If you think you're going to bring home some bum for me to take care of... He's not a bum, Rosie. He's a pal of mine. He's guilty until he can prove himself innocent. Which, if he's a pal of yours, he will not be able to do. No, Harry... I'm putting my foot down. You turn this car right around now. But, baby, he's got no place else to go. If he's got a million dollars, he can find a place without any trouble. Rosie, I didn't say he's got a million dollars. What I said was, he is a million dollars. I don't understand you, Harry. <laughs> of course not. And I don't understand you either, Rosie. That's what makes our relationship so, uh... Yeah, what word am I looking for? Doomed. There it is, just up ahead. Yeah, I see it. And there he is, standing by the gate. Who? My old buddy, Lucas. That's his name, Lucas? Lucas what? Well, I don't know if it's his first name or it's his last name. Yeah? Well, it would seem to me you don't know him very well. well I know him well enough to make a million bucks. Hey, Lucas! Hey, up in the back. <laughs> Atta boy. And we're off. But waiting long, Lucas? No. Lucas, say hello to Rosie. Hello, Rosie. My pleasure, I'm sure. So, here you are, Lucas. With the new suit. <laughs> Some suit. And a cardboard valise. And a $20 bill, right? Yeah. So, how does it feel to be out, Lucas? All right. Hey, Lucas, I'll bet this is the first time you ever rode in an automobile, eh? Yeah, I guess so. How do you like it? It's fun. What have you two guys got going here? A vaudeville routine? Hey, come to think of it, when did Lucas ever have a chance to ride in an automobile, eh? Well, how long has Lucas been in the slammer? A long, long time, baby. Yeah? What did he do? Why were you jugged, Lucas? Uh, this time? I, uh... I don't remember. What do you mean you don't remember? Rosie, baby, not everybody has such a good memory. What does he mean this time? I happen to know his record. This time, he was up for murder. 
Murder? Yeah. It was during an armed robbery. Uh, it's coming back to me. I... Yeah, I remember now. Stop the car this minute. What for? You are not going to bring home any strong arms. Rosie, we have to give Lucas a break. No. Now, just look at him. Isn't he the nicest, mildest guy you ever want to see? He's out. The man paid his debt. He said this time. You spell that O-U-T. He did his 99 years. And furthermore, if you ever think... He... He what? He was inside for 99 years. Harry, what kind of double talk are you giving me? This is a man who was sentenced to do 99 years. So he did his 99... And here he is. Nobody does 99. Here's a man, he looks, what, 35, 40, maybe tops. How can he have served 99? He's got the documents to prove it. What documents? For the next five years, Lucas has got to report once a month to his parole officer. He's got this card. Uh, uh, show the card, Lucas. Harry. Just look at the card, huh? What does it say? Uh, the state of New... Ha, 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 you see? It's an official document. Lucas, sentenced in the year 18... Oh, no, they have to be kidding. You're looking at the thing there in black and white, and you still won't believe it, To huh? serve a term of 99 years in the state penit... No. I still say it can't be. Lucas, how old are you? Oh, uh, I don't remember. I couldn't believe it myself at first. At least a... A hundred and forty years old. Oh, no. What do you mean, oh, no? People live that long, don't they? I never heard of it. Besides, he looks younger than you do. <laughs> well, so much the better. For what? For our chances of making a million bucks. Oh, yeah. How many times have we had this talk before? Ah, ha, 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 ha. But this time, this time there's a difference. Yeah? What is it? Lucas. <laughs> All right, Mr. Lucas, you may put your shirt on. Well, Doc, what's the verdict? Verdict? How old would you say Lucas is? How old? I'd say he has the heart, the lungs, the arteries, all the vital signs of a man in his 30s. His 30s, eh? Yeah. Say his late 30s. Uh-huh. Thank you, Doc. Would, uh, would you make a statement to that effect? I have subjected Mr. Lucas to a complete physical examination and find him to be in excellent condition. I would state that his health is above average for a man 40 years of age. This is the old ball game, Rosie. Yeah, well, all I know is this has cost us 75 bucks. And there has also been a substantial increase in the grocery bill since Lucas showed up. Rosie, you got to spend money to make money. Okay, we're spending it. Why don't we start making it? Tonight. What happens tonight? We go on TV. Who goes on TV? Me and Lucas. What for? Honey, how do you make money? It beats me. And if you want the truth, it also beats you. You advertise. That's right, Rosie. You gotta advertise. You know why? Oh, what am I getting into here? This little poem I picked up. The codfish lays a thousand eggs. The homely hen lays one. But the codfish never cackles to tell you what she's done. And so we scorn the codfish while the homely hen we prize. Which only goes to show you that it pays to advertise. Oh. And what are you going to advertise? And where are you going to get the money to do it? I'll answer the second question first. It's free. What's free? Tonight. You're going to see Lucas on the tube doing a guest shot. Who'd want Lucas for a guest shot? Bonnie Quackenbush, that's who. Oh, it figures. With all the other fruits and nuts. And what is Lucas going to advertise? Lucas is going to advertise that one commodity for which every single person in the world would give everything he owns. And what is that? Eternal life. Eternal life. Oh. What's with the O? Here I feed you the blockbuster and all you can give me is O? Eternal life. I'm not sure how many people would really want to live forever. What are you saying? There's enough suckers out there to add up to a million bucks. Hi, 
out there in Tooville. It's me again, Bonnie Quackenbush. And look at whom we have for you in the Quack Pack tonight. Oh, wow. Ain't he a handsome thing? But remember, girls, Bonnie saw him first. And his name is Lucas. I'll say hello to the pack, Lucas. Uh Uh-huh. Hello. Uh, Sexy, right? Uh, Well, here's what's been happening. When the studio pack came in, we asked each and every one to write down how old they thought Lucas is. And I got all the answers right here. And they say, 35, 36, 37. Oh, that's how they've been running, 35-ish. Now, all of you, take a good look at Luke and give us your guess. A little speculation music, please. Now, are you ready? Have you guessed? What did you come up with? Well, you're wrong. Tell the pack how old you are, Lucas. Go on, tell them. I uh, don't remember. Of course not. If I were as old as you, baby, I wouldn't want to remember either. But here is Lucas's best friend, Harry Barrows. Harry, yak at the pack. Ah, uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, I have here a statement. A signed statement. From a fully ordained doctor of medicine. Which says... Lucas has the body... The physical equipment. ...of a man in his late 30s. Go on, Harry. Give us the zinger. If you consult the records of the state penitentiary up at Morristown, you will learn that Lucas has just been discharged from prison. Oh, we certainly hope that Lucas has learned his lesson, don't we? Ah, uh, yes, Bonnie. Uh, he certainly did because he had a long time to think about it. So long... That he'd even forgotten what he'd actually done. And how long a time was it, Harry? Ninety-nine years. You are saying, then, that exactly ninety-nine years ago, Lucas here was flung into the Bastille. You could look it up. So, how old does that make Lucas? Your guess is as good as mine. Hey, Rosie. Oh, where have you two clowns been? Did you see the show? You know, it's three o'clock in the morning. We were hiding out. What for? You saw the show. You saw how everybody went crazy. Harry, what is it I all... told you. Suddenly the place was invaded by reporters in the paper, the radio, TV, the whole media. All right, it's not the pack. What for? We have to leave. Why? Sooner or later, they have to find out where I live. Well, isn't that what you wanted? No, no, no. We have to get away. Harry, did you do something wrong? All we did tonight was hook the fish. Now we have to be very careful how we reel them in. Oh, no. I've heard this one before. Rosie, honey, you have to have faith in me. I know what I'm doing. What are you doing? What are all these moves, this strategy? Honey, we have to go away so that you can mix up a batch of the elixir. The elixir? What elixir? The elixir of eternal life. What do I know about mixing up an elixir of eternal life? Rosie, for a girl as smart as you are, there's nothing to it. Nothing to it at all. The elixir of eternal life. Slowly but surely, the outlines of Harry's master plan seems to emerge from the mist. The elixir of eternal life. How would you like to be able to walk into the corner drugstore, point to the shelf and say, I'll have a bottle of that. The time may be nearer than you think. And then again, it may not. It depends on what happens shortly in Act Two. What can I tell you? Only what the record states. And what does the record have to say for itself? This. That a man named Lucas was sentenced to serve a term of 99 years for armed robbery and murder. Well, the 99 years have elapsed, and here is Lucas, still alive, looking no older than the day he went in. They had to set him free, and they did. And here we are. What is this elixir of life, Harry? It happens to be our million dollars. Uh Uh-huh. Look, Harry, 
I'm going on record right now. Now, please, Rosie, we got no time. We have I things to do. I have been through one scheme after another. I lose track of all the hustles, the flim-flams, the capers. But it doesn't matter. You know why? Rosie, I... All your hustles and capers. You know what they all got in common? They don't work. Rose. They do not work. Never in your life have you ever succeeded in making a dishonest dollar. Okay. So if you got no confidence in me, why don't you stick around? Because maybe it's your fate. After all, everybody does what he's meant to do. And what was I meant to do? Fail. Hey, look, we have to get out of here. Lay low. See? You go on TV to advertise, to attract attention. And then when you get it, you want to disappear. Now, why? Well, you start to figure out how the elixir of life eternal should taste while Lucas and I load up the car. So, what do you think? Hmm. Maybe it's too sweet. Oh. Now, I'll put in half as much sugar. You know what it needs? Maybe it should taste uh, more mysterious. Mysterious. Uh, so I'll put in some pepper. All right, but come on, we got to hurry. Why? Because you have to strike while the iron is hot. That's also a very good time to get burned. The elixir of eternal life or of life eternal? Which sounds better? Uh, taste it now. Mmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ah. It's almost there. Uh. I tell you, Lucas, she's one in a million. You see, to how many dames could you say mix up a batch of eternal life elixir and in no time at all, there it is. Hey, where do you think you're going? You keep working on the elixir, Rosie. I got a little missionary work to do. Lucas can keep you company. So, taste this one, Lucas. Oh, no, huh? No big hit either, huh? Well, let me see. Uh... Oh, I think I'll put in some honey, some garlic. What else have I got in here? Let's... How about some vinegar? Yeah, I'll just put in a little bit of everything. Why don't we just run this through the blender, froth it up a little bit, huh? Yeah, so. Well, so. Let me see how our little witch's brew is doing here. What do you say, Lucas? How about a little taste? What do you think, huh? Ugh. Pasca. I beg your pardon? I... You don't have to make such a horrible face. Pasca. Pasca, huh? What's that supposed to mean? Hey, wait a second. If it tastes so awful, how come you're drinking the rest of it? Some more. More? Did you see your face while you were pouring it down? Oh, it's good for you. Good for you? Yeah. I remember. The master would make us drink it whenever we were sick. Uh-oh. What is commencing to start here, Lucas? What's with the master bit? The taste. Oh, I remember the taste. Yeah, it brings everything back. Yesterday, everything was so... so dark. I couldn't see back into it. It was... So long ago, but now, the taste, it's like a knife. It cuts through. You know what I'm saying? No, Lucas, I don't. Pasca. It was brought into the house of a master by a Greek slave. He called it a, a posset. Sure, yeah. Uh, hey, Lucas, why don't you lie down and take a little nap, huh? Lucas... My name was Lucius. I never had another name. I was the illegitimate son of the master and a Lydian slave woman. I remember now. Lucius. And then, many years later, it was Ludwig. And then, Louis. And Lucas. Are you trying to tell me what I think you're trying to tell me? Oh, I've lived so long, so long. At times when I'm so tired and I can't remember, but the taste, it 
brought me back. I'm Lucius. Yeah, sure. I was born in Rome. Italy. No, no, Rome. It was all Rome. Uh Uh-huh. Um, uh, Lucius, when when was this? I don't know. What year? Year. I don't remember. Maybe I never knew. How could you not know? Well, people like me, we, we didn't know anything. We're just lucky to be alive. Oh, although I'm not so sure that was lucky either. Well, what did you do? Well, most of the time we were hungry. When we got sick, very sick, they'd take us to the master. And he'd give us a Posca to drink. So we could go back to work. What kind of work? On the farm. Oh, it was very hard work. And you don't know when it was? What was going on? No. No, every day was the same. Lucas... Going along with this. How come you're still alive? Oh. Oh, well, you see, I was a thief. Yeah? You had to steal to keep alive back then. Well, well, most people stole a little food from the kitchen, maybe fruit from the trees and so on, but the master knew about it. He, he, He wouldn't let on because he knew you had to. Me... I was different. Different? Yeah. I, I, I didn't steal just because I was hungry. No? I stole because... Because I'm a thief. Like I can't help myself. Come on, Lucas. You don't expect me to believe that. Well, it's true. It's in the blood. Like one man can play music, one man can paint pictures, and I... I have to steal. All right. But that still doesn't answer the question. How come you're alive after all this time? Because Apollo said so. Apollo? He was one of the gods. Oh, I'm afraid you're only getting yourself in deeper. No, there, there was a temple of Apollo on the master's estate. I see, and there was this gold mask of Apollo on the altar. So I thought I'd steal it. I'd be able to raise enough money to to go somewhere else, start a new life. You sound like a dear friend of mine. But I got caught. How did I know? I'd always get caught. It figures. The penalty for stealing from the temple of a god was usually death by torture. Please, Lucas, no horrible details. The master said he has offended the god. Let the god decide his punishment. So they loaded me down with chains. I could hardly move. They set me in front of the altar of Apollo. Yeah, it was midnight. Oh, and there was a terrible storm. I can hear the thunder. Listen. To what? The thunder. Terrible thunder. And the lightning. Oh, it was flashing all around me. Lucas, are you okay? And the voice. The voice of the god. Listen. You hear it? You hear it? The voice of Apollo. Lucius. Lucius, thief and slave. Don't you hear it? No. No, I don't hear nothing. It's a voice that seems to enter inside your head. It it flows through your whole entire body. Lucius, thief and slave. You have defiled my temple. Voice. Can't speak it. Inside me. Now just take it easy, Lucas. Lucius, villain and slave. Scoundrel and thief. Please. It's all right, Lucas. You expect the god Apollo to sentence you to a horrible death. But any death would be a release and a reward. I sentence you instead to a horrible life. The life of a thief. The life you have always lived. The only life you know. You shall live such a life forever. You shall be a thief under the rule of all the nations to come. You will live many lives in countries yet to be discovered. But all you shall know of them is the insides of the prisons. Forever. Lucas. Lucas, 
Is you okay? Here. Here, drink some of this. I remember. The taste made me remember. So, you have to be a couple of thousand years old, right? I'm, I'm old. I'm very old. What happened, Lucas? Didn't you ever catch on? Couldn't you see there's no percentage to it? In all these years, couldn't you decide to make something out of yourself? How? How long does a guy have to be a sucker? I was born poor, ignorant, a slave. I never had a chance to learn anything. All I knew how to do was steal. And you didn't know how to do that too good either. But it's my trade. I don't want to do anything else. Look, the last time I was in prison, it was for, for 99 years. Now, I'm free. I know I'll have to steal again. Now, Lucas. Yeah. You know, when Harry brought us here to this place, I noticed a store down the road. I know. Soon, very soon, I'm going to break in there. Lucas, and... you mustn't. I can't help it. With your luck, you have to get caught. It isn't luck. It's fate. Mm. Now, this is exactly the way it should taste. This is the elixir of life eternal. And what are you going to do with it? My rosy honey, we're going to sell it. Oh, we're going to sell it, huh? Everybody's seen Lucas on the TV. Everybody knows how old he is. I don't think so. But go ahead. So this is what Lucas drinks. You see, this is the elixir of life eternal. Okay? Harry, how do you expect me to make enough of that stuff in a kitchen? Now, let's see. You got a whole blender full of it, huh? That should be more than enough. More than enough for what? More than enough to make a million dollars. Our friend Harry certainly has that million dollars on his mind. That million dollars that always seems to elude him. The goal that shines so brightly up ahead, but remains ever out of reach. All right, is this to be the time? You can see he has quite a bit going for him. Within a few moments, we shall be involved in the third act and the revelation. Gentlemen rankers out on a spree, damned from here to eternity. So wrote Mr. Kipling. From here to eternity is a long, long, a limitless time. But it seems to be stretching out ahead for our friend Lucas. Our other friend Harry has the idea that he can make a good thing out of it. You mean just this picture full of this... Elixir of life eternal will be enough to make a million bucks. You heard me. How? Tell me, Rosie, how would you promote this? I would do it the common sense way. Which is? Harry, you went on the TV. You exposed Lucas to millions. Here's a man who is over 100 and he looks less than 40, right? Go ahead. Okay. So the rubes are looking at him, Popeye. Now, you should say, listen, suckers, here's the secret. This is Lucas's own secret formula. This is what Lucas drinks every day. This dandy little elixir of life eternal. Here it is. One buck. And a million saps will dig down. Which means I'd have to go into business. I'd have to buy a million bottles, hire labor, get involved with payroll taxes. Okay, you just talk me out of it. Let's forget the whole thing. Lucas is starting to get a funny look in his eyes. I haven't stolen anything and. In... 99 years. You just control yourself, huh? Oh, I'll try, yeah, but I don't know if I can. Here, drink some of this good old elixir, huh? Why should I try to sell one million bottles of one dollar apiece when I can sell one bottle for a million dollars? And who's going to give you one million dollars? I'll be back within the hour with a certified check. Uh-uh. I'm scared. Of what? I don't know. But it's not going to work. What do you mean it's not going to work? 
Rosie, why can't you have faith in me? I have faith in you, Harry. I have faith that you'll go to jail, as usual. You see the possibility, you see the potential, eternal life, how can I miss? You'll find a way, Harry. You always do. Well, Mr. Bowles, uh, what is this offer of a lifetime? Mr. Mammon, you've heard of Lucas? He was featured on the Bonnie Quackenbush program. The convict? Yes. Well, Mr. Mammon, he is more than just a convict. Come to the point. I met Mr. Lucas five years ago in the state penitentiary. Yes, you were serving a term for some hapless confidence scheme that went awry. Uh, may I ask uh, how you know about that? I know everything about you, Mr. Bowles. When a man expresses a desire to see me on business, I have him investigated minutely. I have a computer operation that can turn your whole life inside out. For instance, I am aware of the fact that when you were in the third grade, you were caught cheating on a spelling test. Uh, wrong. It was arithmetic. Now, you were saying, Mr. Bowles? Uh, my, um, my cellmate was Lucas. Cell 87, Block C, North Wing. Yeah, well, that's when I got to know him. And about his incredible age, we became very friendly. And after a while, he revealed a secret to me. His uh, secret? Yes. It consists of a beverage. Continue. He drinks it every day. And you wish to sell me this beverage? Yes. For one million dollars? How did you know? Because that is exactly what I should do if I were in your place. Well, uh, do you want to live forever? Or let us say, uh, indefinitely? Hmm. I would have to take that question under advisement. I, uh, have here a sample, Mr. Mammon. Which could prove what? I'll let you have a free taste. Now, sir, drink that down. And tell me, doesn't that convince you? The distinctive flavor of it that is truly the elixir of life. You're very clever, Mr. Barros. I am offering you more than you could buy anywhere else for your money. Eternal life. It's the best confidence operation I've ever encountered. I assure you it's not... It's foolproof, hmm? <laughs> Who could ever prove it's a swindle? This is not a swindle. Oh, it is. But how could the victim ever prove it? The victim? As long as he's alive, you're in the clear. He would have to die. Uh, sir, uh, I'm afraid you don't understand. The only thing wrong with it is... nobody would want to buy the product. Oh, yeah? What's wrong with the product? Eternal life. Who really wants it? Why, everybody. Do you? Absolutely. I don't. And I don't know anybody else who does. Oh, a lot of people would like to live forever. Oh, they think they do. Until ten minutes ago, I thought I did too. But then when I was confronted with it, I really began to think about it. No, thank you. Well, sir, I'm sure I can do business elsewhere. Are you? Nickels and dimes, maybe. But a million dollars. Oh, uh, by the way, that... Little elixir of yours tastes pretty good. Mind if I have another sip? Where's the million bucks? Uh, well, Rosie... Do you see? have it in one big bill or a lot of little ones? We're having uh, temporary difficulties. Yeah, and it looks like they might become permanent. Oh, come on, what are you saying? It's been on the news about Lucas. What about Lucas? They're saying he's a phony. Who is? Everybody. Your friend Bonnie Quackenbush should be on right now. Turn it on. Listen. How could it be a phony? I saw Lucas's records. Yeah, wow. Go figure. Turn on the set. Has the pack ever been taking flack? About what? About Lucas. Seems it's a hoax, folks. Yes, indeed. The show caused so much chatter that we decided to investigate the records at State Pen. Well, it seems that they goofed somehow. A man named Lucas was sent up 99 years ago, but he died. I don't know if they buried somebody else or what, but his records got confused. 
and the man you saw on this show last week wound up with them. Maybe it'll never get straightened out, but one thing for sure, nobody could be 140 years old and not look it. I guess you've heard enough. I don't understand it. Eternal life. I thought people would beat down the door to get it. It sounded foolproof to me. It was. Only thing wrong with it was you. Me? Yes, Harry, you. It had to fail because you're fated not to be successful as a con artist. It doesn't matter what the hustle is. What kind of talk is that, fated? It's your destiny. Destiny. So the story about Lucas just killed it, that's all. But I should have been home free before it broke. What do you mean, before it broke? Were you expecting it to break? Well, sure, weren't you? What do you mean, wasn't I? You knew it had to be some kind of swindle. You didn't actually believe Lucas could be 140 years or so old. How could a man that age look and act so young? He's not 140 years old. That is definite. Well, that's what I just told you. His real age would be closer to... Oh, about 2,200. Twenty. Hey, Rosie... Is this you talking? Those are the facts, Harry. He told me. He told you what? He was born a slave in ancient Rome. That's what Lucas told you? Yeah, he remembered. And he was a thief. And because he tried to steal something from an ancient god named Apollo, he was condemned to live forever. So? Why was that a bad deal? As a thief. As a two-bit coffee and cakes thief. Always in and out of jail. This is what he told you, huh? Yeah. And you believe him? Yes, Harry, I believe him. Where is he? Where's Lucas? Last I saw of him, he was in the other room having a nap. Let's get to the bottom of this. Lucas? Hey, Lucas! Hey, wake up, Lucas. He's not here. Where would he go? It's nighttime. Harry, I'm scared. Why? He said he hadn't pulled a robbery in 99 years, and he just felt... Well, he felt he couldn't sit still anymore. Well, where would he go? He said something about the store down the road and how some night he'd just have to break in there. i got to stop. Uh, Harry, it may be too late. He doesn't have a chance. Old Dobkins, a storekeeper, is a deputy sheriff. He sits up all night with a shotgun. Maybe Lucas didn't get there yet, huh? I'll take the car. I'm going with you. No, no, no. Harry! One of us has to stay out of jail. Lucas? Hey, Lucas? It's open. And the door's open. Uh, Lucas? Is that you, Harry? Hey, Lucas. What what are you doing in here? What do you think I'm doing? Are you crazy? Let's get out of here. Let me see if I can find the cash. Hey, Lucas, you're crazy. This is breaking entry. And what's the steal here? You can do five to ten for it. (laughs) What's ten years? Let's get out of here, will you? Just a second. Stay where you are in the name of the law. Let's beat it. Halt! Into the car, Lucas. Into the car. Hurry up. Halt in the name of the law. Thank you, nurse. Uh, hello, Harry. How do you feel? Uh, different. Yeah, well, that's to be expected. You've been unconscious for three days. Oh, yeah? Well, I I feel different uh, in a funny kind of way. Uh, like what? I don't know. It's as if I'm a different kind of person. I thought I was dead. Yeah, well, they all say it's a remarkable recovery. Some even believe it's a miracle. It happened right after the transfusion. What transfusion? Well, you needed blood. So it happened that Lucas was your exact type. I tried to stop the transfusion. You did? Why? Well, you know why, Harry. You're going to be just like Lucas now. But, of course, I, I couldn't explain that, so, so they went ahead. What do you mean, uh, I'm going to be just like Lucas? You're going to live forever, just like him. Uh, Rosie, you, you can't believe that. I can, and I do. I don't want to live forever. I'm sorry, Harry. Uh, wait, 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 wait. 
to spend the re- forever go- going to jail for confidence schemes that don't come off. You could try to become another person, Harry. Yeah, but I can't. I can't any more than Lucas can. Well, at least you'll be company for each other. You won't be alone. Hey, Rosie, this thing, if it's true... You know it's true. It has to be true. Rosie, come with me. Where? Into, well, I guess into forever? Into life eternal? No, Harry, no. It's not for me. Oh, Rosie, don't you love me? Oh, I do, Harry. But just for one lifetime. And you're going to spend a lot of this one in jail for that attempted robbery. Rosie! Besides, a gentleman called on me the other night. Mr. Ambrose J. Mammon. I believe you know him. Mammon? He's just crazy about this drink I put together. Well, that was my elixir of life eternal. Except we're going to call it Posca. It makes a wonderful tonic, Harry. If you don't believe me, ask Lucas. Rosie, you can't leave me. Harry, you're the one who's going to leave me. I could never find anybody like you, never. Oh, I don't know. You're going to have plenty of time, Harry, to look. You'll have all the time in the world. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. If only I had it to do over again. So many of us say that with such heartfelt sincerity. And the implication is that we would do it better and that we would be wiser. But the truth is, we would make the same mistakes. Doesn't history keep repeating itself? Our cast included Ralph Bell... Joan Shea, and Ray Owens. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. A savage place as holy as enchanted as air beneath the waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover. A woman wailing for her demon lover. How poignant. How poignant the way the poet puts it. But are there demon lovers? And are there women who will fall in love with them? Surely this is the stuff of legend and myth. And yet, there are things that simply cannot be explained. You mean we shall actually see the tiger from up here in the tree? Yes, and I shall shoot him as he passes below. But why should he pass by here? Well, he's after the goat. The one down there. Ah, poor creature. Why doesn't he run away? He can't. He's tied to a stake in the ground. But the tiger will kill him. An unfortunate necessity. Oh, no. Oh, no. I shall not permit it. Louise, where are you going? I intend to free that Louise, you can't go down there. Come back here. Louise! Our mystery drama, The Love God was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes and Court Benson. I shall be back shortly with Act One. East is east and west is west 
and never the twain shall meet. So said Mr. Kipling. But he knew better than that, because it did meet for many years in that vast, mysterious universe of a country called India. India with its kaleidoscope of religions, races, and languages. India where there is so much myth and so much reality. This is a story that took place at a time when India was known as the British Raj. A lady and a gentleman are sitting on a veranda. Uh, did you know that veranda is an Indian word? And they are sipping tea. Cream. Thank you. Sugar. Thank you. Cake. Oh, I shouldn't. But you will. Well, just the thinnest, tiniest uh, sliver. I know what you're up to, Willis. You're afraid to spoil your appetite for dinner. Oh, about dinner. I shall not be having dinner. No? Bahadur Khan. Not having dinner? I'm afraid not. But we've prepared your favorite. I'm afraid it can't be helped. Ah, Bahadur Khan. It is in my mind to hunt this night. See, therefore, that thou wilt prepare the double-barrel express rifle. You're going to hunt this evening? Well, reports of a man-eating tiger in the Mahura district, causing no end of a fuss. Oh. The tiger has got to be put a stop to. And you're taking Bahadur Khan with you? Well, of course. But you will be back by Saturday. Yes, one way or another. That's good. I need Bahadur Khan to drive to the railroad station at Maipur. Oh? Yes. To pick up Louise. Louise? I've actually prevailed upon her to come out for a visit. Louise? You remember my friend Louise? The skinny one? Well, she is slender. Pasty-faced? Light-complexed. Watery eyes. Actually, her eyes are that delicate shade of china blue. Kind of a big woman. Stately. And as I recall... Very opinionated. Uh, she does have some rather sincerely held convictions. She's really a lovely person. No doubt. When you get to know her, you don't mind, do you? Well, this is your home as well as mine. Perfectly awful female. Now, Willis, she's a perfectly lovely person. No, I was talking, my dear, from a masculine point of view. Ah, Bahadur Khan, I shall want the Martin as my second gun. See thee now. To the horses. My name is Bardur Khan. I serve in the house of Willis Foster Sahib. Foster Sahib is the district commissioner. He is wise indeed. In his 40 years of life, he has not taken a wife. This does not sit well with his sister Pamela Sahiba, a widow who keeps his home. English Mem Sahibs have a peculiar affliction. They cannot tolerate the sight of a bachelor. I could tell by the sweet notes in Pamela Sahiba's voice and the shining look in her eyes that this Louise Sahiba was her latest candidate to storm the citadel of the fortress that was Foster Sahib's heart. Boy! Does the Mem Sahib deign to speak to one so lowly? Are you... Oh, it's your name supposed to be here. I've got it written down here. Are you Bahadur Khan? Bahadur Khan, it is. With the permission of the presence. You were supposed to meet me inside the terminal. If the presence will forgive, I was afraid to venture inside the house of the fire carriages. Afraid? What on earth is there to be afraid of? The fire wagon that pulls the terrain. The engine? Inside, it is filled with devils. Devils? Oh, yes. Devils that have been captured by the government and sentenced to boil the water to make steam for the train. I have never heard such nonsense. Angry devils. And sometimes they escape. In their great fury, they will melt the iron of the fire wagon and there is a terrible explosion and many die. How can you believe such superstitious nonsense? If it offends the presence, I shall not believe it. She was rather large, as Mem Sahibas go, and not at all unshapely. However, her tongue was never silent. 
A talking woman for Foster Sahib? Never. And so, without a moment of silence, we drove to the house. As we entered the gate, there was something that finally stilled her voice for a moment. What's that? What's that noise? Uh, noise? Can't you hear over there? That man is hitting that woman. Uh, that is so. He's beating her. Put a stop to it. Sahiba, that man is Foster Sahib's gardener, Pierre Khan. Make him stop. He has no right to beat that woman. He has every right. She is his wife. I'll stop him myself. Uh, but, but, Sahiba... Stop that! Oh. Oh. I said stop oh. that, you scoundrel! Oh. Stop oh. that at once! Poor Pierre Khan... What was he doing but beating his wife? Suddenly he was beset unmercifully with an umbrella. And thus did the Mem Sahib Louise enter the household. I must say she made her presence felt. She was constantly correcting, admonishing, advising. She was having an effect on everyone except, of course, Foster Sahib. He found reasons to work quite late at the office. One day, the two Mem Sahibs were having tea on the veranda. Uh, Louise, dear, I must ask you not to, uh, 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 to interfere. Interfere? In what way? <laughs> well, the truth is, in every way. Well, I'm sure I don't understand. Uh, since you've come to the station, Louise, you've managed to turn things topsy-turvy, inside out, upside down, and every which way. Have I indeed? Uh, for example, you know, uh, Pierre Khan's beating his wife. Oh, I put a stop to that quickly enough. Uh, the point is, you had no right to stop him. And you had no right to belabor him with your umbrella, either. Do you object to my actions, Pamela? I'm afraid, Louise, I must say yes. But the scoundrel was beating her without mercy. You didn't see him abuse that poor girl. Oh, I've seen him. You have? Yes. <laughs> Many times. And you've done nothing to prevent it? There's nothing I can or should do to prevent it. Things are very different out here. Oh, yes. And you're different, too. Uh, back home, you were a member of the Fabian Society. Well? Well, I remember you at the meeting when you were asked to speak. Please, Louise. They still talk about that speech, the most inspiring oration on the rights of human beings. Louise, what you fail to understand. Suppose they could be aware of this conversation. What would they say about it back home? This is my home now, Louise. My husband is buried here. My children are being raised here. I have no other home. Oh, Pamela, you mustn't think that way. You'd better start thinking that way, too. Oh, no, never. Louise, I asked you to come here because there is no hope for you in England. That isn't true. Then why did you come? That crowd of starry-eyed idealists we ran about with, for the most part, they don't believe in marriage. And those that do, well, they don't believe in... Well, they don't believe in consummating it. Pamela! I saw the way the wind was blowing there ten years ago. So I came here where I could meet someone. It took you somewhat longer, but here you are. Meanwhile, please do not upset my household. What am I doing to upset In the you? matter of Pierre Khan and his way, for example, you have given me a problem. You see, he no longer beats her. And that's a problem. Laila is the best cook I've ever had. Now she just sits and mopes all day. But why? Because her heart is broken. She believes her husband no longer loves her. But why should she think so? Because he no longer beats her. Dear, let us not forget the object of your visit. I know that my brother is a most unusually difficult fish to land. Uh, do you see this charm around my neck? Mm-hmm. Rather somber-looking well, thing. Well, please listen before you say anything. When I came to India ten years ago to live with Willis, Bahadur Khan said to me, Sahiba, here is a token from the god of love, Omira. Omira? There are thousands of such gods. 
At any rate, he told me, if I wore the charm constantly, within the year I would be married. I did. And I was. Are you telling me that you actually believe in this? What I'm telling you is that a girl needs all the help she can get. And so, I uh, took the liberty of asking Bahadur Khan to, uh, to... To uh, what? Bahadur Khan? You'll see, Louise. Sahiba. Bahadur Khan, hast thou found the charm for the Mem Sahib, as I asked thee? One who is even less than the dirt beneath the Sahiba's feet has indeed brought that which is desired. Behold. Oh, Louise, look, it is beautiful. Well, what is it supposed to be? It's your charm. You are now under the special graces of the love god, Omira. <laughs> what are you saying, Pamela? And before the year is out, he shall find you a husband. Here, wear it around your neck. I shall do no such oh, thing. Oh, but Louise... Do you expect me to partake in this superstitious nonsense? To aid, abet, and encourage it? No. Thank you, Bahuda Khan. Pamela, I shall win Willis through intelligence and... Wit and, and, and all the civilized things we have in common. Such a vain and foolish Mem Sahib. But what is to be done? The English, they are like children. They refuse to learn when they are young, and when they grow old, it is too late. Poor, silly Louise Sahiba. Now, no one shall ever lead her to the marriage bed. I don't know about you, but I agree with Pamela. A woman needs all the help she can get, particularly in the affairs of the heart. So then, what prognosis for this proposed match between Willis and Louise? Can it proceed without help from the love god? Is there a love god? Mystery Theatre will continue with Act Two in just a few moments. It is said that marriages and hangings go by destiny, which means that each is foreordained. But destiny, like everything else, can always use a push here and there along the line. Well, here we are in the India of over 100 years ago. A determined spinster named Louise has just turned down an offer of help from one of the local love gods. My goodness, you would think it was an offer she couldn't afford to refuse. That will be all bad again. Sahiba. You didn't have to hurt his feelings. You could have accepted the charm. Mm -hmm. And connived at this dark superstition. Oh, Louise, everything doesn't have to be so serious. Well, I think it's high time we adopted a serious attitude towards that heathen mythology. Bahadur Khan is quite tolerant about our religion. Can't we extend the same indulgence to his? Really, dear, you shouldn't be so earnest all the time. But life is Ernest, life is real. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Now, um, shall we apply ourselves to the problem at hand? The conquest of Willis? Oh, I wish you wouldn't refer to planning for marriage as a conquest. Conquest? Seduction? <laughs> call it what you will. I call it a meeting of the mind. It's also a meeting of the body. Two rational, intelligent... Human beings who can see that their best interests can be served and their better natures enhanced by a union, as it were, of the spiritual aspects. Uh, tell me, what plans have you in mind for Willis? I shall prove to Willis that I am completely interested, not to say fascinated, by his work. Oh, why do women feel they must take an interest in a man's work? Well, to prove that they share. Nonsense. I intend to have a, a partnership with my husband. Uh, what most men have in mind is an ownership, not modern, progressive, enlightened men. Oh, darling, they're the most boring kind. Well, good afternoon. Oh, 
go home early, I see, Willis. Yes, pour me a cup of that tea, please. Bahadur Khan. How are you, Willis? We see so little of you. Uh, well, the uh, work of the empire, the vast, lumbering Indian empire, must be got through somehow. Ah, Bahadur Khan. It is time to settle accounts with the man-eater in the Mahura Hills. Thou wilt fetch the double-barrel rifle and ammunition. It is even as the presence commands. The second gun and all else that will be required for the hunt. We leave in the morning. Are you going to try for that tiresome tiger again? No, oh, well, we'll put an end to him this time. Do you intend to actually shoot and kill a tiger, Willis? With luck. But a tiger? Such a noble, magnificent beast? He's a cattle killer and a man-eater. But aren't you moved by... Mr. Blake's poem. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful cemetery? Oh, not this one. He's old and sick and mangy, half blind and lame. That's why he's become a man-eater. Because he's unable to hunt down game. Oh, well, then it's a, a mission of mercy? Well, I suppose you could call it that. Well, then I approve. Completely. Oh, well, thank you. And also, I believe I should like to come along. Come along? Well, of course. This is India. The India of the jungle. The true India. But it might be dangerous. Dangerous? You said the tiger was half blind and lame. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's what makes him even more dangerous. A half blind, lame tiger? Yes. <laughs> but he's still formidable. Not to be trifled oh, with. Oh, but I should so like to see it. Do let me come. Is there any reason, Willis, why Louise shouldn't go? Well... Then it's settled. <laughs> come to my room, Louise, and I shall lend you an outfit suitable for tiger hunting. Aren't you the sly one? What do you mean? I'm sure you must know how tigers are hunted. No, really, I haven't the foggiest notion. One, uh... Sits up all night in a blind and waits. Is that a fact? As if you didn't know. So there you are, the two of you, alone in the moonlight with the perfume of the exotic jungle flowers creating a most seductive... Oh, nonsense. We shall have a most rational discussion to ascertain our common interests. Oh, yes. I was afraid of that. <laughs> And so the three of us rode to the Mayahura Hills, which had sent messages to the district commissioner to rid them of the man-eater who filled entire villages with dread. When we arrived in the foothills, we proceeded on foot, and since these were not our hills, I stopped for a moment and knelt. What's he doing? Shh. We may proceed... If the presence so desires, lead us, Bahadur Khan. What was he doing? He was asking permission to hunt. Asking permission? From whom? From the guard of this particular jungle. Oh, you see, we're strangers here. <laughs> you speak as if you actually believe in it yourself. <laughs> Does it hurt? I would suppose one is always well advised to have as many things going for one as possible. But to answer your question, yes. It, it hurts. It hurts the cause of progress and enlightenment to support base superstition. Ah, right then, I knew her hopes were doomed. He would never lead her to his marriage bed. For a brief moment, he had been attracted to her. The fact that she wished to hunt the tiger at night had marked her as a woman of spirit. But then, of course, she had spoiled it all with her inability to hold her tongue. Ah, uh, these foolish English. Why do they talk so much? Dost thou hear it, Bahodur Khan? By the favor of the presence, thy servant hears. What is it? A goat. A goat? If it is thy will, I shall go forward to see if the villagers have prepared the blind. What is he saying? We must keep our voices low. What is he saying? The villagers should have built us a platform high up in a tree. Why? Sahib, Sahib, 
come? Yes, I believe it's in readiness. Up here, Sahib. Good. Uh, help the Mem Sahib up the tree. Oh, thank you very much. Shh. Now come, we must hurry. Ah, Shere Khan hunts this night. Shere Khan, who is that? Oh, that's what the natives call the tiger. You know, this is really quite roomy and comfortable. Yes. Now, I have a question. Mm. You can look down from here and shoot the tiger, but <laughs> why should he be good enough to oblige you and pass this way? <laughs> that's why. I don't understand. Well, look below. Uh, to the left. What do you see? Seems to be a goat. Exactly. What's he standing there for? Doesn't he hear the tiger? Oh, yes, he does. Well, then why doesn't he run away? Well, he can't. He's tethered to a stake in the ground. Well, why? For what unearthly reason? It's a very sound reason. The villagers put him out here to attract Shere Khan. And when he comes, I'll be able to shoot him. But the poor goat. What about the poor goat? But the tiger will spring on him and kill him. Well, yes, that's the idea of the thing. Well, that's not fair. It's the only way to do it. Are you saying this is the only way to hunt a tiger? The only way without risking the loss of life. But the goat is going to lose its life. I mean human life. What, the goat is also a child of the creator? Oh, no. I, I, I can't tolerate this. Making too much noise will scare off the tiger. That poor little goat. Where are you going? I shall not stay here and see that goat be made a victim. You can't go down there. A hunter can stop her. Don't you dare. You come back here. I'm going to untie that goat so that it can run away. Now listen. Nice goat. Nice creature. Just let me untie this knot. The tiger is prowling around down there. I can't seem to unloosen this knot. Do you want to get killed? Open this knot. Louise! Even if I could see the tiger, I couldn't shoot him in time. It's giving way. It's opening. Louise! Just another moment. That's all I need. Louise! Run! You're free! Sorry. Run! Behold! Run, run, you silly little goat! You get away! Away from here, you big bully. Get away. Go home. Shoot him, Sahib. Shoot. How can I shoot that confounded woman standing in the way? Go on now. You heard me. Go home. That's a nice pussy. Can I just turn around and go straight home? You hear me? Go home. <laughs> Are they not crazy, all these English? On the ground is the mad Mem Sahib, and she is almost twisting the whiskers of the terrible tiger. I do not know which of the two is more frightened. Up in the tree is Foster Sahib with the double barrel rifle, cursing as if the devil is in his mouth, trying to shoot the tiger, but the Mem Sahib is in the line of fire. And also in the tree, we have me, Badur Khan, wandering, waiting to see how, with the grace of God, it will all come out. And I am with you, Bahadur Khan, also, waiting and wondering how it must all come out. As we both know, the design has already been woven by providence. And all shall be revealed in the appointed time by revelation. Which, in our drama, is always the third act. He who rides a tiger, the proverb tells us, dares not dismount. That's a very good analysis of those who are actually riding the tiger. But what can we say of one who is facing the tiger and alone, unarmed, and on foot? I would suppose we could only remark such a person is hardly a good insurance risk. Now, you be a nice pussycat and go straight home. That's right. Go home. Yes, and goodbye to you, too. And don't you dare show your face around here again. Now, Sahib, now shoot him. Missed. The other barrel, Sahib, quickly. 
Oh, he got away. So he did. And I'm glad. You're glad? Well, isn't it better this way? There was no bloodshed. It was all your fault. My fault? I should have had him. But aren't you happier it worked out like this? There's no blood on your hands. But that's my job. It's your job to get blood on your hands? It's my job to kill tigers that terrorize the countryside. You threw such a scare into him, I don't think he'll be in the mood to terrorize anyone for a long, long time. Miss Louise, I... I... Yes? Nothing. Nothing at all. Bahadur Carry the rifles. We are going home. I must say that the journey home was not a happy one. Foster Sahib was angry, and the Mem Sahib Louise did not know why. After a while, she too became angry, and so they spoke not a word to each other. When they arrived at the house, the Mem Sahib Pamela called me to her. Bahada Khan, I have here a note which informs me that the children of my servants have not been vaccinated against the smallpox. What's happened? The people no longer believe in devils. And it has been believed that the vaccination is the magic that enters the blood to vanquish the devil of the smallpox. The Sahiba Louise has insisted to all that there are no devils. And in that case, of what use is the vaccination? I see. Thank you, Bahada Khan. That will be all. But that was not to be all. Foster Sahib was very unhappy at home. And therefore, Mem Sahib Pamela was unhappy. And Mem Sahib Louise, she too was unhappy. Indeed, it was a most unhappy household. And then, one morning, before he left for his office, Foster Sahib stopped to speak with his sister. Where's Louise? I believe she's out somewhere. Mm. What trouble is she causing now? I think she's teaching some of the children to read. Yes, well... I thought you two would get along. I can't imagine why. You're so alike in so many ways. None of which is apparent to me. I, uh, I suppose you'd like to see her go. I know she's your oldest friend. She's not old. The fact is, she is so obviously out of place here. Well, yet I, I, I can't ask her to leave, can I? No, I suppose not. Well, what's to be done? Leave it to me. Leave what to you? There are ways of getting around things. Now, Willis, Willis, you must not be cruel. No, dear. But I shall be surgical. Well, good morning, ladies. Good morning, morning, Willis. Everyone so bright and early for breakfast. You seem to be in excellent spirit. Ladies, I am drunk. (laughs) Willis, you never drink this early in the morning. Oh, this is the greatest intoxication of all. What is? The glow, the exhilaration that has nothing to do with alcohol. What does it have to do with? Love. Love? Love? Ladies, you shall be the first to know. I am in love. Willis! At last, the steadfast Willis has finally fallen, taken prisoner by two sparkling blue eyes, a halo of golden blonde hair, and lips as luscious as the Kabuli grapes. I am her captive without hope of quarter. Uh, Whose captive are you, Willis? I saw her last night at the club. And suddenly... What can I say? I... I was smitten. By whom, Willis? By Jenny Thorpe. Uh, Jenny Jenny Thorpe? Thorpe. Uh, 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 Jenny, uh, she's a... She's an angel. Uh, She's a... uh, She's already buried two husbands. Let her bury me, too, if it comes to that. Are you sure, Willis? When the heart speaks, can there ever be doubt? I... I wish you the... Best of fortune, Willis. May you always be happy. Thank you, Louise. Um, you must excuse me. I, I, I think I have a headache. You can't be serious, Willis. 
that impossible Jenny Thorpe. I shall be serious for as long as it may be necessary. I don't understand. For as long as Louise remains here. Oh, well, it isn't necessary to hurt her. Oh, Pamela, dear, there is no such thing as painless surgery. All this was taking place even as I, Bahadur Khan, was serving the tea, the eggs, and the mutton chops for the breakfast. Later in the morning, as I proceeded to clean the bedrooms, I noticed the door of the Mem Sahib Louise was closed, and from within, the sound of a woman weeping. I was about to go away, but suddenly her door opened, and the Sahiba appeared before me. Obviously, she had hastily dried her tears. Bahadur Khan, may I speak with you? This insignificant person would be willing to spend eternity listening to the words of wisdom from the prison. Please, Bahadur Khan, I'm serious. I'm so miserable. You see? I've always been in love with Willis all my life. He'd never look at me. And now, now he's going to marry someone else. <laughs> Is it not written, there are other fish in the sea? Fish? Yes. Men, no. Oh, Bahadur Khan, perhaps, perhaps I offended that god. What was his name? Omir or something. That is when I refused that charm that you offered me. Now I'm willing to believe anything. I mean it. What have I got to lose? And this is such a strange country. Who knows what can happen here? I looked at this Mim Sahib who was fighting her tears. A strange country? No. This is not a strange country. It is really quite simple. It is the English who are strange. And this one, not only strange, but also ill. And why was she ill? Only because no one had ever led her to the nuptial couch. Which is why she was always getting herself into so much mischief. And yet, she would make an excellent wife for Foster Sahib. Ah, these English. Why are we always compelled to arrange matters for them? If the Sahib will deign to listen. Oh, yes. You have grievously offended the great love god, Omira, when you insulted his charm. But I'm sorry. Omira is a god of love. He can always be appeased. He can? How? One must go to his temple and pray to him. Are you asking me to pray to a heathen god? The Sahiba has honored me by inquiring if I would serve her. If she continues to insult the mighty Omir... No, no, no. Uh, no, no. I certainly don't. No, not at all. Then we must go to the temple of Omira at midnight... At midnight? Yes, at midnight. At which time we shall pray to the love god for a miracle. Yes, one must always pray for a miracle. And in addition, one must always prepare for a miracle. After all, these things cannot be spun from the air, can they? And so... To begin, I went to the kitchen and spoke to Laila, the cook. Why should I help the Sahiba, Louise? Because I ask it of thee. I do not like the Sahiba. If thou refuse me, I shall tell thy husband about that British soldier in the bazaar. He has already beat me for the soldier. And the Bengali merchant. Also for the merchant. And for the Afghan horse trader. Ah. <laughs> uh, what is uh, required of me? Bring the paint, the powder, the rouge, which thou knowest so well to apply. Also, thy wedding gown. My wedding gown? Ah, yes. 
a most exciting garment. We must prepare the Sahiba Louise for her encounter with the love god of Omira. At midnight, we shall meet at his shrine. And so, at midnight, we met at the shrine of the love god. It was a bower of dogwood trees in full bloom, a few feet from the house. And why not? Any lovely place may be sacred to the god of love. At first, I did not recognize the Sahiba Louise. Laila had performed magic with her paint and her gown. Standing in front of me was a magnificent, stately goddess with skin like alabaster, flaming red hair, flashing eyes. I tell you, she was one to inflame the senses of any man. And so I approached Sahiba Louise. Are you now ready to pray to the love god, Almira? I... I'm ready. Then speak. Speak of what is in your heart. Ask for the fulfillment of your desire. I... I want... Willis Foster. I want... Willis... Foster. Listen... Listen to the reply of the love god, Omira. I, I... I don't hear any... Close your eyes and listen. Listen. Yes. My child, I have heard your prayer. I grant your wish. I fulfill your desire. You shall have Willis Foster... Go to him. Go to him now. Tell him it is my will. Oh, but I... Do you believe in me, my daughter? Yes, but I... Then go to him now. Yes. Yes. Like one in a dream, she turned, she walked into the house... She went to the room of Foster Sahib, and I heard... Oh, oh what, what, what time is it? You... Oh, who... who are you? You don't know me. Louise? No, it, it, you can't be Louise. I'm Louise. But you're... You're beautiful. Why have we kept apart from each other for so many years? Now that you ask me, I... I don't know. Even as children, we knew we were meant for each other. Why did we fight against it? I guess you thought I was dull. And did you think I was too clever? Well, (laughs) I'm not really clever. No, and I'm not really dull either. What is this nonsense about that awful Jenny Thor? Well, that's... that's all it is, Louise. Nonsense. You were always too shy to say it, and I was too proud, but someone has to say it first. I love you. And... and I love you. Uh, Just... Just a moment. Then he closed the door to his room, and I was able to hear no more. Like a good servant, I retired for the night, seeing that my master had need of me no longer. And you, to whom I tell this tale, have need of me no longer as well. For the rest of the story, you may supply yourselves. (laughs) 
I will be back shortly with a final thought. Our story may perhaps raise a question. Is there a God of love? Are meetings, matings, and matches all arranged in advance? I would answer most likely because some of the pairings and partnerships we see around us simply could not come about by themselves. Somebody, somewhere, somehow must have had a hand in it. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Kurt Benson, Grace Matthews, and William Griffiths. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. Time for Radio Mystery Theater. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Today, the door to Mystery Theater opens on a tomb of the past that has been sealed for 3,000 years. A life of splendor and misery undreamt of today. The pharaohs and their queens drinking from jewel-encrusted golden cups while the poor warm themselves at camel dung fires. A life of contrasts, of mile-wide temples along the Nile, of jackals digging at graves in the desert of love and treachery, of an extraordinary people, the ancient Egyptians. Mother, I know it's been arranged for me to marry Nefertiti, but why can't I wait for one year before I take a wife? Because it has been arranged. You will be crowned pharaoh and marry the same day. Nefertiti frightens me. She she hates me. She despises me. Mother, she won't make a good queen. Oh, yes, she will. She'll make a pharaoh of you. drama, The Vulture Screams, based on fact and the findings of archaeologists, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Tammy Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It fascinates me that here we are today, one foot on Earth and the other on the moon, in Mars or Venus. Satellites spin off in orbit. Space shuttles are poised for takeoff to far-off planets. And yet, what truly captures our imagination and interest these days? Life in Egypt, thousands of years before Christ. So, let me step aside and yield the microphone to the most beautiful woman who ever lived. Her name, Nefertiti. A name, by the way, that actually means Behold, the beautiful woman. It was a day I'll never forget. I was 19. My father, the prime minister, was at the bedside of the great pharaoh himself, Amenhotep. He was dying. Ironical in a way, because just the day before, I had been told of the great honor I was to receive. I was to be married to the pharaoh's son, Akhenaten. Not my choice for a husband, really. But in a few hours, he'd be the king. And I ask anyone, who in their right mind would turn down a chance to marry a king? Let alone the king of the greatest land in the universe, Egypt. Wife, queen, I am dying. Bring the gods closer where I can see them from my bed. It shall be done, my pharaoh. Priests, light the tapers and bring your masks, signifying our gods, closer to his majesty's bedside. You first, Horus, with the falcon face. Then you, Sekhmet, heart woman, heart lion. I 
cannot see them. Light more tapers. They are here, husband. All around your bed. Where is my prime minister? I. Hero, Pharaoh. My time has come. Where is Akinasin, my son? I will fetch him. He is in his chambers. Wife, let us begin the ritual. The last words. I smile at death. I smile at death. Death is in my mind today, like the fragrance of myrrh, like seated in shelter on a windy day. Like seated in shelter on a windy day. Death is in my mind today, like the longing of a man for his home when he has passed long years in captivity. Father, father. Father, dearest Pharaoh, do not leave us. My son, the minutes leave me. Wife, Queen Ty. Yes, husband. Bring the masked gods nearer. <laughs> Have them bend over me. I must touch them. Sobek the crocodile. <laughs> Thoth the baboon. Father, don't, please. They don't. Those animals, they, they frighten me. Uh, frighten? Masks of our divinities. Be not afraid. I am joining them. Animals and snakes, monkeys, dogs, and hawks. I I cannot look at them. Please, Father, let me go. My son, these are our gods who will conduct your father to the other world. I can't look. They're horrible. Son... <laughs> You will inherit the kingdom of Egypt before the hour is spent. Now turn your head up. Look at them. Oh, foolish boy. They are but masks. I want to see no weakness, I can answer. No cowardice. I take him away. Our son has disgraced himself. <laughs> My dear Prime Minister, these last six hours since the Pharaoh died have been the longest in my life. No one must know what really happened at the Pharaoh's deathbed, least of all your daughter Nefertiti. I am so ashamed. No one shall, my queen. I pray my dearest husband will spare that sight. Horrible. His trembling, quaking son. The Pharaoh's eyes and ears were already closed. Now your son, Akhenaten, will step into the royal shoes. It grieves me. I ask myself, is my son ready for the throne? Akhenaten is weak at a time when the two lands of Egypt need strength. You speak as if Thebes were surrounded by enemies. Ah, oh, they're vassal states now. But if the heart of Egypt falters, you will see how quickly the arms and legs will not obey. I see revolt everywhere. What is this sickness in my son's head? To turn away from animals and birds, to weep like a woman. He is but 19. As he grows, my queen, he will find his path. He will find strength in Nefertiti. I hope so. I pray so. Yes, your daughter Nefertiti will bring energy and endurance. The sooner your daughter and my son are united, the sooner may Egypt inherit an heir. Not may inherit, but shall. No time will be wasted. The coronation of your son, Akhenaten, and his wedding to Nefertiti will be on the same day. Ow! Oh, what are you doing to me, Mariani? That hurt. Nefertiti, I am sorry. But it's your own fault. How can you expect me to paint your toenails if you keep wiggling about like a captured lizard? Oh, dear. Isn't it a beautiful day? Sitting out here in my terrace, overlooking Thebes and the River Nile. Mm -hmm. I think I'd rather be me than anyone else in Egypt. Now tell me about yesterday. And how you know who behaved. The king was saying the last word of the ritual. It goes, death is as when a man grasps suddenly what he has not understood. That is so clear to me. 
that just before death, you suddenly understand everything. And then, is that when it happened? Yes, I think so. Uh, according to one of the mourners. Is it really true Prince Akhenaten fell into a fit and froze at the bow? Well, I didn't see it myself. Akhenaten is such a baby. He always was. Even when we were children playing together. Nefertiti, I speak to you as a sister. Don't believe everything you hear. You don't think Akhenaten became hysterical and had to be led away from the bed of death? He could have. But no one knows. It's only gossip. Oh. There. The toenails are done. How do they look? Oh, Nefertiti, you don't even care. I wish I knew Akhenaten better. I've seen so little of him in the last few years. Do you think it's possible, Mariani, for people to change? Yes, I do, Nefertiti. It's the world outside that won't let you change. But I must believe you can change yourself, if you will. Do you think Akhenaten has strength where maybe... It doesn't show? Is that possible, Mariani? Of course it is. For me, when I marry, I'd rather find someone who has strength that does show. When you marry, I hope you will have a choice. Akhenaten? Akhenaten, it's time to be up. The peacocks are already sunning themselves in the courtyard. Are you asleep? No, Mother. Then why didn't you answer me? I was hoping you'd go away. Last night, I was discussing you with the Prime Minister. Oh, not now, Mother. Can't it wait for another time? I... I feel so wretched. Son, stop that. We all feel sad. <laughs> the world is emptier today without your father. You're... You're not ashamed of me? Oh, my darling boy. I hope that when you're married and wear the robes of the Pharaoh, these childish fears will disappear. I would that they could. Look at it sensibly. Why do we make these creatures our gods? They have qualities we humans do not. The falcon can fly. No mortal is as strong as a lion or as swift as a jaguar. These are not to be feared, but worshipped. Hmm. When is the coronation? Very soon. You spoke of marriage to Nefertiti. Yes, it is arranged. Could I be pharaoh for one year before I take a wife? No, son. But my father was king without a queen for ten years. He was at war. He needed only soldiers. You need a wife. Nefertiti frightens me. She, she won't make a good queen. Oh, yes, she will. She'll make a pharaoh of you. Mother, she hates me. She, she despises me. When we were little, she always made fun of me. What, what do we have in common? The throne of Egypt. You must not be afraid of her. You must fear nothing. To be an Egyptian in these times is the highest form of man. We and our gods control everything. Here and in the hereafter. There is nothing to fear. You think so? Poor mother. I'm afraid. Because I know how little I know. I'm ignorant. We are all ignorant. Nefertiti will make all the difference in your life. I'll do it for Egypt. But I wish you'd chosen me another bride. You don't know her. She has many wonderful qualities. Oh, to be sure. She can pierce a target with an arrow at a hundred yards. She can run quicker than an antelope. She's crossed the Nile in the water faster than a fish could swim. Oh, yes, mother. I look forward to taking to bed a huntress, a runner, a wife of muscle, not mine. Have you ever talked to Nefertiti? Talked? About what? Could she answer one question of the spirits? Perhaps her questions are the same as yours. Akhenaten, I want you to get up and get dressed now. Face her with your questions, son, and then pray to Osiris for the answers. Face Nefertiti? I can hardly face the morning. Oh, don't be stupid. And don't try my patience. You will marry whom I say, and you will do as I say. And what if I will not? Your grandfather refused to go to war. He died. Your uncle mocked his father. He also died, mysteriously. My very own brother disobeyed his father and was found dead. They all died suddenly? They were all poisoned. Akhenaten, although you are my only son, if you do not obey and do what is best for Egypt, I would not hesitate to kill you with my own hands. <laughs> Thank you.
What was commonplace in a civilization thousands of years ago may seem incredible to us today. Yet, in spite of primitive beliefs, bizarre codes of conduct, marriage within families, some of the world's finest poetry and art was created by the early Egyptians. Evidence of their treasures, their talents, are on view everywhere today. But it was in their games with death that the Egyptians reached their most original glory. More when I return shortly with Act Two. The ancient Egyptians were taught from childhood they were born with a soul, a spirit, or ka, which would survive physical death. Indeed, many people believe that today. But an Egyptian could only live in the hereafter if the body was preserved from corruption and the ka provided with food and all the appurtenances of earthly life. Not only jewelry, chariots, furniture, and clothing, but if you were a pharaoh, servants as well. There is no other way, daughter. All those who have prepared the house of life for the deceased king must be put to death. The excavators, the carpenters, the painters, goldsmiths, all the artisans and workmen, they too must be buried around the tomb. But that is terrible, Father. Is it so that no one will tell where the pharaoh is buried? Where the tombs are hidden? So that no one will rob the graves? Partly, never did he. It's a waste of time and lives. Grave robbing goes on all the time. And we know, and we try to stop it. Anyone caught is put to death and strung up as an example. Death, death. Too much thinking about death. You don't understand at all. A pharaoh who dies becomes a god. I suppose when you're queen of Egypt, you'll put a stop to the killing of the pharaoh's hundred servants who are also buried with him. That's wicked. As if the king and his court would all go to the eternal world together and his servants wait on him through eternal life. Wicked. This is not the conversation I wish to have with my daughter the morning of her wedding. Where is the queen? She promised to be here and help me to get ready. I have a thousand things to do. Goodbye, father. And if you see my husband to be, tell him to be sure to be ready on time. Akhenaten is always late. He'll miss his own funeral. I hope you meant wedding. Yes, I did. Of course. <laughs> If there's anything I loathe, it's having to stand still and be fitted by the court tailor. Your, your Highness, please, if you would kindly not move. No. The royal robe must fit properly. I wish you'd hurry. I really am not feeling too well. <laughs> tailor, help me to my bed. I must lie down. Oh, I'll never have this robe done in time. You don't understand. I feel sick. Everything is rising about me. Your, your, your Highness, <laughs> what is it? My insides, I think... I've been poisoned. Good morning, my dear Nefertiti. It's the big day. Oh, Mother Time, I'm so glad you came. I've got butterflies in my stomach. Are all brides as nervous as I am? Oh, yes, I was. <laughs> I brought you some special lotus perfume. Queen Chai, Queen Chai, the prince. Oh, oh, excuse me, princess. Forgive me for bursting in on you like this, but I, I simply had to find the queen. What's the matter, Taylor? The prince, Akhenaten, he is very ill. I knew it. I was fitting him for the coronation robe and he fell over. He says he's been poisoned. I had better go to him at once. Don't worry, Nefertiti. I'm sure it's some little indisposition. No, let me go to him by myself, alone, Queen Tai. What? See your groom in the morning of the wedding? That's evil luck. But if Akhenaten dies before we are married, that's not such good luck either, is it? Akhenaten, I've come to take care of you. Lie still. I'm really important to you, am I? Of course you are. The moment I heard you were ill, I came right over. This is stupid, isn't it? Today of all days. You'll laugh, but I... I thought you disliked me. It's not you, Akhenaten. It's weakness I dislike. Have I always been that way? Yes, you have. Even when we were younger. Do you remember we used to play with Horan and Rab? Hor and Rab? The tailor's son. Remember that time the three of us saw an overseer whipping his slaves? I think so. They were carrying granite for the Pharaoh's statues, and he kept whipping them. We had a little army. 
Gorin Rob was always the general, and we were his soldiers. Remember? Move! Oh, the ladies come! Move, I say! Move! Look at them, whipping those unfortunates. Army, get your slingshots ready. I told you, yes, General you move. Are you ready also, Private Ocknodden? Yes, General. Now, wait till the overseer gets a little closer, and then take careful aim. Here, here's a good pebble. You first, Private F.T. Are you ready? Ready, General. Ready? Aim. Fire. I'm sorry, General. I missed. All right, Eunice, Private Ocknodden. Here's your stone. You ready? Uh, aim. Fire. Go uh, on, I said fire. I, I can't. I, I, I'm afraid. Oh, what kind of an army is this? It's my turn, then. I'll get him right in the back of the neck. Oh! You hit the slave driver, General. I'm next. You, you hit him in the head. Oh, here he comes. Stand your ground. Uh, uh, he comes. Chris Hoppers. Who was it? Who hit me? You shouldn't whip those men. It's cruel. Ah, two boys and a girl. I, 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 I didn't. Come forward. I, I, I didn't hit you. Uh, whipping is not the way to get men to work for you. I give you one more chance. Who was it? It, it was my stone. Both of them. Ah, a brave little beetle. See how you like this. Uh, you've cut his face. He's bleeding. Horn Rob, you're hurt. Ah, what are you doing, overseer? Give me that whip. Uh, Prime Minister, they, 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 they attacked me. Do you know to whom you're raising your hand? This is my daughter, Nefertiti. And the lad behind her is the Pharaoh's son, Akhenaten. Oh, most royal prime minister, I, I beseech you, I did not know. Your name? Zanaza, your grace. Go home and put your house in order. Inform your wife that before nightfall she will be widowed. Leave. You, lad. Who are you? Horan Rab? Oh, yes, the son of the tailor. The next time I find you near the palace, I shall make you regret it the rest of your life. Go home. He's bleeding, Father. His face is cut open. Did you hear me, you dirty boy? Get away from here. General Horan Rab, I kiss away your cut so it will heal. I'll never forget you. Disgraceful. A daughter of mine kissing the cheek of that young horror? I don't care. He's very brave. Braver than him. He is the son of the pharaoh, and you must respect him. Is that why? Because he's a prince? Of royal blood. And I, a prime minister, am only a commoner. And so are you, daughter. Oh, he makes me sick. I will not have you growing up a tomboy, playing with stones and slingshots and riprap. Like this horn rab, the tailor's boy. It is not befitting the future queen. Do you remember, Akhenaten? Do you remember? Do you think I'm still that afraid? That I haven't changed? I don't know. What happens to you when there is something you don't want to face? You ever fit when your father is dying? You should be ashamed. Never tedy. You have no idea how terrifying those masks of animals are. I, I, I couldn't help it. And today, a few hours before you are to be crowned the pharaoh of all Egypts, and we are to be married, you turn green, and your servant comes running saying you were poisoned. I thought I was. My, my stomach pained so. My arms and legs felt like they were going to drop off. But poisoned? No one is going to harm you except yourself. You must not let your mind poison you. You have a duty to Egypt. And that is to be brave. Always. Do you understand? Nefertiti? I think you really do care for me. You're right. I think I do. Then I think I shall get up and get married. Nefertiti, is that you? Yes, I'm back, Queen Mother. He's all right. Only his imagination was poison. Hmm. Is he ready for the ceremony? He will be. Mark Norton is a good boy. A boy. That's pretty much how I feel about him. He needs you. I'll do my best. But you must promise me to be always close at hand until I learn how to be a queen. 
It is not difficult. The important thing to remember, child, is that the Pharaoh always comes first. That is foremost. They really make the first rule the most difficult, don't they? Hello, my precious Mew Mew. Isn't he a beautiful kitten, Mother? You have no time to play with pets. Sure. <laughs> now you've made him run away and hide. We were talking about how to be a queen, Nefertiti. Now stand up. Let's see how the drape falls. I think I have a long neck. Does the dress hide it? Oh, perfectly, child. Akhenaten will be very proud of you. If I can only make him see what I see and feel what I feel. Ah, oh, Mariani, let me see the covering robe. Mew Mew, where are you? This lapis is sewn on sideways. Now, who is responsible for that? Bring me a needle and gold and silver thread. Mew Mew! Here, Mew Mew! What are you doing, child, crawling on the ground? Now, stop it and get up. You'll ruin the dress. Mariani, have you seen my kitten? I think he ran out the door, madame. I'll go find him myself. Oh. I believe this is your kitten, princess. It is. It is. Thank you, soldier. You're welcome, princess. Don't we... Don't we know each other? Yes. We have met before. A long time ago. In the palace? Outside. In those days, I was not permitted in here. I remember now. An overseer struck you with a whip. Oh, yes. You took the lash for me. You are Horenra. I am, princess. <laughs> Horenra. Are you a general? Not yet. I am a captain of the guards. Goodbye. Happy omens to you, Queen Nefertiti. Bye. I see you found your kitten. Now to sew this lapis lazuli on proper... What is it, Nefertiti? Are you all right? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. Mother Ty, I think I am growing up. <laughs> The worship and the fear of animals is not difficult to understand if you bear in mind that the ancient Egyptians were more than 3,000 years closer to uncivilized man than we are. The hawk in the sky, the cry of the desert jaguar, the roar of the lion were fearsome in those days. Nefertiti, however, was a 21st century woman. How she will reconcile her modern spirit to her own time we shall see when I return shortly with Act Three. Archaeologists who have searched the length of the Nile tell us that this was a civilization throbbing with life. Hours away is the coronation of the new pharaoh, Akhenaten, and his marriage to Nefertiti. But it is not always those who wear the crown who have the power. In ancient, as in modern history, look not at the kings, but the king-makers. And in those days of the 14th century B.C., who wields the power? You look very well in those robes, Akhenaten. If you'll please stand here at the foot of the throne steps, I will tie these royal chin whiskers to your face. My... <laughs> How often I've seen my father wearing these. Ooh, they're a bit stiff because they're made of gold. Yeah, I'll tie them with this strap around the back of your neck. Now, during the ceremony, whatever you do, don't move a muscle. Don't laugh. Well, why should I laugh? And don't frown either, my boy. The straps are a bit short, and if you move too much, the chin whiskers may fall off. Look at you, Arknard. Oh, I love those whiskers. Are they heavy? It, it's hollow. Hollow beaten gold. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly makes you talk funny. <laughs> Nefertiti, stop tormenting Akhenaten. You know those chin whiskers are part of the ritual. He looks ridiculous. Uh, Nefertiti, you are too stupid to understand the significance of our heritage. Now, Your Highness Akhenaten, I hand you this crook and this flail. Cross them against your chest. With that crook and the funny gold whiskers... You look like a goat pretending to be a shepherd. Mother! He's only teasing you, son. Now turn round. You turn round with him, Nefertiti. I isn't she a picture? 
The gold gauze dress and the lapis lazuli and carnelian at her throat. I'm very proud of your daughter. That's the warning bell. The procession to the coronation will begin very soon. I'm not teasing, Queen Ty. Why do we today still have to go through all these primitive rites? We'll talk about that later. Aye, do we go from the Temple of Karnak to the Lotus Shrine for the wedding? Yes, Your Highness. After the coronation, the wedding, I shall tell the priests we are ready. There isn't going to be any wedding. I'll be crowned Pharaoh, and that is all. No wedding! Why are you getting so angry? I am not going to stand here being mocked by this creature. Take her out of my sight! Don't! Oh, look what you've made me do. Those tin whiskers have fallen on the floor, probably bent all out of shape. I'm sorry if I made you so nervous, darling. But now that I look at you, dear husband-to-be, I admit I was wrong. Oh. You do look much better with your face hidden behind that golden bush. Get her out of here. The marriage is off. Off! Of course, the marriage wasn't off. It went without a hitch, as did the coronation. It rankled me that in all the processions from the crowning to the wedding, I had to walk behind Akhenat. Right when I vowed to myself that in all other ways I would be his equal. The banquet at the festival hall was attended by all those of noble birth, the holy men, and those who labored in the palace. We sat high up on a platform, and there were mountains of food as far as the eye could see. Everyone seems to be enjoying themselves. From up here, they all look like so many dwarfs. <laughs> I am thirsty, wife. I strain this cup of pomegranate wine for you. Thank you. I exist only for the pleasure of the Pharaoh. Well. His bidding is my desire. Hmm. <laughs> We are pleased with our royal wife. Your pleasure and my silence are one. We wish the queen to have her say. I have nothing to say. A request, then? No request, my king. We wish it. Any entertainment is yours. Then perhaps I should like a story. Storytellers we have. May the queen select her own storyteller. Indeed. The pharaoh has in his service one Horenrath, the captain of the guards. I would like him to amuse me with a story. Fetch him! Captain, the queen desires a story. A fierce tale of conquest. Of the capture of foreign armies by our ancestors. Of thousands tortured and made prisoner. Nefertiti, that doesn't sound like you. A story of the might of Egypt. I know of a might that is stronger than the sword. Yes? Then tell of it. Royal Pharaoh, Royal Queen, let me tell you of my dream. We want no dream. We wish reality. Nefertiti, hear him out. Go ahead, Captain. Since I was a boy, I have often had this dream of a time when the strength of Egypt will be met with an equal strength across the Nile. The only victor will be death. Our people in their misery will ransack the temples, the Nile will cease to flood, and the black earth remain red. And there will come a Messiah, a teacher of good, a preacher of peace, of healing words. And men shall say this Lord is the shepherd of all people. Is that all? And greed and murder and sin shall all disappear of the world but follows in this good shepherd's footsteps. Yes, Your Royal Highness, that is all. That is my dream. Captain, your story pleased us. What of Egypt, its wealth, its conquests? Your Highness, the story of turning the other cheek told by a soldier is the good way to begin your reign. Pray give it thought. I don't want to give it thought. Who are you, a mere captain of the guards, to be telling his queen what to think? I wish to be amused, not preached to. I asked for a tale of strength, a story of the greatness of the two Egypts, the hiss of the cobra, the scream of the vulture, and you have disobeyed me. My lord Pharaoh, what punishment does Horan Rab deserve? Punishment? But why? I say fifty lashes. 
I want this man whipped for disobeying his queen. But it's Horan Rab. We all grew up together. I know who it is. Call the last this instant. If I have to wait one more moment, it will be a hundred, not fifty. Forty eight. Forty nine. Fifty. Captain Horan Rab, what do you see on my head? The royal diadem, Your Majesty. Describe it to me. A gold band signifying the two Egypts. And over the forehead, the gold cobra of the north. And the gold vulture of the south. Remember that, Captain. I come from southern Egypt. I, your queen, am the vulture of the south. I expect always to be obeyed. Next time, keep your dreams of a messiah to yourself. Captain, you may leave us. Wait a moment, Captain. Captain, your story has pleased us well. It pleased not me. You may go now, General Horanrab. Why did I do it? Why did I seek to have Horanrab humbled before me? His story affected me also. There was wisdom in it. But I was determined to start my reign as queen by being obeyed. It was a test of strength between us. And I knew Horan Rab regarded it as such. That night, the festivities over, my husband and I were alone in the palace. Why did you punish Horan Rab with such vehemence so soon after receiving the crown? Why did you make him a general? Oh, I like him. He deserved it. He deserved the lashes as well. Nefertiti, I don't understand you. I've always liked Horan Rab, and I know you have also. A queen should be gracious and forgiving. Besides, there was truth in his story. I, I could feel it. I don't know. Perhaps I'm a creature of moods. He never flinched, did he? He never had. Did you notice that old scar on his cheek? Oh, Nefertiti. Fifty lashes for an old friend. Perhaps I ordered them as an example to you. Do you get pleasure out of hurting? He took his punishment, and you rewarded him, making him general. So we are both satisfied. I'm not so sure. It seemed a strange behavior to me, but perhaps someday I shall understand you better. You are finding out I have a mind of my own. Yes. <laughs> but about some things I could never agree with you. Really? If I were to say it's late, dear husband... Would you mind snapping out the light? About that, I would certainly agree. <laughs> Brother. Brother, are you awake? Is that you? I certainly I am. Draw the curtains aside. You see, brother, two lamps, a board across my knee. And I am designing a new dress for the queen when she is with child. You always work this late at night? <laughs> I do my best designs when the palace is dark and all are asleep. And I'm sure you're glad this day is over, brother. Don't say brother too loudly. Nobody knows we're related. Ah, I keep forgetting. If I haven't congratulated you before, brother, I... I want to say the ceremonies went beautifully. The fruit of 19 years planning. 19 long years. Egypt is more precious to me than my life. And there's only one way for it to continue to be a diadem in the universe. And that is to be powerful. I'm in Hotep and his son Akhenaten, who is now Pharaoh. Our line of bent and broken reeds. Our family grows increased stronger and wiser. When Nefertiti was born, I solemnly swore to commingle our family with the kings of Egypt. Today's marriage is the first step. Oh, my dear brother, you make me very proud. Nefertiti will bear children, but that too is only a beginning. It is not enough. Now, what I'm about to say to you, 
I could only reveal to a brother. It must be a blood secret between us. Of course, of course. Akhenaten must die. Oh. Are you saying... Yes. You understand me. I am. When the time is right, he must eat poisoned food or drink his death. That would leave Queen Nefertiti a, a widow. What then? What would you say, brother, if your son Hornrab were then to marry Nefertiti? My son, the pharaoh of both Egypts, my son. Yes, Hornrab, your son. Today he was made a general. He has always been brave and strong. Brother I, we are embarking upon a perilous course. But the rewards at the end of the journey are infinite. The gods will honor us. I shall guard your secret, brother. It is no longer mine alone. It is ours. It was only some time later I learned of the plot upon the life of my husband. What was it? Fate? The gods? They have often said of me that my name Nefertiti meant... The beautiful. Those who knew me best said it meant the revengeful. No, the pharaoh and his queen did not live happily ever after. Theirs was an exciting and precarious existence, with enemies abroad and at home. Akhenaten and Nefertiti, 1,400 years before Christ, defied the temple priests, the holy men and the old superstitions and almost paid for their modern ideas with their lives. I shall be back shortly with a postscript. Today we have brought you with all the accuracy that history provides the first chapters of the lives of two of the youngest monarchs ever to rule great ancient Egypt. And being young and restless, distrustful of the old ways, they live to turn superstition into religion and the power of the few into glory for the many. This has been one part of a true continuing account we shall bring you over the next several days. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Russell Horton, E.V. Juster, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now a preview of the next exciting drama in our five-part anthology of Egypt's Golden Age. Nothing but silence. Gods, all of you, listen to your son, Akhenaten. There is no fierceness in me. I cannot order the lash. I cannot be cruel. I love Egypt, but I am not of the metal to whip her, to chain her. Me. Tell me, am I strong enough to lead Egypt? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. 
I'm E.G. Marshall. The sound of our door is not unlike what greeted the ear of the famous archaeologist Howard Carter when he opened the door of Pharaoh Tutankhamun's tomb. It was like opening a Pandora's box, following in his footsteps into Egypt's Valley of the Kings and unleashing truth chained to the past. This is one of those stories, a fascinating, human, and often tragic account of an extraordinary people who are suddenly discovered and born again, the ancient Egyptians. It is all a lie. There are no gods, no ancestors to guide the Pharaoh. You are not holy. All you are are statues of stone. It is false, all false. If indeed you can hear my voice, I, Heknaten, supreme ruler of the kingdoms of Egypt, Lord of the Delta and the Nile Valleys, I command you, gods of the past, to answer me. Answer me! Our drama, To Kill a Pharaoh, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Tammy Grimes. I'll be with Act One. There is today in a Berlin museum a life-sized plaster portrait of an extraordinarily beautiful girl. Even by the standards of today, the face of this young woman who lived 1,400 years before Christ is a miracle of balance. Her name was Nefertiti, which translated from ancient Egyptian means, Behold, the beautiful woman. But her beauty was more than skin deep. Nefertiti had spirit, decisiveness, and was in every sense a modern woman. But let her continue with her own story. I hate it when people say, Nefertiti, oh, that means, behold, the beautiful woman. As if that's all I am. Today I'm married, and this is supposed to be my wedding night. But it's not to be spent like everyone else. Because my husband is the king of all Egypt, and his first duty is to go underground into some big limestone caves to pray to his ancestors. Ancestors, I ask you. Half a mile of 30-foot-high stone statues. Nefertiti, every newly crowned pharaoh for dozens of dynasties has gone alone into the Holy of Holies to pray and to learn how to rule. One can learn that in a cave? I... I hope so. How long must you stay down there? My father, when he became pharaoh, remained in the sepulcher 50 hours. I, I must go now. When the bell sounds, I must be ready. Is it dangerous? I have no idea what I shall see or what I shall do. Take care, my love. I feel as if I'm about to enter another world. That is the signal, isn't it, brother? It is. Our new pharaoh is descending the stone steps with the high priest this very moment. Is it true, brother I, that down there he will be inspired enough to become a ruler? That is what generations of pharaohs have found. Akhenaten is a weakling. I've watched him since he was a boy, always frightened of animals. I didn't know that. I told no one, not even you, my brother. Birds, snakes would throw Akhenaten into a fit. It was a secret his mother and I were sworn to keep. That the young man who would inherit the throne of Egypt was afraid of his own shadow. Oh, but surely he must have outgrown such foolishness. Ah, weakness in the blood is never outgrown. This defect is dangerous to our lives. But, but how, how so? Suppose Egypt were attacked. This king would run from battle. The sooner we're rid of him, the better. Oh, our religion forbids murder. Who said the word murder? A king, like any of us, could die accidentally. Who would know? The gods would know. They would also know that Akhenaten's death was only for the good of Egypt. We would be forgiven. How 
much further down must we go, High Priest? We are almost at the bronze door, O Pharaoh. And then? And then I shall open it and give you this torch to carry into the tomb of the beyond to light your way. I am to go into the tomb alone? It is so written. What shall I find there? The tomb of the beyond contains great statues of all your ancestors. They have joined Osiris, Isis, and Hathor in the pantheon of the gods. This is the place. This is the bronze door. May I hand you the torch, O Pharaoh, and by the sacred powers vested in me, I shall open the door. May Osiris and Horus speed you on your way. Oh, the steps below are very steep. Once you have passed this threshold, I shall close the door behind you. Close it? But, but when my prayers are, are done, will, will, will you open it for me? When you have spoken to the gods and they have answered, you have but to knock, so... And I shall know your vigil is over. I shall be here. Be sure that you remain right, right here. I shall not fail you, O Pharaoh. My turn, Queen Nefertiti. You're very good at this game. But it's hard for me to just sit here with you, Mariani, and play this game of Senate when my husband is down there in the tomb of the beyond. Six, eight. I have a second turn. Did you hear what I said? I did, Queen Nefertiti. But all Egyptian queens have had to await their pharaoh's return from the Holy of Holies. What is the time? In one hour, it will be dawn. Dawn of my wedding night. Why does Magnat come back? Mariani. What does this mysterious holy of holies look like? Only a pharaoh ever sees it. But they say it's a vast, long, wide tunnel cut out of limestone a thousand years ago by Tutmos the First. He who dug the first burial place in the Valley of the Kings? The same. Would you like me to bring you some food to break your fast? Breakfast. After that enormous wedding feast last night, I'd be sick. You'd be sick. I guess you would be. Mariani, what's the matter? What is it? He would not understand. I should not invade your day. Not today of all days, with my thoughts. Now, you stop that. I want you to go home, Mariani. You've been up all night, and that's enough. And on your way, I gave orders that a large basket of food is ready in the kitchen for you to take with you. I shouldn't behave like this, I know. But all yesterday evening, at the coronation and wedding banquet... Seeing all that food, so much wasted, thrown away. And everyone I know where we live, says we're blinders. Mariani, I promise you that will all change. Who knows what a queen can do if she puts her mind to it? Now, there, you see? Something good has come from your tears. You have quite made me forget my anxiety over Akhenaten. Where are you, gods? Where are you, father? Grandfather? Great-grandfather? I have been on my knees for many hours praying. Praying to you. Answer me. Answer me. Answer me! Horus! Nekhabit! Anubis! I call you from the depths of my aloneness. I kneel at the feet of your great statues. Speak! If you have tongues, make me hear. I am a pharaoh now. But I feel no differently from the time I was a child of a pharaoh. Enlighten me. Teach me. Teach me. Please. Please make me understand what I must do to rule Egypt. Mother Ty, I'm so glad you came. Where is Akhenaten? Have you seen him? 
He'd be more likely to return to his bride than his mother. But it's hours past on. I'm afraid. I know my husband. He cannot stand to be in an enclosed space. And in a tomb with reminders of death. What good is this vigil? Never, Titi. Where do you think a young pharaoh learns the conduct of state? Only our ancestors and the gods know. That is why Akhenaten must pray alone. And pray to them. Silence. Nothing but silence. Gods, all of you, listen to your son, Akhenaten. There is no fierceness in me. I cannot order the lash. I cannot be cruel. I love Egypt, but I am not of the metal to whip her, to chain her. Guide me. Tell me, am I strong enough to lead Egypt? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Not a moment longer. Where are you going? I don't know, but I have this feeling he's in some danger. Which is the way, Mother Ty? Tell me where it is. I don't know the way there. Then I shall find out. No, Nefertiti, you mustn't. If a queen joins a king while he is praying, it would be sacrilege. All very well for you to say. I shall take the palace guards. Someone will know the way. Queen Nefertiti. My priest, I want you to open this bronze door. Oh, I cannot, my queen. You cannot? You mean you will not? It is forbidden. And I, your queen, forbid you to disobey me. The gods will strike me dead. You have a choice. Death by the gods or by my soldiers. I beg you to understand. No one may enter the holy of holies. Stand aside, I command you. It is the sin of sins. You will not move then. I cannot. I must guard this door with my life. So be it. Guards, run him through. No. No. I cannot disobey you. I shall open. No one. No one. Not one word. Nothing but broken and fallen statues and dust and... It is all a lie. Forty pharaohs have prayed here under the earth. It was their wishes, their imaginations that put words into their ears. Oh, gods, that it should fall to me to discover there is nothing. No gods. Only statues of stone. For the last time, I order you to speak. I... Akhenaten, supreme ruler of the two Egypts, the Delta and the Nile Valleys, command you, if you are there, answer me! Answer me! landslides and cracked stone. In the confined tomb, Akhenaten shouting shattered statues, burying the newly crowned pharaoh in limestone, sandstone, and rubble. A thousand yards away, his young wife, Nefertiti, has opened the bronze door to the sepulcher to be met with billows of dust and sand and an echoing roar. I shall return shortly with Act Two. In an underground, mile-long chamber filled with 30-foot-high stone statues of pharaohs of the past, a young man destined to be supreme ruler of Egypt lies on the ground, fighting to breathe under broken stone and sand and dust. Have the Egyptian gods decreed he must die? In a far-off doorway stands his queen, Nefertiti. You 
wish to enter Queen Nefertiti. Something terrible is happening down there. I know it. All one can see is dust rising. Take a torch and come with me. Akhenaten! Akhenaten! Prime Minister, your daughter has gone into the holy place. What? Why? I could not stop her. She refused to wait any longer for Akhenaten's return. Who knows about this? She took some palace guards with her. No one else. Except the high priest who guards the bronze door. I want to follow her. No, wait a moment. No one but the guards and the high priest have seen her. If you and I go there, the sin will be compounded. When Nefertiti returns, I shall have a quiet word with the high priest and the guards. Please, I... I ask you as an old friend. Go yourself and find out what you can. But cautiously. What if the priest should talk? What if they are not silent? Then their tongues will have to be made so. Permanently. High priest, I could not find him. You must trust in our gods. The cavern is very deep. Our pharaoh is there. I took your torch and searched as far as I had dared. There are fallen statues everywhere. Queen Nefertiti, I have been looking for you. Father, I'm so glad you're here. Something terrible has happened in the sepulchre. Not an hour ago, there was a very loud noise, like an underground landslide. And so you I... You had best return to your chambers up above. But how can I leave? Akhenaten is in there somewhere. I may never see him alive again. Please, you must go in after him. That door is only open to a pharaoh. I was in there. Perhaps you were imagining things, my child. Your concern for the pharaoh has made you imagine you went inside. Your love for him is so strong you believe you actually went through the bronze door. But I did. I did. No, child, you couldn't have. The high priest would never have permitted it. I forced him to, Father. High priest, tell the prime minister. Didn't you give me a torch and see me enter the sepulchre? I saw nothing, my queen. What? Come, daughter. Come with me. My father, the prime minister, led me back to my chambers. He refused to believe I had entered the sacred caverns. Hours went by. It became noon, afternoon, then evening. The moon rose and... Unknown to me at the time, high in the Theban hills, something incredible was happening. You there. What are you doing? Now, don't think I can't see you. The moon is very bright. You, you beggar. Where did you come from? Haton the sun. Thou who didst create the world according to thy desire. Do you hear me? Get off your knees, beggar. Look at you, clothes torn, hands and face... Thy rays, O God of the sun, suckle every meadow. When thou risest, all things live and grow for thee. Beggar, I warn you, you're trespassing in the royal pomegranate grove. How did you get here? Good shepherd, I came up from the earth. From the earth? From that place there, that hole... I have crawled and crawled under the ground with Aton, the sun god, showing me the way. You expect me to believe that? I advise you, look sharp and go away. Oh, oh, here comes one of the queen's handmaidens. She lives in a cottage near mine. Don't frighten my sheep. Good evening and blessings, shepherd. The gods be with you this evening, Mariani. I have been cursed with this ruffian who crawled up out of the ground... Look at him there on his knees. Stranger, are you... You look very much like someone I know. Mariani. Oh, the Pharaoh. How is it possible? I could not sleep. Outside, clouds hid the moon. In the dark, I found myself going down to the fish pool in the palace courtyard. Then suddenly... The clouds passed. The moon shone brightly. And I knew there was nothing to fear. 
I sat on a stone seat. I knew Akhenat would come. Nefertiti. Nefertiti. Oh, my husband. What happened to you? Mariani. The pharaoh appeared in the hills in the pomegranate grove. In the hill of Thebes? I shall explain. Let me sit a moment by the fountain. I brought the pharaoh back myself. I did not want anyone to see him like this. The wonder of it is no one looked at me twice. All they saw, I suppose, was a ragged man smeared with dirt. They didn't recognize me. Oh, Mariani, how can I thank you enough? I must go home now. My sisters will be worried. Here, this purse of gold coins. Take it. I insist. I shall never be able to repay you. I thank you also, Mariani. You may leave us. Good night. The gods be with you. The gods, she said. Oh, if you only knew. Rest yourself. Stay here beside the pool, my king. I shall all know soon. Your poor face and hands are so. Your feet are bleeding. Let me bathe your wounds. Oh, I'm not hurt. I'm not tired. I'm, I'm exhilarated. Do you wish to tell me about it? Hours and hours I was at prayer in that tomb. But nothing happened. No gods answered. No words from the past. I I, I shouted. I screamed. I, I, I cursed. And then... Then I, I don't know. Something must have fallen on me. Yes. There's a cut on your head. Let me kiss. And then, when I awoke, my torch had gone out. All was black. I was buried under sand and stone. And the way I had entered the sepulcher, behind me was a mountain of broken statues. I was entombed. Don't tell me any more if it tires you. The air was so close I could hardly breathe. And then, I made a vow. I took a solemn oath with all my spirit. I promised by everything sacred that whichever God came to my rescue, to that one God... I would give all my faith and my love. So all our great gods heard you and freed you? No. No, never, Didi. Not all. Only one god. As I lay there underground, I saw far off a light, a, a, a golden sliver of light far away at the end of a long tunnel. It beckoned me. I crawled toward it. Always that light. I dragged myself toward it. Hours went by, but I kept crawling. As I got closer... The white light turned red, and, and then I knew what it was. Atan, the sun sinking behind the hills. Atan had shown me the way out of the tomb, and he was now going to sleep. Atan, the, the sun saved my life. Darling, we have talked enough. You've been too many hours without rest. Let us go inside. Oh, I have much to do. Tomorrow, Atan, the sun, will be proclaimed the only god of Egypt. We have all of us been in darkness too long. Pharaoh Akhenaten, to what do I owe the honor of this early morning visit? I have come to ask your advice, Prime Minister, how best to inform the country that from today on we shall worship but one god, Aton the sun. Temples will be built in his honor and word will be sent far and wide. I have discovered how useless are our many gods and I must make this known. With all my heart, I believe there is only one god. Uh, may I suggest, your royal highness, to go first and persuade your mother, Queen Tai. If the queen mother agrees with your beliefs, so will much of Egypt. Mother, we have been worshipping stones, animals, and dreams. I am not saying there is anything wrong with the sun god. He belongs in the family of gods. There is only one god. You have always had mad ideas, Atnat. <sighs> what if you cannot make people change their religion? I shall have to persuade them. How can you, son, if you cannot persuade me, your own mother? Of course I believe in Aton. But I don't believe he can do everything. Who would a mother pray to if you took away a nutet? Protectors of childbirth. Who would love us and treat if you did away with Hathor? Childish superstitions, Mother. It's unrealistic, Akhenaten. And no way to begin your reign. No, Akhenaten. I wouldn't say it's unrealistic. At least someone agrees with me. But I'm afraid persuasion won't do it. The only way to get people to do anything or believe anything is to tell them they have to. Give them no alternative. I couldn't. Make them believe what you wish them to believe. I know that's the old Egyptian way, how we conquered countries and people, but I cannot. I must make them see the light, educate them. Yes, see the light, as I did. If you rely on reason, people will do nothing. 
It's easier for them to stay with the old beliefs than try the new. Crack the whip and people will jump. Speak in a soft voice and they can't hear you. You spoke of the old Egyptian way. Do you think we won Nubia, Syria, all Egypt's possession with reason or with force? I'm looking to tomorrow, Nefertiti, not yesterday. And are not all these lands better off under Egypt's protection? The average man does not know what is good for him. He never did. If one god is what you want, Akhenaten, don't ask. Order. It may seem strange to those of us living in this century that belief in a god or the hereafter was so important in ancient days. Don't forget, wars have been fought over religion. Eight crusades launched against the infidel. For centuries, Puritan was at the throat of heretic. Why, in the 1200s, thousands died in battle over the theological argument of how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. I shall return shortly with Act Three. What began as a childish fear and dislike of animals has in the young pharaoh become a full-blown protest against a heritage of grotesque gods, part human, part beast. Some 2,000 divinities whom the ancient Egyptian trusted to protect him in every aspect of his life. How to convince a man who felt if you changed your god, it might seal your fate. And so, each day in the weeks that followed, a royal couple disguised themselves and went into the streets of Thebes. Friends! A moment of your time! Who is that? Well, some nobleman who comes here every afternoon to preach. You suppose that's his wife in that chariot? Her face is hidden, but that dress is gauze from Giza. I'll bet you... Friends! Egyptians, gather around me and listen! It will cost you nothing and could be worth everything. I'd say he's some kind of a fanatic. He doesn't speak plainly. I wonder who he is. I, I, I don't understand what he's talking about. Let me give you an example, friends. Every year, why do we pray to the spirit of Osiris? Tell me. Speak out, friends. Is there no Egyptian who will tell me? I'll tell you why you pray to Osiris. Because we need the Nile to flood and carry rich soil to the farms. So we pray, and every year the Nile floods, and we are rewarded with good crops and plentiful food. Oh, I have to go back to my shop. I know what he's going to say. One God is all we need. One God is all the... But how do we know the Nile would not flood without our prayers? I say, let us find out. Let us all gather here tomorrow and pray to Osiris. Then let us gather here a week from today and pray again to Osiris to flood the Nile. Is there a farmer here who wouldn't like an extra crop? Huh, I told you he'd say something foolish. Who wants to plant fruits and corn this time of year? Let us see whether Osiris raises the Nile. Let us not wait until the spring when we know the Nile always floods. Stop and think about that. Some people just love to stand on a box and talk and stir up things, don't they? What brings you here, brother? <laughs> the pharaoh. Explain yourself. I was in the marketplace yesterday, the first time in months, and there was this preacher. I was told he's been going about among the people and preaching one God. Another fool. Fool? It is our Pharaoh, Akhenaten, in disguise. In the city? In Thebes? Yes, yes, I'm sure of it. After all the ordinary Egyptian, how many would know his highness by sight? Preaching in the marketplace. And the queen goes with him. Nefertiti? My daughter? Oh, yes. I saw her sitting back in her covered chariot not far from where the pharaoh was haranguing the crowd. And you say, brother, no one recognizes him? No one. But how could they? His entire life is hidden behind palace walls. And his disguise was very good. Even I was fooled. So he preaches flat on the sun god, does he? Madness. I never thought he would take to the streets. It is peculiar. He is far worse than that. I believe Akhenaten is insane. Oh, no, you can't mean that. If we do not act quickly, he will undermine all that Egypt has been for 17 dynasties. You... 
You believe so? If the Syrians or the Nubians or the Hittites learn a madman wears our crown, they would annihilate us. What can be done? I said once to you, I wished Akhenaten dead because he was too weak to rule Egypt. Now I am equally certain he is too mad. I told you he must die. And your son, Hornrab, now the general of the armies, should marry my daughter, Queen Nefertiti. Now, there would be a match. Together they would rule with strength. I said to you, we must wait for the right time, and that time is now. Are you with me in this? Yes. I would rather sew a shirt than a shroud. I am honored you came this evening, O oh Pharaoh. I should be by the side of my queen, but I... I understand the affairs of state. Now, why did you wish to see me, Prime Minister? What's the problem? Do you remember not so many moons ago you asked my advice? Yes. Yes, how to make my people believe in Aten, the sun god. Yes, I remember, but you had nothing to tell me. Uh, that's true. But your faith in my advice is joined by my faith in yours. I need your advice. Of course, anything. Uh, first, will you join me in a beaker of pomegranate wine? Certainly. I've already poured it. Uh, that is yours, and this is mine. To what shall we drink? To Egypt. May she live a million, million years. Let us empty our cups at one long swallow. By all means. Oh, it's a good wine. Oh. Ooh, uh, so much at one gulp. Makes me feel a little giddy. Uh, now as to the advice I need. Uh, come with me, O Pharaoh, to this part of my room. This curtain hangs across my bed. Aye. What is that on your bed? A gold coffin, my king, that I've had made for myself. Fritz, my dear, I, you're not an old man. You live yet for many years. Why are you thinking of death and burial? I have been plagued by a dream that my hour is near. I intend to sleep in that coffin every night until it is my last. I'll show you how comfortable it is, how well I can lie down in it. I will not have this I as your pharaoh. I command you to put this aside. <laughs> what a gruesome idea. Are you sure your objection to this coffin is not the superstition in you? Remember, Akhenaten, how you fainted at your father's funeral and I had to lead you out of the room? I am different now. Ah, you may say you are. But I'm certain you would not dare lie down in my coffin to prove it to me. If that will prove to you I am not superstitious, I certainly will. Here, help me up upon your bed. Yes. Now, I am inside your coffin. Is that enough proof for you? Lie down. All right. There. I am convinced... I'm glad you were honest with me, my pharaoh. May I help you out? Uh, in a moment. Uh, suddenly I'm overcome with fatigue. Uh, suddenly I'm overcome with fatigue. Uh, let me lie in here a moment and close my eyes. You can come in now. Is the pharaoh inside the coffin? Yes. The potion I placed in his wine has taken effect. Help me close the lid. Oh, I, I am shaking with fright. Supposing the king awakens and cries out. It is a powerful drug. He will not. And in time, there will be no more air for him to breathe inside the coffin, and he shall be no more. I am afraid, brother. It is a monstrous deed. To kill a man without cause is unlawful. But to kill a king... Is the greatest sin of all. We have cause enough to save Egypt. What now? We wait quietly until everyone in the palace is fast asleep. Then you and I shall carry the coffin outside to my chariot. Where do we take it? To the top of Mount Oman. There I shall bind the coffin to the chariot, unrein the horses... And you and I together will plunge the chariot over the cliff 
into the Nile. Oh, I'm feeling much better now, Nefertiti. It was good of you, child, to spend these late hours with your mother-in-law. Well, I have told you very often, I will always regard you as my own mother. Of course. Yes. That's what it is. What is? What made me so upset and feverish tonight? I had the same sensation when my dear husband was dying. That entire week before he took to his bed, I had this strange premonition of death. You're a long way from that, dearest Queen Kai. Perhaps. But perhaps someone dear to me is not. However, the presentment has passed for the moment. So I want you to go back to your own bed. Osnaten will be worried. You know, he has changed a great deal since he married you, Nefertiti. Yes. I love him for that. He is quite serious now. And dedicated. And so are you, child. I can remember not so many moons ago when you were but a princess. And the love of your life was your kitten, Mew Mew. <laughs> I still love Mew Mew. Mm. Well, tell my son not to be concerned about me. I hope he's back from his meeting with the Prime Minister. It's very late. It's not going well, is it? What? I know what you're doing. Your disguises don't blind me. You and Akhnaten are preaching in the streets. And people are not listening, are they? part of the palace was across the courtyard from mine. It was very late as I came out the door. The only lights were the four torches burning on each corner of the lotus pool. A chariot pulled away from the prime minister's doorway very quickly. Then I saw my cat, Mew Mew. The chariot seemed to be heading straight for him. Stop! Stop! You mad woman! You made me run my chariot straight into a wall. You could have killed us all. Who are you, woman? Woman? I'm your queen, Nefertiti. Why, it's you, father. Uh, and the court tailor. Didn't you see my cat? You almost ran it down. Uh, my foot, it's caught under the carpet. Uh, Nefertiti, go home. Go home this instant. You were talking to your queen, father, not some child. What is this coffin you were taking out of the courtyard? Help me, help me push this from my foot. Only some servant I'm taking to the burial grounds. At this time of night. I'm sorry your chariot is all broken. But let me help, Father. And we'll pull the coffin from the poor tailor's foot. No, no, no. I can take care of this by myself. What's this? The lid of the coffin is cracked. It's opening. Father, the person inside the coffin isn't dead. He's pushing up the lid. I cannot. Husband. What does this mean? I cannot. The sun is up. We must rise also. Oh. Oh, what day is it? Oh, yes. Yes, I remember. I wish today had never come. We must steal ourselves. All week long, I've not understood it. That the Prime Minister would have a hand in killing a pharaoh. I keep asking myself, was it all a mistake? Did your father and his brother really believe I'd suddenly died? But how could it have been a mistake? The pomegranate wine poisoned? Their haste in rushing out with the coffin? You in it? Oh, and I'll spare us. That is the signal. I pray for my father's everlasting spirit and my uncle's. Oh, never tell you. That a man so highly placed, so trusted, should have been so evil. We must be strong and remember him only for the good deeds. Oh, it is done. Their bodies are destroyed. As they would have destroyed yours, Akhenaten. You're right. We must go on. Oh, I feel I've aged a hundred years in a hundred minutes. Instead of being afraid of animals and birds, now I fear the nature of man. Is man at heart so evil? Oh, I must not believe that. I don't want to. I swear to you, my wife, I shall dedicate this reign, my life, to finding out, to proving to myself, to all of us, that man is fundamentally good. 
Aton, God of the Sun, soul and only God, help us find the truth. And so began the first year of our reign. Akhenaten and I had taken upon ourselves a heavy burden. He, to prove man was good and God was one. I, Nefertiti, daughter of a shamed father, was far from certain. Now I began to fear the shadows and what might be lurking behind them. What? And who? I wanted also to be a mother. The line of kings must continue. But this world of ours, was it the kind of world into which to bring a child? Nefertiti, a face known to all of us, but whose life up to now has been hidden from us, voices the same fears of the unknown many do today. And yet she did not realize how determined she was, how strong her character. Egypt would bow before her like no other queen in history. I shall return shortly. We have tried to bring to life those whose lives have long been figures of mystery and legend. Nefertiti and her pharaoh, Akhenaten. Open the tombs, unbind the linens, and unshroud the mummies. And there are lifetimes of intrigue tragedy and excitement. For these two were the greatest influence on ancient Egypt of any two monarchs before or since. Join us next time when we continue this fascinating true account. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, E.V. Juster, Russell Horton, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now a preview of the next exciting drama in our five-part anthology of Egypt's Golden Age, starring Tammy Grimes. I know the Hittites. I'm sorry you have no faith in my judgment. But if it was your intention to stop this visit of the prince, I hereby order you not to. That is your pharaoh's wish. Now, I shall leave you. I see another campfire further up the hill. There are more that I need to talk to. Wait for me here, Nefertiti. Is it true what you say, Hornrod? That we should fear for our lives? I am sorry the great Pharaoh puts more trust in prayers than swords. I know what I must do. Stop the Hittite prince from his march on Thebes? No question. It is the only way. Hornrod, dear friend, you're taking your life in your hands by disobeying Akhenat. Uh, that is my decision. I would rather die on the field of battle than be ambushed by the Hittites at home in bed. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. If you've been listening, you will have heard the first chapters of one of the great eras of history, the Golden Age of Egypt. Today, another look at the beautiful and willful Queen Nefertiti and her inspired pharaoh, Akhenaten. Both monarchs, 1400 years B.C. Both rebelled against the superstition that everything you did was watched over by a separate god. The farmer had his, the sailor another, the mother prayed to her god, all save the sickly and the poor. Not a single Egyptian god protected them. General Horanrab, what brings the general of my army here? Noble Pharaoh, my scouts report that the son of the Hittite king has set out for Egypt with an armed escort. We shall welcome him with open arms. That would be a mistake. He is planning to take over your throne. Oh. That is not possible. The, the prince is our friend. You have no friends, O Pharaoh. 
only enemies. Our drama, The Cobra Strikes, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Tammy Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Nefertiti, queen during the golden age of Egypt, has been an enigma to scholars for hundreds of years. But she did live and love, and with Akhenaten, her young husband, tried to turn the minds of Egyptians around. This world of the golden past has recently been visiting museums in American cities. Overnight, we have become aware of its wealth and pomp and mysterious rituals. Let the queen take you back to those days. The most tragic day of my life was the day my own father had to be put to death for plotting to kill my husband, the pharaoh. My father, the prime minister, was not the only one who thought Akhenaten weak and unable to rule. What no one understood was he believed in persuasion, not persecution. And so the two of us traveled from Thebes to Luxor to speak to the people face to face and tell them that they were being deceived. Husband, it's getting dark. Let us return to the palace. Oh, Nefertiti, I'm talked out. I've been preaching and exhorting my people to forget the false gods. They won't listen. Shall we go home? Oh, oh you take the reins. I'm too tired. Oh! You know what I think? We're making a mistake. In fact, two of them. First, we're begging the people to listen. You are the pharaoh. A pharaoh doesn't beg his subjects. He commands. Issue a decree. Tear down the old beliefs. I cannot order all the temples to be destroyed without giving my people an alternative. You're giving them an alternative. One god. Aton, god of the sun. But I haven't convinced them. Words won't do it. I think I know why so few people believe in your one God. You do? They see their King Akhenaten and their Queen Nefertiti speaking in the marketplaces. And they can't understand what their ruler is doing there. To them, there is only one explanation. You must be mad. And I must be mad also. Yes. Yes, they won't accept a king who walks the streets with them. I, uh, I think there's a way. Become one of the common people. We disguise ourselves from head to foot and then walk into the hills behind Thebes and sit with them. Yes, yes. Start by convincing the beggars, the, the blind, all of those who live up there. Exactly. The abandoned people, too old or too sick to work. The homeless. Do you think these outcasts would believe in the one God? What have they got to lose by listening or believing? They have nothing. We're back in the palace courtyard. What do you say to my plan? Persuade the army of nobodies. Hmm. Yes, I, I think we should try. It would be a beginning. And if I can persuade them, others would follow. An hour ago, I was exhausted and I despaired. You've given me the spirit to go on trying. Akhenaten and I found some ragged clothes and dirty, much-used sandals. One night, we walked many miles into the hills... And they sprang to life with dozens of little fires around which the blind, the old, the infirm, the rejected sat to warm themselves. Have I seen you at this fire before, brother? No, you have not. Uh, is that young man your brother? Yes, I am. Under what name do you pass? Akhenaten. Oh, like the pharaoh himself. Friends! Are you aware that we are honored with a distinguished visitor this night? This is Brother Akhenaten. <laughs> Sister Clipper, raise your crutch and salute to Brother Akhenaten. <laughs> Never heard of him. Who is he, Brother Beggar? Oh, idiot. Your mind is as weak as your foot. Don't you know that name? The same as the Pharaohs. Uh, Brother Akhenaten, you are both welcome. This is a privilege. With a name like that, you should be king. 
king of the camel dung beggars. Why should he be king? What's he done for us? Well, what has any king done for us? But we live on the deaf, the mute, the sick, the poor. <laughs> we live on. Hmm. Old Amen Hotep is dead, they say. And his son is king. What's his name? If you would listen, Sister Cripple, you would know. Achenaton is his name, and also the name of this Nita dear. <laughs> and he is going to tell us how he became king. <laughs> Aren't you, brother? <laughs> you, you are all laughing and joking sitting around this fire. Is no one serious here? Oh, 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 oh. life is serious. <laughs> if we don't laugh at it, brother Achenaton, it makes fun of us. Life makes a joke of us beggars. <laughs> life makes us die. Yes. I watched them bury the pharaoh Amenhotep. They didn't see me. Did I ever tell you? Uh, we've heard your stories before. Uh, but how about you, brother? Uh, tell us of your travels. But I was there. I saw the funeral. I don't know that what I have to say is what you want to hear. Of course it is. Go on, speak to them. Oh, tell a story. Make a speech. Oh, king. <laughs> they buried old Amenhotep in three layers of solid gold. I was there. I watched Gold as thick as your hand, and jars of ointments and boxes of food for the dead pharaoh to eat on the long journey to eternal rest. And then I buried my father in the desert. But I didn't bury him deep enough, so he never ate in eternity. The desert jackals found his body and made a meal of him. Now, is that just? Is that a religion worth believing in? That only the man of property or position can afford life after death? That only a nobleman is buried in anointed linens and laid to rest in a golden tomb? And all the others, like you, you have to take your chances in the desert. Uh, that was a good speech. Let my brother go on. He isn't finished. I was lost. And Aton, the sun, found me. How were you lost? I was made to descend into the bowels of the earth, and I, I could not find my way out. And then I saw a light. It was Aton, the sun god, showing me how to escape. I followed his rays, and I shall always follow. I say to you, if you believe in this one god, he will comfort you. He will rescue you. Why live like this? Why lurk in the darkness? Outcast! He asks too many questions. Let us all walk into the light. Look to the glorious eye, the sun, and be free. Get him out of here. He isn't funny. Hey, Brother Akhenaton, you'd better sit down or go away. Brother, stop now. Please. No, friends, there is nothing funny about starvation, about poverty. If the gods are so just and so powerful, why are you poor and sick and homeless? I'll tell you. Because those old gods have no strength. They are feeble, nothing. Stone statues in the dark. Only Aton, the god of the sun, can help. Ah! Who threw that stone? Someone threw a stone at my brother. Well, I warned you, brother. We don't want to hear any more. Friends, I, I am your king. P pray, pray with me at dawn. Aton will protect us all forever. No but... more preaching. Here's a stone for your pain. <laughs> Akhenaten, we must leave here. They don't wish to listen. We must go. Hurry! And don't come back! What's that? Uh, a jackal roaming the hills looking for something to eat. I know prayer to the sun god would make life easier. Even for them. Oh, if only I could convince them. Before I've even been on the throne one year, I'm a failure. Because no one believes you or pays attention. A stone wall of ignorance. How does one go around it? What keeps us here in Thebes, husband? Responsibility. I'm thinking. A pharaoh must set the example. He must show the way. I know that. If I were the sun god, and my subjects were spurned in the old cities, I, Aton, would say, Akhenaten, build me a new place where I can be worshipped in peace. A new place. My great-great-grandfather built the temple at Karnak. I could... I could build a new temple to Aton. Set the example. And Egypt will clamor at our gates. Build not only a temple, but a city. A new place. A new city. I want a child, Akhenaten. I want it to be born where he belongs. Where he is welcome. 
a firstborn. My wife, my precious golden what? Salutations to your majesty. Oh, get General Horanrab, what brings you here? Necessity. I set out yesterday at dawn to find you. Now, let me not waste a moment. My scouts have reported that the son of the Hittite king, Prince Ananza, has set out for Egypt with an armed escort. We shall welcome him with open arms. I said armed escort. Thousands of soldiers. It doesn't sound like a peaceful visit. Uh, my thoughts exactly, my lady. What are you saying? That there is a plot to put this foreign prince on the throne of Egypt. Oh, I cannot believe that. The prince and his father are our friends. You have no friends, Pharaoh. Only enemies. I know the Hittites. I'm sorry you have no faith in my judgment. But if it was your end, I need to talk to... Wait for me here, Nefertiti. Is it true what you say, Hornrod? That we should fear for our lives? I am sorry the great Pharaoh puts more trust in prayers than swords. I know what I must do. Stop the Hittite prince from his march on Thebes? No question. It is the only way. Hornrod, dear friend... You're taking your life in your hands by disobeying Akhenat. Uh, that is my decision. I would rather die on the field of battle than be ambushed by the Hittites at home in bed. Akhenaten has led, has led too much of a, a protected life. He knows little and cares less for war. But this time, Egypt deserves more of me than blind obedience. Egypt in that golden age was always prey to invasion from a neighboring state. Those, like the Egyptians, who have unlimited gold, have to this day had to be on the alert. Then, too, both Nefertiti and Akhenaten were too young and inexperienced to understand how to rule over the two Egypts bearing two symbols, the south, the vulture, and the north, the cobra. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Fantastic people speaking from the past. How much of what they began is part of our lives today? Let me tell you, the 12-month calendar is an Egyptian invention, as are the 365 days. Those five extra days at the end of the year were celebrated as birthdays of the gods. Ethical values, or laws as we call them, the alphabet, and great architecture, sculpture, and painting all began in Egypt. Particularly, a beautiful head of a queen fashioned and colored from life. The head of Nefertiti. That night, as I stood on the edge of the Nile with a man not much older than myself, General Horenrath, I remembered we had been children together. Even then, I played being soldier, and he was the general. He'd grown up, become a warrior, and the day I became queen, Horan Rav was made a real general. He said goodbye to me and returned to his headquarters in Memphis. My commanders, our aim, as always, is the protection of Egypt. Our enemy, as I believe you all know, is an army of Hittites advancing upon our borders. Now, our plan is to intercept them with a lightning strike by fast chariots in open country. General, may I suggest... Yes, certainly, Commander Hori. In Cobra Squadron 1, I have 200 archers trained to fire accurately from a moving chariot. We could approach the Hittite at a fast pace, then wheel quickly, passing alongside their troops, fire our arrows, and then retreat. Good, good. Uh, Commander Templer, how many in Squadron Cobra 2 can fire at a target from a moving chariot? 300, I'd say, General. Mm. Excellent. 500. Each man will carry enough arrows in his chariot, enabling him to make three separate passes at the enemy. I'd like to suggest that uh, my men proceed Commander Horry's... Oh, no, just a moment, Templar. This is too serious a matter for bickering and squabbles. Now, Horry will go first, then Templar. Our main object, I will tell you, the Hittite prince, Zananza himself. Now, instruct each man in your squadron, the prince is the main target. Well, that will mean destroying some of his escort. I leave the details to you. Now, this is to be hit and run. Do you understand? Hit and run. I want the prince dead. The Hittites thrown into confusion and not one of our men taken alive. This is a secret operation. I don't quite understand, General. Not one of our soldiers must be captured and live to report, even under torture, that this was an officially planned action. 
Let the enemy believe they were ambushed by the Bedouins or bandits. Whatever they will. But not the Cobra Command of North Egypt. Would we not do better with a straight cavalry charge? I see you have not understood the general, Commander Hori. Uh, Close engagement always results in riders being brought down. The general wants to leave behind no prisoners. Understand? That's enough. Give no quarter, show no mercy, inspire your men to venom. The cobra's venom. The poison of our attack. It shall be our battle cry. The cobra strikes. Mariani, I have something vital to tell you. It affects my life. Akhenaten and I believe it will affect the very life of Egypt herself. And it will affect your life. Has it something to do with the days you both disappear from the palace and go into the hills? My husband and I have come to a decision. We have decided to build a new capital of Egypt. A new... But where? We don't know. We shall travel down the Nile to find a place. It may be very far from Thebes. A city where we can worship the one god out on the sun. A city not bent down with old ideas, where citizens can come and breathe freely and pray freely. A city of beauty and life. Mariani, I am asking you to take your little sisters and come with us. Is it to be for always? For always. This uh, new city, how can it be different from Luxor or Memphis or Thebes? There will be freedom. Freedom? What difference can it make to me? What difference will it make to poor people? Friends of mine who who live in the hills behind Thebes. In the city of truth, there will be no poor people. There will always be the poor. No fine tombs for the poor. No promise of eternal life. Only a nameless grave. Mariani, please put those thoughts aside. Come with us. I don't know what I would do without you. You don't believe me, do you? I have seen poverty and sickness. You haven't felt the sadness on the anniversary of your parents' death. To look for their graves, to bring flowers. And there is no trace in the desert of where they were buried. Yes, Nefertiti, I'll come with you. I would accompany you to the ends of the earth. I wish you hadn't talked to me about unmarked graves in the pool. Nefertiti. You wish to become a good queen. Then you must know that in truth there is sadness. And only if you know the truth can you become a good queen. I've been waiting for you, Templar. Come into my tent. Oh, I cannot remember the Sinai Desert ever being as hot as this. Uh. I've received word from my scouts that they've spotted Prince Sananza on the Sinai Desert near our frontier. Uh, His men, are they well armed? Battle doesn't seem to be on his mind at all. He stands high in his chariot, dressed in gold. What follows him? Two caravans containing gifts. And in front? His own bodyguards. So, the troops are well to the rear. Half a mile, I'd say. Hurry I have an idea. I know the general said my squadrons would strike after yours. What do you say we join up and send all of them down together? (sighs) Good idea. One sweep, we could wipe them out. One pass, and we disappear into the dust of the desert. They won't know what hit them. Welcome home to Memphis, my dear Templar, and you too, Hori. It's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, what have you been up to? What, what do you mean, General? Well, I uh, understand some foreign prince was attacked in the Sinai Desert. I uh, heard about that. Uh, there are spies everywhere. We may be watched. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, General, I uh, did hear a rumor... Too bad. A wonderful man, I understand, this prince. Uh, What did you say his name was? Uh, You know anything, Commander Hori? Well, um, a little. It seems the Hittites happened to be crossing the frontier in El Gahab. 
And what they thought was an Egyptian desert patrol turned out to be a band of archers. The prince himself fell under many arrows, and in the confusion, the attackers disappeared. Oh, so uh, nobody knows who they were? Nobody. Not a soul. Oh, terrible. Terrible. What a sad story. I believe the prince was a great friend of our pharaoh. He, he will be so distressed to hear this. I can't believe it. Messenger, get out of my sight before I lose my temper and you lose your head. Akhenaten. Get out! Akhenaten, husband, whatever is the matter? Oh, don't ask me. I've had a difficult enough day without this treachery. Treachery? Do you remember Horenrab asking me whether he could intercept the Hittite prince because he believed it was part of some plot to overthrow our throne? Yes, I seem to. Prince Ananza is dead. He's been ambushed in the Sinai on his way to Thebes. I, I have just received the second report. Cobra chariots. Oh, the disgrace of it. What will any foreigner think that he isn't safe on the Sinai because it belongs to Egypt? I've set for Horonab to explain. I know him. If anyone in the army is responsible, there'll be stiff punishments. I don't want revenge on the guilty. I want explanations. I cannot believe Horonab would deliberately disobey me. Yes, it is hard to believe, mighty uh, ruler, isn't it? Um, come in. Come into our chambers. So, you wonder about the death of Prince Zananza. I did also. Perhaps it was a band of Bedouins. Uh, yes, I thought that a possibility also at first, but it appears nothing was stolen. Two caravans of gifts are at this very moment standing in the desert, guarded, of course, right there where the Hittites left and ran away. No. No, it was not murder and thievery. I hold you responsible, General. And, and so you should, my king. It was an unfortunate mistake. A few days ago at Army Headquarters at Memphis, I investigated the entire incident. A mistake? Is that what you call it? Please, please, I beg you, hear me out. One of our Cobra squadrons exceeded their orders. They should have merely halted the prince and his men, examined their credentials, and then let them pass. But through an error in judgment, they attacked without warning. The uh, commander has been disciplined. Disciplined? How? Well, I posted him to a most desolate spot on the Asian frontier. Uh, Khufu, do you know of it? Is that all? Was that your only punishment to a commander who has brought such disgrace upon the name of Egypt? Uh, my queen, I am not a disciplinarian at heart. What? I suppose it's best. You, you showed him mercy. I did indeed. General, the queen and I are embarking upon a trip down the Nile in the new royal barge. I want you to accompany us. For what purpose? To guard your pharaoh and his queen. I understand. Am I excused? You are. Queen Nefertiti, royal king, good day. Why did you do that, Akhenaten? Do what? The Sinai general to do a corporal's work. There are plenty of palace guards. I have my reasons. You belittle him. Possibly. His explanation of the death of the Hittite prince didn't please you. It won't please the king of the Hittites either. We have most certainly gained an enemy. We launched the splendor of Atom. The new royal barge and with our servants and their families started downriver. Akhenaten was intent on finding the exact right place for the new city. After what seemed like weeks... We anchored near Hermopolis on the eastern bank of the Nile. Akhenaten was rowed ashore, and as the sun gave way to the moon, I waited on the deck with Mariani. Oh, how beautiful it is with the Nile flowing mm. gently past us. Mariani, mm. you don't know what it's meant to have you by my side. Mm. Especially now. Oh, I've attended you for a good many years, Nefertiti. Mm. How quickly it all happens. I become a queen. Then I live in a palace, married, then suddenly uprooted. Here on this barge with a husband, I still hardly know. Has it been less than a year? How old you can grow in such a short time. I love you, dear Nefertiti. You're like another sister to me. You always have been. Then you should know how frightened I am, Mariani. To be queen of both Egypts, is a heavy weight. 
And to be here, in a strange part of my country, about to build a new city, is the most frightening feeling of all. All I can see, no matter which way I look, are clouds and rain ahead. We know today from clay tablets discovered some 90 years ago, written in cuneiform characters, exactly what life was like in those days, 14 centuries B.C. These tablets tell us the tragedies and victories of starting a city from scratch. They are called the Amarna tablets, after the name given the city of truth by Akhenaten, Amarna. But I am getting ahead of my story. I shall return shortly with Act Three. king and queen, she bearing a child, set out to find a new and favorable spot in which they and their followers can practice a new religion, worshiping not a handful of gods, but one. Yet all is not peace and hope. Gold in Egypt is under constant surveillance and possible attack from poorer neighbors. Is it a calm before the storm? It is night. The royal barge is anchored in the Nile, 240 miles south of Thebes. Queen Nefertiti, alone on deck, examines her fears. The sun had gone to sleep behind the hills. In the distance, the calls of jackals and mountain lions roaming for food. My husband somewhere on that unknown shore with only a few sailors. I was terrified. What if something should happen to Akhenaten? I stood at the railing, waiting, trying to see through the darkness. My queen. Oh, you frightened me. I am sorry, Nefertiti. It is only me, Horonrab. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Horonrab. Is all well? <laughs> Almost everyone has retired for the night. Can you see Akhenaten's boat out there? Is he returning to the barge? No, I cannot. I can barely make out the bay, the shore, the cliffs behind. Did you pass Mariani? You mean your handmaiden? You know who I mean. Uh, why do you ask? Because all through our journey, you seem to have made such a point of not talking to her. Don't you find her attractive? Uh, Nefertiti, why are you trying to make me aware of Mariani? I, I wish I understood you. I think you do, Oren Rab. Better than most. Do you remember the day Akhenaten's father died and I brought you a kitten? Then... The day of your marriage, it ran away, and I found it and brought it back. And then, do you... And then, your disobedience as a storyteller at the coronation festival. Why, out of all the priests in your court, did you order me to tell a story of wars and battles? And why didn't you tell me what I wanted to hear? Why do we hurt each other? If you had asked me that question the first few weeks of my marriage, I might have given you an answer. But not now. Now you love your husband, the Pharaoh. It makes it easier to love the man that has been arranged for you to marry. I understand. Good night. Sleep well. Are you angry? No, no, no. I have done my duty for the night. I've made my rounds. The queen is in good spirits. I shall go to my quarters and await the return of the king. You are angry. What am I doing here? I belong with the army, not in this, this, this floating golden temple playing nursemaid and night watchman. It was my husband's idea, General, not mine. He wanted you with him. He was angry at the death of Prince Ananza. I could see through that. Any foot soldier could have played guard on this barge. He did it to humiliate me, and I shall not forget this. And don't forget either that Akhenaten is your pharaoh. It's difficult for me to be angry with you, Horan Rab. I've known you too many years. I, I am tired of the king's games. I take my generalship seriously. Yesterday, one of my men rode out from Hermopolis to tell me that foreign troops are massing in the harem. Now, what would that mean to his majesty? An invasion? Of a sort. That upstart Prince Haziru has a secret alliance with the Hittites. Now, I know it. And the Hittite king? Oh, he'd give anything to even a score for the death of his son in Sinai. We have enemies everywhere. More than we need. 
But if we do nothing, Azir will sneak into Syria dressed like an ordinary traveler, and before you know it, he'll be dictator. Syria will fall into his hands, and Egypt will be next. And here I sit, hundreds of miles from Thebes, on a rudderless barge. I will speak to the pharaoh. I promise you, General. Nefertiti! Nefertiti! I found it! Uh, pharaoh, is that you? I found it. I have found the ideal place for the city of truth. Sailors, look sharp! When the rope is thrown from the pharaoh's boat, make it fast and then pull gently. Nefertiti, remember, whether we believe in many gods or one, in this world there is only one life or death. If we let down our guard, Egypt could disappear from the face of the earth. It's been a long search, but I found it. This place has everything. One would hardly have to landscape it. Trees, natural avenues, wonderful. Now we shall have to organize. You don't seem nearly as enthusiastic as I thought you would be. After all, founding of Amana was your idea. Amana? Yes. That is its name. It, it just came to me. Amana. A resting place of the gods. Amana. We shall need much more than enthusiasm. A little realism. If you and I are going to hold this empire together, it can't be all prayers to one god. Who has been talking to you, Horanrab? He sees dangers, and you don't want to look. I don't care what he sees. Or what he says. It... It is not enough to deploy troops and garrison cities. If I can make the peoples of Egypt and its dominions have one solid, true religious worship, then, then we could have a safe and enduring society. I'll make a bargain with your husband. You build the temples, I'll build the city. Well, what do you know about architecture, street planning, viaducts, water? What do you know about anything? What I don't, I can find out. What I can't do. I'll have done by the best craftsmen in our world. The barge was made fast ashore, and for many weeks it followed, it would become our home. I persuaded Akhenaten to release General Horenrad to return to Thebes. Neferatiti, how did you accomplish it? I told my husband you were the only person into whose hands I would entrust my list of architects needed here to transport at least a thousand workers downriver. Well, I, I have underestimated your talents, Nefertiti. The most important of all on that list is Beck, the master architect. Oren Rab, I want you personally to convince him he must drop everything he is doing at Karnak and tell him I have a city for him to build at Amana. Oh, you are a sly one. Am I, uh, expected to return here to Amana? We never got round to talking about it, the pharaoh and I. Oh, so if I happen to rejoin my army at Memphis, I shan't be missed? It's quite natural for a general to be with his army, isn't it? And if the army just happens to run into some foreign troops in Nahari, and a certain Prince Azero is mysteriously kidnapped or killed... We shall have our hands full here in Armana, General. I don't think you need any special orders to perform what you know is your duty. My queen. Then this is goodbye. Who knows? So be it. May Aton, the sun god, shine on you. In the weeks that followed, I worked with Chief Architect Beck. But it seemed for every two steps we went forward, we fell three steps back. Queen Nefertiti, you're asking for too much to be done in too little time. Wherever we build, we're constructing on sand, and sand can move. So every time we excavate, we must reinforce. Let me show you on the master map. It's not excavations or reinforcing that concerns me now. You and I agreed on the location of certain buildings and certain streets, and where are they? Right here, on the master plan. I'm not talking about marks on plans. I'm talking about mud bricks. Mortar. It's here. It's all there. Don't make me angry, Beck. My orders are not being obeyed. I, I guarantee you everything is on the plans. Will you kindly step out in the balcony with me? Uh, beautiful day. Now let me point out something to you that is on a plan, perhaps, but nowhere else. Look to your right. Where is the street of flowers? That's on the plan. Well, we haven't yet. Uh, the, the surveyors found that... Uh, the, the... And over there, my dear Beck, at right angles, 
Where is the Avenue of Palms? But as I've been telling you all along, Queen Nefertiti, the land is on the arid side. What happened to the irrigation canals? The rain storage dam? There on the master plan. But, but I... It doesn't concern me how you get fresh water to Amana. By the pitcher full from Thebes if you have to. Now then, please, one more little look at something else. On the far side, facing the mountains. My dear Beck, what are those? Slums? That definitely is not on the plan for Amana. Temporary workmen's houses. They'll be torn down to make room for the pylon to be erected there. Oh? As soon as the granite slabs arrive by barge in two or three months, I assure you those shacks will be removed by then. Those shacks will be torn down immediately. Beck, I charge you. You will give every workman 500, 1,000, 2,000, however many there are. You will give every workman in Armana the day off, a week off if necessary. Could you tell me why suddenly they're all on holiday? You will also give each worker all the mud brick, the wood, and the tools they'll need. And they will be required to build their own permanent houses. You will design streets and avenues for them to build on. Understood? That is my decree. Nothing temporary. You will tell your workmen to build for permanence. That's impossible. Indeed. How can I give our entire workforce a week off and yet continue to construct avenues and so forth? It's a problem I know you can solve, my dear Beck. I do not like to hear what cannot be done. Only what can. General Horenrab, welcome to Memphis. We did not expect you at headquarters so soon. We didn't expect you at all, actually. What are you talking about, Templar? Why shouldn't I return to Memphis? You've been gone a long time, General. We commanders had more or less written you off. Oh, you had, had you? Hmm. You thought I would just retire and leave the command of the Egyptian forces to you and Hori? You've been away for a very long time. Of course, everyone understood. Nefertiti, our royal queen, needed particular protection. Is that sarcasm? Well, General, one hears things. Does what? Well, what does one hear? That the general is quite a favorite of Queen Nefertiti herself. Only the queen? Not the king also? I would say one hears that the general is more a favorite of the queen. Say what you mean, Templar. As you wish. General, you have been observed very close. Very close indeed with our queen on the royal barge. It has become much talked about here in camp. Oh, and what do they say? The men. Well... Put the men aside for a moment. What do you say, Commander Hori? I wish that it was you on the throne of Egypt. Me? So do I. Yes. You, General. Then you could have Nefertiti. And we could have a strong, warring pharaoh. I've heard enough. I am here because of the threat of foreign troops in Naharin. Place your men on the alert. It's good to have you here, General. Oh, why do we bother dreaming about you being king? He'll be on that throne long after we've died in some battle for Egypt. Templar? Who knows? Hmm. Horan Rab, a pharaoh. A dream? No. Not impossible. No, not at all. I really don't believe that if something should happen to Akhenaten that Nefertiti would mind sharing the throne with me. And so ended the second year of my reign. My husband, the pharaoh, with his eye on eternity. Myself, Nefertiti, with an eye only for today. And Horan Rab. Oh, yes, I knew it. With an eye to the future. Over the months, there would be many, many attacks on Egypt. But always our soldiers could put fear and arrows into the hearts of our enemies. But this strong, masterful soldier, what arrows did he intend for my heart? Although we have tried to recreate the lives of these unique Egyptians, we have had to depict them in our own terms and in our own language. 
But Nefertiti and Akhenaten and their subjects must be looked at not from our end of the time scale, but against their primitive background. They were a primitive people with very special talents who left an extraordinary legacy. More on this when I return shortly. talking about what distinguishes civilizations. It boils down to the material and the mind. Which do you worship? The Egyptians adored precious stones, unknown gods, and gold. I often ask myself when I hear modern music, see modern dancing, observe our admiration of the shiny, the new, our love of power, of powerful engines, if we today aren't a lot more primitive than we care to admit. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Russell Horton, Earl Hammond, E.V. Juster, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This is the voice of the Rocky Mountain West. Radio 85, KOA Denver. CBS News. Wednesday's cloudy skies and cooler temperatures over forest fires in the West proved to be only a brief respite. More hot, dry, windy weather is on the way. I'm David Jackson reporting on the CBS Radio Network. In all, over 170,000 acres of land have been blackened by fire in several states. More on the story from Barry Peterson in Boise, Idaho. Throughout the western United States, the battle continues to get more than a dozen major forest fires under control. The worst fires are in Idaho, more than 100,000 acres blackened by two fires alone. Through the night, firefighters have been at work five miles south of Bonner's Ferry, a small Idaho town near the Canadian border. Fifty families were evacuated from homes located outside of town. Three homes destroyed by the 600-acre blaze. No injuries reported. State crews are getting help from federal officials who dispatched 100 more firefighters to the scene, virtually doubling the manpower trying to stop the fire's movement. Meanwhile, the biggest fire in the Mortar Creek area along the middle fork of the Salmon River has burned about 57,000 acres. Weary firefighters hoped for a break from the weather, but the forecast calls for hot, dry days for another week. Said one official, that means we fight a holding action. That's about all we can do. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Boise, Idaho. Idaho's Governor John Evans says the U.S. Forest Service fouled up in handling a 50,000-acre fire along the Idaho-Montana border. Evans says the service could have stopped the blaze when it was much smaller, but didn't, figuring it would burn itself out. We'll have more news after this. Now you, too, can be one of the well-read people, the interesting people, all through Book Digest. That's right. As busy as your days are, the excitement, ideas, the romance of the world of books can enrich your life and even add another dimension to your personality. So get a pencil ready for a special offer. Every month, Book Digest will bring you the best of the best sellers. Seven books every month, 84 great books a year. The heart of each book excerpted in the author's own words. In Book Digest, you'll find the talked-about novels, the revealing biographies, the suspenseful mysteries, the fascinating gossipy books. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I should say, welcome to a continuing episode of the fascinating story of Queen Nefertiti and King Akhenaten. I'm delighted to help unveil the mystery of a civilization 
long ago blanketed by the sweeping desert sands of the Nile Valley. Because the glory that was Egypt has been dug from the tombs of Tutankhamun and other pharaohs, we today have the wrong impression that those ancients cared more about how they died than how they lived. Nothing could be further from the truth. Akhenaten, where's my daughter? She's on her knees, praying. Over there in the temple courtyard. She's been there all day. What else would she be doing in the temple? That baby, a child of five, on her knees in this roofless temple, all day in this heat. Makatatan, daughter, darling child. Oh, no! Someone come here, come quickly! Help me! Our drama, The Head with One Eye, based on historic records, written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis, stars Tammy Grimes. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The excitement and interest in one particular Egyptian queen who ruled Egypt 14 centuries before Christ would have never begun had it not been for the discovery of an extraordinary plaster and painted portrait of Nefertiti herself, sculpted in sinuous relief. Go to any museum today, and you'll find a reproduction of this head and shoulders of a woman who can rightly be called the first free-spirited, emancipated female in history. If Nefertiti lived today, aside from her stunning looks and bearing, she'd be regarded as most modern. I now had two children. Makatatan, who is three, and Tutten Carmen, still a baby. Between being a full-time mother and a part-time supervisor of the building of a new city, a full-time wife to a pharaoh who devoted his every moment to establishing a new religion of one god, the time left to myself sped as fast as the falcon flies. Good morning, Queen Nefertiti. Good morning, Marianis. There are a great many state papers for you to deal with today. Don't I know it? I've been up for hours. You'll find my replies to the army for the request of 200 new chariots, bow and arrows, and so forth in the third gold box. My reasons for saying no are there to force. Are you going somewhere this morning, Nefertiti? Not likely. I've called a meeting of the sanitation department at 11. Why are you wearing your blue hat? The royal headdress? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's for him. Hutmus, the sculptor. He's supposed to be here. If being an artist, means you have no idea of the time. I wish we could get along without them. But we can't. They are so irresponsible. They say he's the finest sculptor in Egypt. But what's all that got to do with your wearing a hat? He wants it for my official portrait. Now, Mariani, let's have what you brought me. Your Highness, Your Highness, Your Highness. I prostrate myself. Please forgive me. Is that, Miss? You are late. I am sorry, Your Highness. Go on, set up your easel and the sculpting stand and your plaster, whatever you like. I must go on working. The business of state cannot stop for us. Don't worry yourself, Queen Nefertiti. Oh, I'm delighted you're wearing the blue hat. It will set off your face magnificently. You don't mind working in silence, do you, Tutmus? It's a little hard to concentrate while we're chatting, and I have a table full of state matters that must be dealt with. Do you know my personal assistant, Mariani? Uh, uh. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, I'll just set up over here by the window where I shan't be in the way. Uh, oh, you have your little baby here in a crib. <laughs> Isn't he alive? He must be cut in common. I'd love being late, especially on such an important occasion as doing the Queen's head. You have no idea how much I've been looking forward to this day. What kept you? Well, I couldn't get through the Royal Road. It is so torn up. You wouldn't believe it. It is a battlefield of paving stones. I finally stopped my carriage and got to the palace on foot. I told them to tear up all that black pavement. Tear it up, get rid of it. If those builders can't find pure white stone, I'd rather they pack the earth down. At least it would be the right color. Now, uh, before we start, dear Queen, I uh, brought you a little something. Oh, I love presents. Will you unwrap it for me, Tutmus? Oh, a little statuette. Very nice indeed. What is it? A portrait, full length of your boy. Of who? Tutankhamen? 
This is supposed to be him. You, you don't like it? Mariani, do you see any resemblance? Uh, there isn't supposed to be a resemblance. Why not? It's the custom, dear queen. Custom? This dwarf, stick figure could be anybody. My great-grandfather, the General Horonrad, anybody. Nefertiti, I don't see how you can say that. It's a beautifully fashioned statuette. But it's not my son, Tutankhamen. Your Highness, I, I really don't understand the fuss. W what is it that you want? I want life. I want your art to imitate life itself. I've always hated our stylized portraits. I want reality in plaster, limestone, wood, anything. You mean to really look real? From now on, Tutmus, art must change. No more dwarf figures, no more scarecrows, no more lies. I'm not attacking you, dear Master Sculptor. I've far too much respect for that. Everyone knows you are Egypt's greatest artist. But if this new city, Amana, is to be the city of truth, then our art must be equally truthful. Realism? I can't wait to get started. Oh, my wondrous queen. If you only knew what you have done for me. I, too, have always hated those awful statues that tradition compelled me to carve. Well, everybody's face could be anybody's face. Let, let me get started. Uh, Nefertiti, uh, are you sure? The queen is always sure. Oh, my queen, you have reached my heart. All my life, I, I knew something was missing. And now, to carve and paint what I see. A real smile. Over here, Tadras. Uh, yes, here, I've got a table in the corner. Oh, am I glad this day is over. That Nefertiti, she is one big package of surprises, I tell you. <laughs> you think you had a bad day? <laughs> you just try being a scribe for Akhenaten and take down his dictation. <laughs> he is... So particular. Every single word. Never. It is quite difficult, too. Confused me completely. Wait till I tell you. <laughs> well, that's quite a royal pair we've got on the throne these days. <laughs> uh, I almost quit today. You're joking. What? There isn't a scribe in all Egypt who wouldn't like your job. Uh, and welcome to it. <laughs> it's nerve-wracking and thankless. And no matter what I do, it's wrong. And the pharaoh doesn't think I write fast enough. Only one thing keeps me from throwing the papyrus right in Akhenaten's face. What's that? Horse forbid. Yes, I'm afraid he'd have me killed. Oh, no, he wouldn't. The pharaoh is the last person in the world to order such punishment. Are you sure? Akhenaten is too concerned with his new religion and philosophies. He's a dreamer. And dreamers don't act. Not violently. Well, they're, they're an interesting pair. You have to admire them. A lot of my friends in Thebes have started to come here to Amarna. This is a new world, Mayhew. A new city. Yes. City of Truth, isn't that what they call it? I came to the palace today to do her portrait. Nefertiti wants her plaster portrait to be as lifelike as I can make it. Think of the opportunity. Tomorrow at noon we start. <laughs> we live in a wonderful age, my friend. Good morning, my queen. I've brought you the seven gold trays containing today's business. Put them in their usual place on my table. Mariani, have you seen my little daughter today? Nefertatin? No. Where is she? She didn't come to kiss me good morning. The pharaoh took her with him very early. They went to the Greek temple of Aton. Good. I like that. Remind me, Mariani, to inform the exchequer that when the workmen take time off to build their own houses on the avenue extension... They are to receive full wages. I'll make a note of that. What is it, Marianne? Why are you standing there in that funny way? Are you holding something behind your back? This little basket was left on the steps to your door. I don't know how it got there exactly. What are you being so mysterious about? A basket? It's a gift. Someone's left you a gift. For me? Where is that someone? Outside. Let me open the basket and see from Persia. Oh, you sweet darling. Look how white and fluffy he is. <laughs> a kitten. No, wait. Is it Hornrath? General Hornrath. But it can't be. Why not? Why shouldn't the general of the Egyptian army visit oh. his queen? Hello, Mariani. Good day, General. Mariani, don't go. Stay. I, I had better. I'm beginning to get a little concerned about Megatartan. She isn't used to being out in the sun that much. Oh, she's with her father. You told me so no harm can come to her. Dear, I'm worried. <laughs> I see nothing has changed. No, it hasn't. Mariani still does my worrying for me. 
Mariani, all right. Here, take the kitten. When Mekatartan gets back, you let her play with it. She'll love it. So white and soft and furry. Holland Rab, thank you very, very much. You know what a kitten means to me. The one man, Mariani, who never brings me flowers, but always kittens. <laughs> I take my leave of you, Your Majesty. Tell my little daughter we shall call it Mew Mew the Second. How old is she? Almost six years old. Oh, has it been that long? Let me look at you, dear General. You haven't changed. Well, not on the outside, perhaps. Well, you have blossomed, Nefertiti. Have I? As has your city of truth. What brings you to Amana? I need help. We all need help. In fact, we need a miracle, Nefertiti. Dear friend of my childhood, you never did waste time on small talk, did you? If we want to survive as a nation, something must be done immediately. Surely if Egypt is in danger, you and the army can take care of any enemy. That's what I meant when I said we need a miracle. If the pharaoh has any influence over Aton, the sun god, now is the time to use it. Otherwise, my dear, beautiful Nefertiti, we are all lost. Did this really happen? Are those we have met, Nefertiti the Queen, Horan Rob the General, Putmus the Sculpture, Mariani, are they real? Did they live? They did. How do we know? By reading the inscriptions on the tombs, words on the scarabs, cuneiform correspondence between Asiatic kings and the pharaohs. Archaeology is pure detective work, and the solution is history. I shall return shortly with Act Two. prove to you that so far as ancient Egypt is concerned, one word is worth a thousand pictures. Of our city of truth, Amarna today, nothing remains to be seen, only the ruins and your imagination. Picture this in your mind's eye. A complex of buildings eight miles along the Nile, three miles deep. Mansions of nobles and public officials, military and police barracks, storehouses, Customs houses, workmen's houses, temples, and palaces. And the greatest of these, with hundreds of rooms and colonnades, opening into sunken gardens and water lily pools, the royal palace is larger than Versailles and Fontainebleau combined. You see it? Of course you do. And inside that palace, Nefertiti and her visitor talk. What do you mean, General Horenrab, Egypt is lost? We must, without delay, launch a full-scale attack on the Hittites and wipe them out right at home before they can get their war machine started. We've heard nothing of this danger here in Amana. Why didn't Thebes inform us? Why should they? You've got no friends in Thebes. Not one government official, not a nobleman, not a priest. You're mad. Yes, that's exactly what they say about Akhenaten and you, Nefertiti. Mad. In all the history of 18 dynasties, you both are the least liked of any reigning monarchs. Stop that. I, the queen of all Egypt, have not given you permission to talk like that. Nefertiti, I am not a stranger. I am Horan Rab, your general, supreme commander of the eastern armies. Now, isn't this the city of truth? Or is the truth only for your subjects and not for yourself? I don't know why I make myself angry. What do I expect from Thebes? From those simple-minded, superstitious fools? I suppose as queen you could expect loyalty. You cannot ransack a temple and keep its high priest for a friend. You cannot take all the gold there is in the treasury and expect thanks in return. Such decisions are made here. Egypt is being governed from Amana. Egypt is not being governed at all. You and Akhenaten are concerned only with taking every sack of gold you can lay your hands on from Memphis to Luxor to spend on this, 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 this toy city. Colin Rab, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh of course not. I am stupid. I have no idea how much gold it takes for new streets and new houses and palaces and temples to Aton for this entire make-believe city. The price, Nefertiti, is the safety of Egypt. And there is no better use for gold than to build a new awakening. Ah, may Horus steal my angry tongue. What about your defenses, your army? What army? Exactly. What army? 
We have no army. It has been disbanded by order of your mighty husband, the Pharaoh. But why? Because that soft-headed, turn-the-other-cheek Akhenaten thinks everybody loves him at home and abroad. Because the both of you believe in love and peace, you think you think the rest of the world does. Now, Egypt is a great prize for the strong. Have you tried to talk peace with them? Certainly. Oh, the Hittites received me most cordially. King Hattie told me, oh, let us all disarm. You see, there is brotherly love. He wants peace. Oh, what a child you are. What he means is, we should disarm first. <laughs> Thank Horace he has no idea that there's no money to pay our troops. Or perhaps he knows there are spies everywhere. Now, I am here to ask for money and permission to attack them first. I am general of an undermanned, starved-out crowd of veterans. Now, will you talk to Akhenaten, Nefertiti, by all that is sacred to you? Your ancestors, your love of Egypt. Help me. Help Egypt. Hey, Nefertiti, I'm very worried. The child is not back. I hope she's still with the king. Of course she is. Her father wouldn't let her out of his sight. No harm can come to her. General Horenrad, thank you for the Persian kitten. It was thoughtful of you. If you will make yourself comfortable in the palace... I shall arrange for you and the Pharaoh to discuss your needs this afternoon. As you wish, Your Highness, I take my leave. Mariani, give me my blue turban. It's time for Tutmus, the sculptor, to arrive. Yes. I wish I didn't have to go through this nonsense. Well, why do you? It's all my husband's idea. He wants Tutmus to make an exact likeness, then have copies made and placed in every single temple courtyard in Egypt. I don't believe in such public notice, but my husband does. Queen. Uh, Queen Nefertiti. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, just a moment, Tutmus. Uh, yes, Mariani, do come in. Uh, I have some dispatches to go out. Uh, yes. y- your Majesty, could you not move so much? I told you in advance, Tutmus. I don't have the time to sit for you. If you can do your work while I do mine, we shall get along splendidly. Well, uh, could you hold your head a little higher? Oh, that's the hat, your Majesty. My hat? This blue turban? You asked me to wear it. I, I know I did, but... What's wrong with it? I, I adore it, my queen, but there is... Uh, how can I say it? Too much hat. When you bend forward over the table while you're working, all I can see is the hat and no face. And Egypt loves the face. May I suggest that... Uh, uh, Marianne, would you be good enough to tilt Queen Nefertiti's hat a little to one side? Oh, all right. Uh, excuse me, Your Highness. Uh, like so. Ah, uh, Mariani, hold a hand mirror before the Queen so she can see the effect. Perfect. At an angle. What do you think, Nefertiti? Hold the mirror still. No! I wear the royal headdress so. Straight. I do not wear it on one side. I never wear it tilted on one side. Up to you, my queen, but... Tutmus, you may leave me now. I cannot pose any longer. Oh, as you wish. I- I'll just uh, cover the clay and plaster and be on my way. Forgive me if I've been a little testy, but there is so much to do. Oh, for me, Queen Nefertiti, you can do no wrong. Is he gone, Mariani? Yes. Come over here to his sculptor's stand. I want to look at what he's been working on. Now, I'll remove the cloth. What do you think? Oh. An extraordinary likeness, Nefertiti. Is that all? Do you wish me to be completely honest? Yes, I do. Your face, the expression, it's sad. Too sad. I thought so. That is how I felt today. Tomorrow I must look happier. It was true what Horan Rab had said, and it haunted me. Akhenaten, intent on being a spiritual leader, was failing Egypt as a leader of the living. And I was devoting too much of myself in creating a city of sun, of life, of art and joy. We had cut ourselves off from the rest of the nation. And the truth was, Amana could be neither Akhenaten's mausoleum or Nefertiti's Mecca, so long as swords were pointed at Egypt. 
May who described? Uh, what? You're not listening to me. Oh, oh no, no, I, I am, I am, Greg Farrow. It's uh, just that I, I look over there and it's a little warm in the temple center court, you understand. The, the sun uh, beating right down in the middle of the day, no roof, and, and that, that little child... That is... sun is our god. He is shining our way to everlasting life. Oh, oh I couldn't agree with you more, King Akhenaten. No. Where were we? Oh, yeah, you had just said, I have built shrines and temples in honor of the gods... Wait. Who... Let me see that papyrus. Oh, imbecile. Dolt. Who told you in honor of the gods? It is God. G-O-D, singular. Don't you know what our religion is? It, it was an unfortunate slip. <sighs> See that the stone cutters get this much of the text. Don't touch a word. Uh, King Akhenaten, your daughter Mekhetaton is still kneeling where you left her to pray several hours ago. Naturally. Uh, but, but she's very little, and it is very hot on the granite altar stone. I have asked no more of her than any pharaoh of his royal offspring. I want the prayer to Aton to be remembered, and when she knows it, she can get to her feet and run around and play. Are you ready to meet with me now, Nefertiti? Ah. Oh. Horanrab, what have you been doing? I used the past hours to explore your dream city. No question. It is a city of sunlight. It outdoes anything in Thebes or Luxor. I congratulate you on your imaginative planning. The gardens, the fountains. <laughs> you like it. <clears throat> now, wasn't it worth all the effect? Mm, the whole city shows the results of much preparation and thought. Years of it. Do you know, Horanrab, before we could put up a single building, we had to sink wells for water... Dig drainage ditches, set up workshops to cut and carve all the building materials. Uh, never, Iti. The same care and planning you've done for this city you should be doing to preserve Egypt from outsiders. Don't say any more, please. I've been thinking a lot about what you said. One must face the truth. His sunlight and idealisms are truths, but so are black clouds and danger. You've made me realize that, Horan Rab. Mariani. Your, your Majesty... Has the king returned? No, he hasn't. Or little Mekatatan. What's the hour? Five hours after high noon. If the king on the mountain will not come to his queen, then Nefertiti must go to the mountain. Come, Horan Rab, and you too, Mariani. We must go to the great temple and present my husband with the truth. Scribe, have you got that down? Uh, every word, O Pharaoh. Then add this. There will be... 100 statues, each 13 feet high, uh, giving us one for each temple. They shall be conveyed by barge as far north as Memphis, as far south as Aswan, and each statue shall be erected on the same day. I, uh, I believe that is the queen approaching. Uh, uh, she has a military man with her. Nefertiti? Well, what's she doing up here? Akhenaten! Akhenaten, I bring Horanrab. Uh, I'm very busy now. I cannot talk to him. You will talk to him. Akhenaten, where is our daughter? Over there, in the center of the temple. What do you have her doing? She's on her knees, praying. What else should she be doing in the great temple to Aton? Child of five? In all this heat? Megatarden! Darling child! Oh, no! Horn rug! Someone from here! Come quickly! Help me! A little child kneeling at prayer in the blazing sun suddenly collapses. A queen cries out in fear. A strong enemy prepares to attack a weak Egypt. Can one or any of the ancient gods intercede? Or, as we have come to know today, does not man himself decide his destiny? I shall return shortly with Act Three. dug up in a mine. Clay tablets of correspondence set down by a professional scribe and still decipherable. It enabled us to recreate this account of this beautiful adored woman of ancient Egypt, married to a man of royal lineage who rebelled against the pagan worship and human sacrifice of his ancestors. For Akhenaten was the first monarch in Egyptian history to believe in one God. What God? What God? It is the miracle. Mariana, attend your little I'll carry this poor little body back to the palace. What? You're so happy. I'm not so happy. 
Yes, Mr. Peter. You heard the cry? I was outside, listening. What should I do? How can I can not listen. Listen to your heart. Mr. Dufour? I cannot promise him to remain, but I cannot be so uncharitable as to say that. Mr. Peter. I never thought you would come. I was told you were not well. Oh, nothing, Mr. Like in this division. There are dark circles under your eyes. You will not sleep. I sleep perfectly. You look thin. Thinner than I remember you. Don't you eat. If you come back to criticize, do you really think that all these months we've lived apart, two forces ruling over one kingdom that I've been pining away for you? Your pride told me you wished me to return. So I have. Uh, yes. Well, uh, it's. Because on the 21st of this year, there's the annual festival tribute from our vassal nations, and I wanted you to be at my side. I'd ask up, Mr. Nick, a drawing of us together. How can you me? You didn't ask me back only for a festival. You do love me. I, I do. I do. I, I always have. It was the memory of our love, the two dreams we sailed on the night to find the city of truth. It made me come back to you. Husband. Do you love me, Mr. Peter? I love the man you are. The man you have become is the same to me. Well, how am I different? How? In so many ways. Why? I don't know. Cannot you love me as I am, not as I was? A woman who is once loved always wishes she could have it. But it's all different now. I am different. What changed you? I think when little Mecca taught me that. Something died within me also. I cannot blame you. You believed you were doing right to ask that small child to remain on a new You died a martyr. I said I didn't blame you. You two will see that on the sun. We are two people with two minds. And now... I returned to the royal palace, not that my love for my husband was so great, but my fears for his well-being were greater. So I did his bidding and became his wife again. Welcome, oh, she left her to Am I interrupting? Got <laughs> me. No, no. I was just staring out the window at the sky. The favor has asked me to sketch the two of you at the window of appearances, welcoming you for unbattled sin. Whatever happened to that guy's you were know, doing with me some time ago? Oh, I did it. Oh, when you went to the Northern Palace, the snail ran paced around here like a wild boar. <laughs> I was afraid the box would be destroyed. Did you ever complete it? No, without you, I couldn't feel it. A few more sittings could do it. You got me. What if one day I can be a workshop and you think the portrait of me and I do have to there? You would come to my workshop? I would. In secret. At least to offer myself to art would be something worth art. As I look back on it now, perhaps I was wrong. But I knew Tottenham was a great, great artist. And so, for many weeks, I would go to his workshop and play. Not only wearing the blue hat, but often for a full trip, wearing the first letter at home. Oh, I'm tired, never can be. Uh, do you mind if I start working on the marble today? I'm standing still in one place and a little tired in the yeah. well, When you're dressed, let us sit down and have a cup of wine. I cannot remain long, Captain. The emissaries of our supreme commander have asked for an audience. You mean Horace, right? He, he, he didn't come himself? Is that so surprising? Well, never, Peter, there's always been talk about you and him. There always will be talk. Some people have nothing better to do. Whether it's the foreign rats, whom I've known since we were children, or you, Cutman. There'll be talk about you, if there isn't already. Do you think so? Does it matter, dear Never, Peter? That's what I ask myself. Since I've accepted my husband for what he is, the building of our mind doesn't interest me anymore. It's impossible. You have lost the daughter. Isn't that the real reason? 
We call her Metatosin. Do you know what that means, dear cousin? Protected by Atom. She is with the dog. Do you believe that? Do I not? Thank you. I don't let myself think about it. Time to go. You know what I haven't looked at in ages? Me, in the blue hat. Where is it? <laughs> you worked on it when I first came here, then you put it away. Perhaps it will make me feel less sad. Yes, please. Let me put my arms about you to comfort you. I feel somebody close to you. Please, Have you no personal feelings for me? No. Not that person. Oh, here's the head on the corner of his head. You will that. The blue turban is an asset. That's a pity. My heart is filled with you. That's me. I may be an unhappy queen, but I'm still queen. And you, our servant. What is that? My left eye isn't there. It's blind. You haven't finished it. No, everything but that eye. Tell me, complete the head and bring it to the palace. I'd like my husband to see it. My queen, you do not know me. My body may be your servant, but not my spirit. I shall decide who will see the portrait. I made it, it's mine, and always will be. I command you to paint in that left eye and bring the finished work to the palace. I shall not. You would leave it like this. Disfigured. You have disfigured me. If all I am to be left with is a head with one eye, so be it. Nefertiti, there has been much talk in court about other men. You should be flattered. It is of no matter to me whatsoever. I have no feeling for you. And where is all that love and easy certain so that I would return and make it is? Gone. Perhaps it never existed. Oh, I know my love for you did exist once. What do you wish? We must have more children. We have Captain Carmen and several little girls. I want more children. What night do you wish me to come to you? You never asked me that when we were first married. I did not know that my firstborn little girl would be taken to me so soon. Not that you care about life. So close for her. Never to hold it to my breast. Love. could not be mended. Be a child, yes. But the great grand duke, you could never be a husband and wife again. For the first time in my life, I felt it was worthless and fruitless to go on. One resolve and only one second zone to return the keys and to bury my daughter now lying in some underground pit in the past. To bury her with the old and sacred funeral rite. Until then, I would be a head of state in name only. As the sculptor had said, I would only see life as a head with one eye. Mm. It's pure conjecture why the left eye of the famous bust of Nefertiti is missing. But archaeologists are all agreed it is missing. It was not damaged. It was never there. So we are left with a painted plaster, one-eyed beauty and assumption. Yes, it is. More when I return to tell you about the final chapter in this extraordinary story. <laughs> who may believe our account is fiction. For those, I refer you to John D.S. Pendlebury, the great Egyptologist, who writes, There is not another family in all of world history whose images are so heart-rending in their misfortune. 
The fifth and last episode is for next time, concluding the tale of a woman whose beautiful face is today known to millions, but whose life as a queen, mother, philosopher, and activist is only beginning to come to light. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Russell Horton, Evie Juster, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now a preview of the next exciting drama in our five-part anthology of Egypt's Golden Age, starring Tammy Grimes. You don't understand. Get away from me. Come down from the steps. I don't want you near me. Don't you understand? You don't know me anymore. Please. I'm standing here on the top step. Don't you come any closer. It's your bed, dearest no. one. We are husband and wife. You stay where you are. Failure is written all over you. Enemies around you. Enemies at home. What is your god, Aton, the sun, done for Egypt? Do you know what I have hidden behind this curtain? There. Ah! Look. There they are. My gods. Ah! Thoth, the standing baboon. So bet the crocodile. They protect me. You traitor. And what has he done for us, your one god? Where is he? I am Aton. I am God. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tune in tomorrow night for part five.